Therefore, Lord of Death, keep our souls, lest they fall prey to him. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you're all doing well. Sorry for the delay. I know, uh, no, a little bit later, <laughs> start about 15, 20 minutes, but uh, we're still waiting for some of the players to make it to top four. But I figured I'd come on and chat with you guys, hang out, you know, have a good time. So today is the culmination of the season three of Total Tavern. These are the top 16 players on the leaderboard as of about a week ago, give or take. Playing it out for a pretty decent little cash prize today. So taking a look at the prize, shout out to Roger, who uh, is one of our community members who actually contributed the prize. But it is going to be $300 for first place, $150 for second, and $50 for third. So those are going to be the prizes for the grand finals today. And once again, just want to thank you guys all for joining. Hope you're doing well. Do the music again. Yeah, I know that the Bretonian soundtrack is hands down one of the best. So... As it currently stands right now, the only player to have reached the top four today, which it's going to be changing in like literally a couple minutes. There's a lot of matches that have gone to game three uh, right before the top four. So we're just waiting for those to finish. But currently we just have Houseplant waiting in the top four by himself. <laughs> the dreaded Houseplant. And Houseplant, of course, uh, doing very, very well. Always been one of the strongest players in Total War Warhammer 3. I believe, yeah, he won the world championship. And I think he was the champions in previous big seasons as well. I'm just going to check real quick. Yeah, yeah, he won the recent Summer Championship as well as the uh, World Championship. So pretty serious stuff. Pretty serious stuff. How you guys doing? Cue the Applebee's gift card for the champs. Yeah, that, that would be the ultimate. That would be the ultimate prize. Yeah, yeah. How's <laughs> my vegetating in the lobby? <laughs> He's waiting, man. Dude, Furby, thank you. Holy shit, man. We haven't even started yet. $100. Got to run, but excited to watch later. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, Flying Taco's playing. Uh, Flying Taco won his first round match and we're, he might qualify for the top four if he's able to win against it. I think he's playing all Rick Roll right now. So yeah, basically now's a good time. If you guys have any questions or anything, we can hang out and just, uh, catch up and we'll be starting, uh, our first best of three in just probably like 10 minutes, give or take, I would imagine. The big question is, will the bounty, will a bounty be claimed today? Uh, that would be a pretty serious flex. A lot of the bounties have been claimed. We can go take a look and see which ones we actually have in the meantime. So if you guys aren't aware of the Total Tavern bounty system, it essentially is a way that players can unlock custom avatars, very much uh, inspired by like Warcraft 3. I, that was one of my favorite elements of Warcraft 3. So if we go over here and check it out, you can see the avatar bounties. So these are like unique challenges that if you complete them in the, um, in the semifinals or grand finals of a tournament, you get a special avatar. And if we're talking about avatars, we go to the front page and you can see the players here. These are all upcoming tournaments we have and whatnot. Um, but yeah, these are the different avatars that you can see. So um, Platypus has the Tretch Craven Tail Bounty. Dog Person has the Kazrak one. Um, Serkia has the Wild Rider. Wild Rider. I don't know why that was such a such a tongue twister right there. Jeez. And uh, yeah, you can see we also have unique uh, unique pictures for the World Championship and all that sort of good stuff. So yeah, it's very inspired by like Warcraft 3. You remember back in the day, you would like unlock avatars, the more you know games you get, more wins, all that sort of good stuff. Dog Person is currently playing right now. He, I believe he won his first round match, but I'm not sure. We'll, we'll see if he makes it to the top four. Because if we tried to cast like all 16 players every single match and they had to wait, it would probably be like a 14 to 16 hour stream like if we because domination best of threes go a long time like a long long time yeah you know here's how it usually works for the avatars the players just tell me what they want like i give them parameters with which it can be like tretch a modified tretch a modified kazrak um so if you were able to get the the troll toll uh bounty with you know playing norska and using a lot of trolls and yeah you you could totally have danny devito as a troll 
Two more bounty attempts for you last tournament. Yeah, Bob, I just saw. I just saw. I have it in my replay folder. Don't worry, I'll be getting to it. What is the most popular factor in these competitions? So let's go and take a look here real quick. We can we can look at some of this while we wait. Just a couple more minutes here. Um, there we go. So here's the overall win rates for all the factions in this game. And this is just for domination mode. Um, you, Slanesh and Vampire Counts are hands down the strongest, but they don't get... Vampire Counts get by bans more. People don't ban them as much. But the reason why Slanesh has such a small sample size of games compared to some of these other factions is because they get banned like nonstop. They're just overpowered. Um, so are Vampire Counts. I would say that, you know... These three factions, Slanesh, Vampire Counts, and Coast, in the hands of like top tier players can be absolutely terrifying. I would wager we're going to be seeing these guys today in the uh, the top end of the event. Personally, I feel as if they should... Like, if you can nerf like these three factions, like anyone over 55% and anyone below 45%, because you have to remember, when when you nerf Slanesh and Vampire Counts, that's going to like bump up the win rates of some of the factions that have been getting dumpstered by them too. So... I think like it's like 45 and like 55 and higher, maybe even 60% and higher. You can you could probably get away with leaving Vampire Coast and test the waters, but um, even still, these are the current win rates, and this is going to be the end of the season. So how it's going to work is as soon as we get our uh, our new DLC, the old uh, Chaos Dowie, we're going to be starting a new season. So we're on season three right now. We'll be starting season four. It'll be a fresh leaderboard reset. We'll have uh, new you know. All sorts of new stuff going on on the website. It's going to be very, very fun. So that's kind of the game plan going forward there, guys. Hey, welcome. Yes, welcome to the stream. <laughs> Nerf the Dowie. No, dwarves are in a good spot. They're in a good spot. They, I would definitely say dwarves are in a low-key spot. I'm genuinely surprised at how long some of these matches are. Too. Like, Houseplant basically just, like, swept through all his matches super quickly. And all the other ones are going pretty long. Yeah, 45 to 55. You guys have to remember, like... Games like StarCraft, Warcraft 3, you know, Company of Heroes, these games that have like like maybe four, three playable races and or factions, they struggle to bounce their games. And the fact that we have any semblance of bounce with 23 playable factions, soon to be um, 24, is just insane. It's, it's really actually quite impressive. Yeah, people don't give a lot of credit for that. But it's, I mean, yeah, of course there's haggard bounce, but with how many factions there are, it's, it's a lot. Yeah. It's a lot. Oh, I have no idea, KB. I, I don't know the lore terribly well. Test the waters of Vampire Coast. I actually had, there was not no intent of a, of a pun being there. Nurgle, Nurgle needs some love because Nurgle got a DLC and they still suck. So um, I, I definitely think Nurgle could use it, some buffs. Zinch could use some buffs. Kislev, I wouldn't really buff yet, despite them being weak, simply because they're probably going to get a DLC and you want to see if that can solve their issues. Because usually that's just how it is in this. Yeah, that's usually how it is. Yeah. Yeah. Picking army comps does take a long time, especially when it's like a high stakes event like this. You know, the folks, uh, there's actually a prize on the line. So the folks are going to be playing uh, as sweaty as possible and taking their times. I should have put some sort of a restriction in place about, you know, the picking system, but we're just using pick three, ban one. So very standard. It's what most of the season was played on. So that was part of my decision was just having it be like the, what we played on as like a standard format for most of the season, but I'm going to be reevaluating picks and bans and whatnot and seeing what the other options are um, as we go into the uh, season four. Any chance of getting Age of Wonders 4 in the channel? Yeah, I'd probably cover that. I think so. Would you say Nurgle needs a gift? Yeah, Nurgle does need some milk. I don't know what they would need. I, Rotflies and Toads being buffed and like making one of them as good as Flesh Hounds would be pretty, pretty substantial because Nurgle already does the infantry game very well. I wouldn't hate seeing Rotflies get anti-large. That'd be kind of cool, although I think in lore they're more like designed to kill infantry, so it wouldn't really make sense. But yeah, like if they had some sort of a decent anti-large piece too, that would be helpful. So the prize for today, yeah, you guys want to see the prize? All right, so shout out to Roger for uh, contributing the prize for the tournament, and here is the prize. First place getting $300, second place $150, and third place <clears throat> $50 as well. So by total war standards, not bad. Not bad. We're not the uh, the richest community. You know, when you look at... um games like Age of Empires and things like that, and you see these, you know, these community, like, I guess, content creators, you could say, hosting these big tournaments, fifty, seventy thousand $70,000 prize pools. That's because uh, Microsoft and the companies that make the games contribute those prizes to the community. Uh, that's how it's usually done. Whereas in Total War, it's, it's like 99% of the time, it's pretty much just out of the pocket of, uh, of community members and whatnot. Obviously, the Creative Assembly events, like the ones we've had in the past, like Everchosen, things like that, they're, they're paying for the prize. But generally speaking, we pay the troll toll. So we pay it hard. I want a Bretonian DLC. Are they even missing any units? Oh, baby, a triple. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, my God. How are we? I really, I really thought, you know, two and a half hours would be enough for two rounds. But I was wrong. All right. We're getting there. 
They must be. They must be getting onto their third games now in that second series. Hey, not much. Life's good. Thank you, Action. Thank you, thank you. Do you think cost reduction increases be enough? Yeah, yeah, I think it can be. Um, I think it can be. It, it's really tricky too, because Creative Assembly is kind of in a strange position now where like they have, they have. Uh, I mean, I obviously cover Domination, but there's quite a few folks who still cover Land Battles as well. And uh, it, it's tricky. Which one are they going to be bouncing for? Because like in Land Battles, like if we had the win rates and faction win rates for Land Battles comparatively, it'd be massively different than it is in Domination mode. So it's tricky like which one like because also land battles is kind of the standard for um for campaign battle so like i i wonder which is the primary balancing focus i would imagine domination since it was kind of the game mode they launched game three with but yeah it's curious to say it's curious to say all right hey i'm glad to hear it marlo thank you for the kind words hey kevin robinson turn your opinion please uh okay let's see rhymes with fate i have i have no idea let's see Okay, I'm trying to see. I think it's fine. Yeah, I, I I think that's totally fine. Unless unless I'm being lured into some trick. You know, whenever I get get messages like that, I feel like somebody's trying to trick me into saying something bad or something. It's happened a couple times. Yeah, but honestly, it seems fine. Unless I'm missing something. Yeah. Let's see here. Thank you so much, man. Ten dollars to turn for every unit of Dem Demogriff Knights fielded today. Oh my God, there's not going to be any. <laughs> the Empire is not super popular. They're, they're, they're somewhat, I would say Empire is a decently a well-balanced faction. And that's why they're not going to be, well, it depends on who makes it to the top four. Hey, Pyro, thank you for the tenor. Really appreciate it. Yes, yes. They should honestly just have two builds. One for multiplayer and one for single player. Yeah. Well, I think like the game is obviously predominantly a single player game. So the, you get minimal resources thrown towards multiplayer, which is, you know, I, I understand. It's a, it's a, they make their money from, you know, the campaign. So that's going to be the focus. But, you know, we make multiplayer the best it's going to be. And, you know, the awesome universe we have of Warhammer Fantasy is just what really keeps it going, like hardcore. You already use a mod to add new maps. Any tension to create? So I thought about, I thought about, that's a, that's a good question. I thought about using um, a bouncing mod. But the problem is, with bouncing mod is, I want the game that, you know, a newcomer playing on Quick Battle to that verse like one that tournament players are playing to be the same game i don't like the idea of having this like community that plays its own kind of thing that's different than because there still are a lot of people who play quick battles and i like when you can play quick battle and get this a relatively similar and or the same experience um the only difference is of course the map packs but you know that something had to be done about the maps because we literally would just be playing two or three maps over and over they were just awful so um we had to we had to do that fine 15 for every unit of denver Griffs. does it count for every single model yeah, Kevin. No, no, no. I, I'm good. Yeah, I, I honestly think the name's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thanks for being around to make my study breaks bearable. Hey, thank you guys for your patience and getting this event started. We just, uh, the players are taking a little bit longer than I expected. We started at 10 a.m. with the round of 16. And uh, and now we're just like closing into the round of four. Well, the full day of competition, but it's good. We get to talk, answer some questions beforehand and whatnot. But yeah, I, I would, man, if uh, I, I would love to be able to like, I know they don't have, I, I know CA might not have a lot of time to do balance. I mean, it's maybe, I'm sure they do to an extent, but I would happily volunteer my time to, uh, to work on that kind of stuff. 100%. But yeah, it should be a fun day of competition. This is a big one. This is a big one. This, uh, this tournament's going to be pretty high stakes here. Decent little cash prize. And of course, getting the title of season three champion. If any of you guys were back on the channel back in Warhammer 2, this is essentially the continuation of the ECL, the Eternal Challenger League. But um, I like this format more than ECL. ECL maybe was a little bit better at building up like climactic endings, but I do think that this format's better because we get more tournament hosts. Um, we get more people involved in the community. Overall, I think it's just better. It's more accessible. Hey, Winston, thank you. Token appreciation, the return of the most haggard podcast. It's been missed. Yeah, I'm going to be recording another episode very soon. As soon as we... Um, we can get our paws on some uh, some hot chaos store faction. I'll be re recording something once they come out, like talking about my thoughts and everything. And uh, we'll have specialist episodes of the Dreaded Haggard podcast too, where we talk about each faction. So I'm going to bring on folks who are like really, really good at, you know, Beastmen, for example, vampire counts, whatever. And we'll go over strategy and all that. Turns, balance patches. Yeah, war wagons should just be, they should be given, uh, given I, I think they should combine mortar wagons and, and uh, war wagons. Like they have rifles and mortars and they can fire the mortars while moving. That would be the ultimate empire unit. 
Yeah, that would be the ultimate empire unit. Gold cost would be, you're saying enough. Uh, how much should go, uh, the plague toads cost? Oh no, you guys are having a meme discussion in chat. Okay. See how we're looking here. Yep, I'm still waiting. Oh my God, I'm, I'm thoroughly shocked. We're getting there though. Uh, will I be moving in the next few months? No, no, I'm, I, we're, well, we are going to be moving, but we're, we're going to be staying in the area we're in. Um, our lease and our little rental here ends on uh, September, October, I think. I can't remember. Um, somewhere in that time frame. So we're going to be moving then. But we're looking to stay in the area, you know, moving in Excel in itself is very expensive, like cross state, like, you know, renting the trucks and hauling everything. It's, it's a, it's a rough one. Hellstrom wagon. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Warhammer is my favorite game to watch you cast, even though I find company more fun to play. I think Co is harder to watch with the camera zoom restricted. Thanks for putting this on. Love the Warhammer content. Thank you. We'll be hosting uh, tournaments for that game as well. I mean, oh, you'll be moving. Okay. We'll be moving from, uh, all right, right on. There you go. Well, safe travels there. Safe travels. Hope you have a, a, a glorious adventure. I find the guy I'm so high for 10th edition. Oh my God. I know there's so much, there's so much Warhammering happening this year. Like, I am of the opinion that we're going to be getting Warhammer the Old World. Um, I don't know. Like, I think it's going to come at the end of the year. I honestly think... Because I, I was not expecting 10th edition uh, 40K to be happening so soon, but we're getting that in, like, probably July, right? So then there's, like, you know, a whole other five months of the year, which I think we could get Old World by, like, December. And I'm going to be starting a channel to cover that as well, a separate channel. Um, so that'll be super exciting for anybody who, like, wants to continue the old... Warhammer Fantasy action, we'll be, uh, we'll be covering that over there. So pretty hyped for that one. Okay. Remember, I'm just going to remind the player. Remember, stop here. Remember once. God, I, having to like narrate while I type is such a, such a boomer thing. Once you get to the top four, once you. All including. All right, cool. So just giving an update to the players. Checking in, making sure they're not like accidentally playing the top four matches. Yeah, Old World's going to be brutal. Uh, have you have I seen uh, Legend doing YouTube community thing? Yeah, I think I saw I saw a post. He messaged me about it as well. I See, the thing is, I already kind of do that, something similar for multiplayer on Total Tavern and also in our Discord. So for me, I would rather focus my efforts on Total Tavern and community building there and getting new hosts involved and getting new players involved in tournaments. That's kind of my my main focus. So, you know, my efforts would go there. I do think, I think Old World might come out this year. I, I think obviously they showed New Bretonia and they showed New Tomb Kings, uh, like the teasers of the new miniatures. I think we're going to get a starter box, which is going to be uh, Tomb Kings versus Bretonia. That would, that would be my conspiratorial guess. And then I think shortly after that, we'll get like a, like a Kislev launch and maybe Cafe. Probably Kislev first, I would wager. Yeah, that would be my guess. Because they already showed some cool concept art for Kislev, which is, you know, I think they did for Cathay as well, though. So, nah, I don't know. Yeah, a Tomb Kings versus Britannia box would be really good. Because those are two factions that didn't get a, a good model update range in, like, 8th edition. Um, so, like, honestly, if you look at the Empire models from Tabletop, they're more or less fine, right? Like, Lizardmen are getting uh, updated in Age of Sigmar, which is just going to be used in Old World. And, you know it's going to be then they get tomb kings and bretonia and re-release most of the old armies to make them available again and i think you're golden honestly i might do i might do a single player campaign when the uh when the chaos Dwarfs come out i might i'm not sure it depends on the old schedule and everything so all right wow we've had some seriously contested matches okay it looks like another one just finished let me see if they're on the same side of the bracket um all right looks good just checking here one second, my friends. All right. Outstanding. So it looks like we're good to go. Okay. So double checking this. Making sure I have the brackets correct so I'm not a potato as I usually am. All right. It's time. We got our first match, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to get the players in here, invite them, and get this party started. House plan. We, have, we literally have a duel of uh, house objects. We have the house plant versus house cat of war. <laughs> what are the odds of that? All right. So we have, uh, let's see who gets in here first before we update this. All right, guys. First match is on the way. Thank you for your patience. You know, when we do this format of tournament, I have to guess when it's going to start. Like I, cause we start and then we wait to top four. So I just kind of guessed it would be 1230. So again, I just want to thank you guys for your patience. So we are in the top four. 
So this is gonna be the, uh, let me go ahead and find this. This is the bottom side of the bracket and the map for that is going to be border low landing is gonna be our first map. All right, excellent, excellent, let's do it. And they should be joining in just a second. We can also update the bracket, make it official as we go to the four man bracket. And it is gonna be the dreaded house cat of war. Quite, quite. We have the. I love that we have the house cat versus the house. The house plant versus the house cat. I think in real life the cat would absolutely dominate the house plant, but obviously this is a very different situation here. All right. So the first champion has arrived. It's going to be house plant, one of the goats of Warhammer Three for sure. He will. He will analyze the you know the most competitive builds, make them work, and uh, yeah, he's a very tough opponent. It feels. It feels like you're playing a brick wall when you play him. House plant versus the house cat. House cat of war. All right, outstanding. We got the nameplates all up. Let's jump on over, adjust all this, and they'll be getting started on their picks and bands in just a second. Good luck, have fun. <laughs> this picture an actual cat playing a computer. Yeah, yeah, I'm playing on a computer. That's pretty funny. Okay, <laughs> I like that. What if what if the house plan is cat? And all right, we're getting into some 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 in depth tactical discussions now as well. Yeah, you know, we'll we'll have to see. I, I think, uh, yeah, I, I don't really know how chaos dwarves played in tabletop. From what I understand, they they had in tabletop chaos dwarves like their infantry weren't as good quality as like the normal Dowie, but they had they had like a ton of you know war machines that were pretty grand in scale, as well as monsters and like you know like bull centaurs and all that sort of stuff, right? And like these flying beasts, I'm really, I'm really interested to see the like the paradigm between those two factions. That's that's something I'm quite interested in. Yeah, the house plant could be a cactus too. You raise a very, very solid point. Okay, so house cat of war. Let me go ahead and make sure he has the code here. Outstanding. Okay, fun. All right. So looks like he has it. Hopefully he can find his way to the lobby here. Hopefully we don't have any technical difficulties. It wouldn't be a total war tournament if we didn't have something haggard happen, some lag or something like that. Did you see the first total showdown sports style Warhammer? Uh, it was quite fun from an individual. Uh, I'm not, no, I, I don't know if I saw that, Ali. I'm not sure. You could shoot me a message in Discord though. I, I would happily take a look. Yeah, I'd happily take a look. Yeah, it'd be quite a bit of fun. Yeah, there will be some good grudge matches though. What you know, what I'm actually more excited for is the potential of a balancing patch. Like, I'm very excited for the um, Chaos Dowie, but what w I would really like to see is like a solid balancing patch come in and just give us give us all the goodies. Like nerf Slanesh, nerf Vampire Counts. You know, get us to that place. And also, there's you guys probably saw the video I did talking about changes. I think we need to see for domination mode. Those are some big things. Like, if we can get those, man, we would just be in such a good place. Has a faction ever been released that wasn't crazy broken to multiplayer for months? Uh, yeah, I mean, D uh, DLCs, there have been DLCs that have been somewhat balanced. Um, as far as like brand new factions, like Vampire Coast was OP and they still are. Um, Tomb Kings were, Tomb Kings were kind of hit and miss. I wouldn't say the Tomb Kings like dominated the meta when they came out by any stretch. I mean, they were good being undead, of course, they're always going to be good and they had a ton of great units. Um, you know, also it really depends if you're talking to like land battle versus dom. They're very different because in, in land battle, you always have to fight something. And, um, you know, obviously there's the, the gray area of like attacking rules and like different things that like change the ladder experience versus the tournament experience. Um, so yeah, you, you really need more parameters to kind of evaluate that. Would a dwarf chaos dwarf be an acceptable? It'd be a pretty heretical 2v2 team for sure. Norska. Yeah. Norska was decent. Norska was fine. Um, Wood Elves were not OP. I wouldn't say Wood Elves were OP. They were they were pretty fun. What if Turn did a Boomer versus New Age stream of Co uh, or Warhammer Three RH players? <laughs> Are we talking about like players closer to forty versus uh, folks in their twenties and whatnot? Let's see. All right, so players are doing their picks and bands right now. Uh, yep, so they're doing that, which is great. And it looks like we have another update as well. So we're just arriving at our top four right now, guys. We have another champion who's made it, and guess who it is? It is the Flying Taco, the meme master of the Ogre Kingdoms. 
has made it to the top four of today's tournament. Now, a lot of people forget, you know, Flying Taco likes to meme on his Ogre Kingdoms, but he's also a super strong player. He was an ECL champion, which is basically the equivalent of this in um, Warhammer 2. And that was like, that was, there was some serious competition. He was playing players like Felcon and Xyphos and these really dark lords. But Flying Taco, the Ogre Lord, has made it. So, you know what's kind of interesting about players like Flying Taco? And I was actually talking to uh, him about this the other night. Is that the fact that he's so good at Ogres means that like really good players will often ban Ogres against him. Which means overpowered factions are going to be left open for him. So, if he actually like practices like Slanesh and Vampire Counts a little bit and they waste one of their bans on his ogres, then, you know, he can get in and play the play the sweaty stuff, right? The true Bretonian was playing today. He lost in the earlier rounds, but he did play. He uh, he just narrowly lost his series 2-1. Hmm. I don't know if Taco's going to be using Greases. We'll have to see. I'm um, just checking here. All right. Outstanding. And I don't know where House Cat of War is. He was here, and then maybe he maybe he stepped away for a moment. I'm not sure. Message house plan. All right, just checking to make sure he didn't disappear. His internet didn't crash or something. Think we'll see any custom bounties today? I seriously doubt it. No, not not when there's like a cash prize and a season title online. Because this is like you know, although it's a small community, it's still a legacy title. You know, you're basically the grand like number one of the world. At the the biggest, you know, most competitive event. So I think people will probably. I mean, from anybody, it would be it would be the flying taco. Yeah, it would be the flying taco for sure. Okay, so house cat is back now. He's got the code. So the house cat has returned just in time. No, you're here just for the first game. We had a little bit of a you know pregame show. While we waited for players to make it to the top four. And for anybody just joining right now, today's prize laid out before you. Shout out to Roger. Thank you, brother. Really appreciate that for uh, donating today's prize. And then the four-man bracket. We still have one match being decided. But we have Houseplant versus the House Cat of War. And Flying Taco's opponent is still to be determined up on the top side. So that's the tale of the tape for today's tournament as well. Hey, Jeff. Flying Taco's life. Thank you. I hope he gets to play Ogres today. Uh, although there are global bans in effect, so somebody could target ban him. But again, that could work to his uh, benefit for sure. And it looks like we might have... Okay, so we have Lizardmen banned in this series. Coastin counts. So Slanesh is probably going to be left open, it looks like. And then Houseplant's going to be doing his last ban right now. So Houseplant opens with a Lizardmen ban, which is obviously targeting Housecat of War probably. And Housecat bans the undead factions that are very powerful, not wanting to deal with counts or coast. And uh, I would wager Houseplant, what will he ban with the last one? Houseplant usually will not ban the, the Sweat Factions because he's good at them. And he, he'll also play um, he'll play mirror matches with them if, if he has to. Like So if you get an advantageous pick against him with, like let's say, Slanesh, he'll just pick Slanesh into you and just be like, all right, let's see who's you know more technically sound. Uh, wow, he banned Ogres. And then he picks Warriors of Chaos, Slanesh, and Demons of Chaos. Oh my god, the ultimate sweat. Oh, the sweat is pouring, dude. I love it. Flying Taco, Flying Taco is life. Yeah, like you're 50. <laughs> then we'll be getting bragging rights. But the real question is, who will be the people's champion? Well, we'll have to see. We will have to see. But yeah, ogres will probably be banned for Flying Taco. I would wager. Yeah, that would be my that would be my two cents. So what will the House Cat of War pick? We have Warriors of Chaos, Slanesh, and Demons of Chaos being brought by House Plant right now. Those are three picks. Pretty strong factions. Demons of Chaos, Bellicor, you know, good at swarming. Soul Grinders can be viable in a number number of situations. Um, Slanesh, obviously super powerful. And Warriors of Chaos are good. They're not, you know, as broken as they once were, but still are very, very strong. So we will see what the House Cat of War decides to bring. These guys are clan mates. I would assume good friends as well. So they'll be having their duel of fates as they join up. I was wondering why I was getting so few games. Uh, everyone's watching. Oh, yeah. We're, we're all hanging out here, man. House Cat, I think, plays Lizardman. Uh, we can actually go check. So it's kind of cool. You guys want to head to the old tavern um you can go go to leaderboard and uh we can go look at what avatar they're rocking and that'll usually tell you what faction that they play all right so house cat house cat of war actually is rocking a tomb kings icon he's got a 67 percent win rate 75 wins 37 losses five tournament wins this season which is not bad at all whereas if you look at house plant house plant is uh has a 90 percent win rate which is absolutely terrifying uh 45 wins and five match losses which is nuts which is nuts. Check that out, man. So you can look at all the players here. Flying Taco himself, 
Uh, he uh, has two tournament wins, 75% win rate. And you guys have to remember, that is super impressive considering he plays meme factions. Like, he doesn't play meta. And he even has the custom Greasus avatar. So um, these are the players in our top four right now. Yeah. And the way this works is that we look at the leaderboard at the um, at the end of the season and we invite the top 16 players. Uh, but obviously some people can't make it. So sometimes we go further down. For example, I, I ended up qualifying for the event this season, but I don't count myself. Um, so we invited people who were a little bit further down. And uh, that's how that's how it works. That's the format. And that was as of like a week ago, the invites went out, give or take. All right. So still we are not finalized here. What is the Avatar Houseplant? That's for winning the World Championship. Yeah, it's like a, the Golden World Championship badge. So he won the World Championship recently. Houseplant, can definitely the one of the more powerful. I, I think he was either one or two in the leaderboard. Yeah. <laughs> the terrifying Houseplant. Hmm. I don't get why dwarves have so many use on, but so few in high... No, dwarves do well, I would say. I mean, Houseplant is a dwarf guy. He plays dwarves a lot. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see him play dwarves today. Totally could happen. Slanesh banning Warriors of Chaos. Oh my God, guys. Yeah, you know, it's a high stakes tournament. It's going to be a Slanesh mirror match here in the beginning. So House Cat of War on Slanesh uh, versus <laughs> House Plan on Slanesh. Oh God, this patch, this this next patch can't come quick enough. I hope they nerf Slanesh for the love of the Dark Gods. But see what I'm talking about? House Plan is just willing to, to test his technical prowess against his opponent in mirror matches. So yeah, Slanesh banning Warriors of Chaos, and we do have a Slanesh mirror match. So hopefully for the love of the Dark Gods, they'll use different banners. Yeah, was that Greasus eating a taco? Yeah, it was. So um, Flying Taco unlocked the avatar for the bounty for Greasus. And he, all he asked was that we would um, give him a picture of Greasus eating a taco. So that was pretty much that. Yes, yes. So it begins. I see them. So yeah, no, it's Slanesh time, dude. I want to see rats. Oh, can we see Skaven? They're a tough faction. I don't know. Maybe if someone who's like more of a specialist comes in and plays them, it could perhaps be the case. It's probably going to be a double Sigvald match. That would 100% be my guess here. How many Seekers? I don't think we'll see as many Seekers as we're going to see Hellstriders. Hellstriders, there'll probably be at least four of them on both both sides. Uh, just checking to see if we have the other side done yet. It looks like we do not. So we're still waiting on that right now. Yes, yes. So Taco's opponent is still in flux. They're battling it out right now. Yeah, it's going to be fast and furious. And, you know, they did do me the courtesy of using different banners. So we will be able to kind of tell them apart. I'm always happy to get this one out of the way, though. You know, because then the rest of the series can be normal matchups. We just we just got to do this. It's it's always like that in high-stakes tournaments. Yeah, some some players like to play that way. Like, when it comes down to money events, they'll, uh, they'll just play mirror matches. So they're not at a disadvantage in terms of faction strength. Did you record the True Bretonian? So some of the players, I think, submitted replays from the earlier rounds, which I might be casting on my channel um, this next week. So, Houseplant's ready already. He's good to go. And it looks like he's ready as well. All right, let's load into game one. The dreaded mirror match. The warm up, let's get it going. Yeah, you know, the slash mirror match isn't like horrible because it's fast and dynamic. Typically, oh my God. Right as I say fast and dynamic, we see Chosen with Hellscare just coming out. Okay, that's actually kind of cool. I've been wanting to see them in action, and I feel as if they might... Dude, look at all the Hell Scourges. You can tell these guys are in the same clan, because the way they're playing, like, the, the meta dynamics are pretty similar as well. Oh, you could just DM me, Ali. Yeah, with the uh, link to that video you're talking about. All right. So, guys, we have a Slaneshi mirror match. It's going to be Sigvalds rubbing their Sigvalds together, and uh, they're going to be backed up by just Warriors with Hell Scourges, probably to kind of counter Marauder Spam. It looks like on the right side of the screen here, we do see what appears to be a Shrine character with a Mortis Engine, which is what I think is going to be the case. But again, the Shrine is going to give up infantry quality, but it will help you win to like blob fights and things like that. I know these builds are pretty serious for sure. Are there any races favored against Slanesh? No, there's not. No, I don't think so. I don't think any race is favored against them. I think Wood Elves actually have a decent matchup against them, but typically the really sweaty players aren't going to be practicing like those matchups, right? Yeah, no, like I don't think anybody's favorite versus Slanesh, at least in land or in do in land battle, it's different. In domination, yeah, a little bit different. Now, here for the forces of House Cat of War, House Cat is going to be coming in with the Sorcerers. That's the only difference. He's got Chaos Warrior, Hell Scourges. He's got Sigvald. He does have a Slanesh caster. So the Slanesh caster, instead of going for Pit of Shade Spam, which would have been super good against those Chosen, he's going to be going for the Acquiescence as well as the Lash of Slanesh. And what that does is it triggers the lore pass of the Blissful Rapture. So the entire army is going to be getting plus 12 melee attack. So 
it's pretty much it. A very one-dimensional army. Going to be going up just with infantry, basically uh, summoning in cavalry as the battle does progress here. Now, on the other side, ladies and gentlemen, it is going to be the world champion, Houseplant. He is coming in with Prince Sigvald as well. But the difference is he does have the Chosen of Slanesh in the secondary ranks, and these guys are pretty cool looking. They have the Hell Scourges. Hell Scourges did get an armor-piercing buff in the last patch, if I'm not mistaken, but they're still pretty terrible uh, in terms of dealing with armor. So there's going to be a lot of wet noodling here. Granted, the melee attack advantage here for the army of House Cat of War will be palpable with the old uh, the old lore passive going. I bet you, though, that Houseplant's going to be summoning in a Shadowcaster of some sort, because Pit of Shades is quite good in this matchup. Obviously, if you're expecting, you know, massive droves of infantry and all that. Should be good. Yeah, Sigvald versus Sigvald. I don't know which one's going to win. They have the exact same stats. Wouldn't it be funny if one of them had, like, slightly different stats? I'm curious about the, like, domination tactics we're going to be seeing in this. Obviously, when they have all the same tools, it looks like there's going to be one Chaos Warrior sent over to the side point, and the rest of the armies are going to be colliding here on the center of Border Low Landing. So on, they're on their way up. Prince Sigvald the Magnificent is walking mighty swift, as is this Sigvald with his 40 movement speed. Very similar to like vampire type units. And the Chaos Warriors with Hellscourge is ready to uh, start getting their whips. Good to go. Marauder Horseman of Slanesh in the backfield. Going to be the first summon here for the House Cat of War. Garland, thank you for the SEK, man. Greatly appreciate it. Wow, give my best to Lady T. I will. Thank you, thank you. Really appreciate that, my friend. Garland, I hope you're staying uh, safe on the seven seas. On the other side, what do we see being summoned in? More Chaos Warriors. So just going to be a lot of infantry coming out here for Houseplant. And uh, yeah, the battle in the middle will commence soon. I wonder what use the Marauder Horseman will have as like a summon. I mean, it does give you a little bit of utility and mobility with which you can harass side objectives and bounce around. But I can't help but feel it's not going to be terribly useful against all these heavily armored silver shields. They do have magic damage. Yeah, they don't have any sort of like an armor debuff or anything like that. So that's going to be a tricky one. Now here we do see the Slanesh caster. For Houseplant, is he banking right now? It doesn't look like it. We see the Chaos Warriors being summoned out. These Chaos Warriors are going to be moving over to the side objective while the Heretics uh, collide in the middle. This is great. I'm sure all the Order Tide factions are stoked to see the two Slanesh armies just kind of dealing with one another here. I feel like this could be some weird plotline in Warhammer Fantasy where Sigvald fights like an evil Chaos clone of himself or an even more evil you know, or somehow like Slanesh like duplicate, or Zeech maybe duplicates Sigvald and then they're so vain that they have to fight each other to see like who is the true Sigvald. I kind of feel like it is a little bit in line with uh, the lore to see two Sigvalds fighting one another. So Devoted Marauders coming out with Hellscourge. It's interesting to see a lot of Hellscourge action. I would have expected maybe, I don't know, I don't know, Demonettes would just be terrible here. Demonettes would just get absolutely crushed by the Hellscourge units. And now we see a Pit of Shades ca caster coming out, so it is going to be a Chaos Sorcerer. That, I think, will be the deciding factor. If I had to make an estimate on which army I think is going to win, I do think that Houseplant's army is a little bit stronger. They have better quality infantry, and I would say the magic is going to be a little bit more useful here, as now the capture is on. Capture weight is going to be going back and forth. Looks like nobody has a massive advantage here as the Slaneshi infantry are going to be grinding together and uh, just starting to whip one another with their health scourges. Classic stuff, but yeah, terrible armor piercing, super high melee defense on all these units. It is going to take 10 years for this fight to be decided. And did we see an acquiescence going down? It looks like there was some sort of a debuff as we do see the sig two Sigvalds clashing in front. And uh, yeah, very, very wet noodle contest. Hell scourge on Hell scourge. So we got Chaos Warrior on Chaos Warrior, Chaos Warrior on Chaos Warrior. And it looks like Houseplant was able to flank up and around, so he came up and around the back here and is going to be trying to get us around here, but we do see the Devoted Marauders maybe looking to make a dreaded sandwich here. It looks like they're going to be creating a sandwich, yeah, because they'll probably rear charge them. Now, Pit of Shades, that's the first thing we've got to watch for. It's going to be the most decisive factor. Acquiescence is really good, though. The entire army here of the House Cat of War is going to be getting a really big melee attack buff for, you know, a considerable amount of time. Pit of Shades going down to the Mirror Guard, and you, what you want to do is move as far forward as you can, and it looks like he does. Very well played, man. Great micro by House Cat of War. So he saw the Pit of Shades behind him, and instead of running like back and through it, you know, he ran as far into the enemy unit as he possibly could with the Mirror Guard, which is going to be mitigating how many of them do get caught there. But the two shiny armies are, uh, are, are clashing here, and it almost feels like a Vampire Count Mirror match a little bit, as it's incredibly hard to tell who's winning. I mean, looking at the value of either side, it looks like House Cat is slightly edging out the value uh, because of the melee attack buff. The Pit of Shades didn't do as much, and now we start to get some cap coming in. So Seekers of Slanesh, okay, I was wrong. Seekers of Slanesh obviously are amazing against Armored Infantry, and considering that's all both players brought, we are going to be getting some Seeker cap coming out. So uh, House Cat of Wards now is some of the first Seeker, and House Plant is going to be responding here with his Hellstriders. Hellstriders, of course, will trade super cost-effectively against uh, Seekers, but there are going to be some more Hellstriders here with House Cat of War, which are going to be screening out and watching the Hellstriders of Slanesh. Now back in the middle, Objective is owned by the House Cat. Looks like he had a numbers advantage, bringing in the cheaper Devoted Marauders. And the Hellstriders trying to get through, trying to get on top of the Seekers. Will the House Cat of War have a lapse of micro? He does not want to do this. Well, you better pull back. It looks like he's going to take the charge, and he opts the charge into the Hellstriders, which I don't think is terribly cost-effective. 
you're gonna to wanna to pull back, run these guys away like so, and lure him in and try and catch him overextending with your two health striders and the trap can then be sprung. So the Slaneshi lore passive has been getting perpetually cast, which has been leading to a little bit of an increment of value in House Cat of War's army. His units simply have, you know, consistently 10, 15 more melee attack than the opponent's army. So that's gonna be pretty big for trading. And here in the backfield, we do see some of the health striders of House Bank getting caught. So House Cat of War does get the optimal trade here. Able to catch these bad boys and uh, grind them down. Although these are Hell Scourges, so they're not going to be as good against the large variant. But even still, uh, they were much healthier, so they should be able to win the fight. Now, the middle objective owned by the House Cat of War. House Cat is up by 700 value. On this side, we just see the grind continuing as the two Sigvalds just uh, hanging out in the middle and uh, you know trying not to look in each other's mirror here. And uh, both of them, not the most armor-piercing, so they're not going to be the best crowd-clearing tools. But even still, they do do decent, consistent damage and have very, very good combat stats. Another Pit of Shades going down from uh, the House Plant. This one should be a little bit better, but House Cat does once again move forward and dodges a large portion of that. You can see the Pit of Shades is going to be catching the back of the unit, but it still is able to kind of get away from quite a bit of that, although it still is kind of tickling the pickle and doing some work there. Now, on the flank engagements, which is one of the more dynamic aspects of the battle, we do see the Chaos Warriors of Slanesh of the House Plant being attacked by the Hell Scourges and the Seekers. Seekers are going to want to cycle charge, though, or get a full surround on them and just break them. Uh, in tandem with some of the other cavalry. But it looks like Cap pushed from Houseplant back here. He did try and get into the backfield, but it seemed as if he was pushed back. Middle objective, though, is starting to flip to the Houseplant. The Pit of Shades are starting to take the troll toll here in the middle, and they are progressively working down the forces of the Housecat. Granted, Housecat does have some units in reserve, and uh, the objective is still pretty close at this point. As we do see the points lead for Housecat of War currently sitting at 389. Back objective is not being uh, contested or threatened by anyone. And here, some of the Hell Striders of Slanesh, which did overextend into the Shadow Realm, going to be getting caught by House Plants. Now, the value lead still favors the House Cat of War. Middle objective being owned by the House Cat of War as well, as the Hell Striders of Slanesh going to be moving up into the backfield, supported by Horsemen. I do like this play. So having the Horsemen up means that like you can kite them back, and when they try and chase the Horsemen, you can then countercharge them. It gives you pretty good agency there, right? Middle objective, if you're not flipping, we see the Lash of Slanesh going down, so the House Cat's army once again up to a considerable amount of melee attack. So you can see it's 46 compared to what appears to be, those are chosen actually. So these basic Chaos Warriors with the uh, Lore of Slanesh passive active actually have more melee attack than the chosen variant. While it's active, which is a, it's a temporary thing. I think it's like eight or 10 seconds or something, but even still it's pretty substantial. It is indeed. Yeah, we're in the grand finals. Welcome, welcome ladies and gentlemen. It is the dreaded Slanesh mirror match. And it's to be expected when you get into some of the sweatier aspects of the game. Here we do see the Chaos Warriors of Slanesh with Hell Scourges holding back uh, quite an unholy horde of Chaos Warriors here. But even still, the House Cat is managing to hold on to the two objectives. His Hell Striders with Hell Scourges trying to take down Chaos Warriors as his Seekers try and get a Royal Rumble here. But it looks like House Plant did find some units and was able to kind of weave through the seam and might be able to kind of salvage these Chaos Warriors back here as the Horsemen of the House Cat of War are going to be kind of concaving around the back, trying to get their Javelin fire into the 15 armor hides here of the Hell Striders. Another Pit of Shades going down. Good usage there from the House Plant. It does hit the Devoted Marauders of Slanesh as well as the Mirror Guards. That's a really, really nice two for one catch. Middle objective still owned here, though, by the House Cat of War, and he's uh, accruing a pretty decent little advantage right now. Currently, the House Cat of War is sitting at 575 points here in this best of three series as the Hellstriders of Slanesh do uh, pile in, get a nice little charge into these bad boys, and uh, we'll see how that goes. More Chaos Warriors on the way up, and now it looks like some of the fighting is going to be devolving into a bit of a backfield uh, rumble here. So uh, I think this will favor the House Cat of War. He's going to be able to get reinforcements in very, very quickly from this Vanguard point and probably overwhelm the forces of Houseplant in the backfield as we do see these Hellstriders going down and the Hellstriders here also going down. And most of House Cat's forces seem to be in decent shape. Granted, to the front line, Houseplant looks to be getting a little bit of ground, but the House Cat continuing to fight back. His claws are sharp. Reinforcements coming in. It's going to be Marauder Horsemen and Hellstriders as well being summoned in from the reserves here for the Houseplant. And back in the middle, the fight still very, very status quo. Nobody's able to kind of wrestle the uh, capture weight here from the house cat. He's got his little cat claws in it, and he is not letting go of that toy as uh, objective number two is continuing to be held. And the backfield is completely cleaned up at the backfield diving from house plant shut down. Now, side objective, nobody's really playing for this. You could send something over there, uh, like maybe a Marauder Spearman or something like that. Could be a little bit of an annoying thing, but both players are committing so many assets to the middle of this fight that uh, nobody want to, wants to kind of let this one up here as the Hellstriders of Slanesh battle the other Hellstriders, fast and furious indeed. They're anti-large attacks. Housecats Hellstriders are going to be forced back. Fascination going down, which is going to be rampaging these guys potentially to their doom. The more Chaos Warriors you're hustling up. And it's kind of, it's, it's getting relatively close to the territory. Not like, I guess a couple more minutes most likely, but to the point where the House Cat could win on one objective, which would be very, very brutal for House Plant to try and come back from, especially considering he was behind in value. He's starting to trade back up a little bit at 6.9 against 6.6. .6, so super, super close game. Hellstriders piling in. They get a nice charge in the Hellstriders of House Plant here. Shadowcaster nearby supporting. 
and the Chosen of Slanesh seem to be making a big difference in this long grind where there's no Pit of Shades. The Chosen of Slanesh are just absolute linebackers. There's not really an effective tool to deal with them other than maybe rear charging them with, um, I don't know, Seekers or something like that. The Lash of Slanesh has some okay armor piercing values, but overall it's a little bit of a tricky pickle. Now in the backfield, it looks like there is a, a bit of a theft. So Chaos Warriors of Houseplant, very, very low in HP, but they are going to start threatening this back cap here. As Houseplant does break a couple units through, so he's starting to break through the front lines. Houseplant has a couple units that could come back here and maybe grab this. And on objective number two here, uh, it looks like this one is still owned by the house cap. But now that uh, Houseplant has kind of brought the valley back to pretty much even, you can see he's starting to get some momentum and maybe he's going to be threatened in the backfield. Another Pit of Shades going down, and again, I really think the magic usage has been one of the big deciding factors here. Pit of Shades has just been progressively wearing down all these different units, but House Cant really does have a nice stranglehold on the middle objective for now, but if the Pit of Shades is able to continue doing good damage like that, we could see it flip to the uh, to the Houseplant here. In the backfield, Chaos Warrior is going to be uh, surrounded by Houseplant's forces, so he does get the Chaos Warriors completely hammered here by a massive amount of Marauder Horse, which of course don't throw in combat anymore. Uh, like they used to. God, you remember that? Those were the worst. You guys think the bounce was haggard now? It was like, oh my God, it was it was something totally different back then. But the middle objective looks to be flipping to the uh, houseplant and he gets the momentum and the value is pretty much dead even, guys. And he's also stealing the back objective. So those Pit of Shades have really done an absolute number. And looking at what's left here on the battlefield, we see Seekers of Slanesh. Are they going to be able to deal with the Mirror Guard and some of these elite quality infantry? That is going to be very, very tough. Housecat still does have quite a few Hell Striders and his Seekers on the battlefield, but there's a lot of Marauder Horsemen out now, and they're such a good counter against the Hell Striders and Seeker type units because they can just drag them out and then get them countercharged, basically. Seekers on the other side sandwiching in, and it looks like the objective is going to be held by the Housecat. Just barely, man. He uses a Fascination. I think, you know, Fascination was used on the Seekers by Houseplant, but he still is able to kind of crush these uh, attackers on the objective. And uh, the house cat just barely, barely holding on to these points as he is going to be broaching the 1,000 points. At this point, though, um, Houseplant would win on two objectives if he's able to kind of maintain it. And he does have the two objectives. On the backside, we do see a little bit of a ninja cap as the house cat of war does have some haggard chaos warriors over here. Certainly not something you would want to get flipped. And I wouldn't hate that from house cat. If house cat were to send like a health strider over there to try and capture that, I think that'd be a very strong play. And then you basically just hold objective one and you hold objective three for as long as you can with that like backfield dive and try and win on the one objective in the later stages of the game. It's a very, very good match between these two clan mates, despite it being a very grindy mirror match. Still some good dynamic play. Horseman able to get some nice javelin fire into the uh, Seekers, as well as the Hellstriders. And the Slaneshi Horsemen don't really have great combat sets. Like the Nurgle ones kind of do with melee defense, and the Corn ones do as well. The Slaanesh ones are very much like, you know, fast, furious, and they, of course, do have devastating flanker, which means if they do get a rear charge or a side charge, they can be okay, but... And they have the overpowered Mark of Slanesh, which just gives physical resist to everything, which is insane. But Houseplant able to clean up that backfield objective. There are some, uh, yeah, it looks like he's still got some units here. There's going to be some Chaos Warriors as Hell's Courage is coming out. But it looks like Houseplant has taken over the game. He's pulled the value lead by 700, and he has a triple cap right now. So showing why he is the dreaded world champion. As his Mirror Guard and his uh, Chaos Warriors with Slanesh, or excuse me, Housecats, try and move up. But now what's going to happen is they're going to get screened out. So Houseplant has very, very good control, and he's going to be intercepting these guys. And you know, having played games like Company of Heroes lately... It's a very viable tactic, right? Somebody's trying to get to an objective, you intercept their forces and screen them before they can get their capture weight on the objective. It's kind of cool to see that being uh, paralleled in other RTS games and whatnot. But here on the back objective, it is uh, it is all uh, all houseplant. He's going to flip this one super quickly as he moves his horseman on. It is going to be a Sigvald grind here in the middle, but I would not be surprised to actually see the house cat of war tap out at this point. Uh, his opponent has complete battlefield agency. He's got the Marauder horseman for a huge, huge control. Uh, these Hell Striders with Hell Scourgers are just going to get basically rampaged and uh, thrown to pieces by these Javelins. We see a couple good quality infantry coming back in. Maybe Houseplant would be able to flip this one, but yeah, that's that's rough. They got rampaged by the Fascination. Beautiful play. And uh, then they just get absolutely hammered by Houseplant's superior numbers here on the side objective. In the middle, we do have uh, the, the, the Sigvald Duel. Sigvald Duel of Fates rubbing their uh, sausages together. Nobody's going to be making any progress there. The back objective, it looks like it was kind of in danger of being flipped. Not really, I guess. A ways off, but um, yeah, nonetheless, the Hell Strider's going to be cleaning that up and basically shutting that down. And uh, again, I wouldn't be surprised to see the House Cat of War uh, tap out of this game here. At the end of the day, the battle was pretty even for a large portion of the fight, but what ended up happening is Houseplant was starting to get superior engagements with just this super clean micro and using his Marauder Horseman in the fourth quarter in tandem with the Pit of Shades. And uh, yeah, I think like the Pit of Shades is really good if your opponent's going to be going warrior-based, uh, which, you know, he ran into a pure warrior build. So the Pit of Shades paid huge dues, whereas the Lore of Magic for House God of War, it had a little bit of a gimmick in the beginning for getting some value back, but it just uh, it just wasn't as impactful as a, something that's pretty much designed to kill, you know, good quality infantry here. So Hellstriders of Slanesh going to be pulling back right now, being chased down by the Chaos Warriors. 
And ladies and gentlemen, that's going to be game one going to the world champion. Some hot Sigvald versus Sigvald action. You know, I actually enjoyed that. I thought it was kind of fun. I normally hate mirror matches, but that one wasn't that one wasn't too bad. A little bit fast. And I'd rather see Slanesh play against themselves than like beating up a faction that's much weaker than them. So feels good. GG, Pit of Shades got the job done. Game one going to the house plant. The cat has run into a cactus in the house, but he is licking his paws and he'll be back for vengeance in game two. As game two, I'm taking a look here at the map is going to be, all right, where is it? Uh, this is going to be the bottom of the bracket. We're going to be on the classic black arc. Very well played to house cat, man. I actually thought he was going to have some good chances there in the beginning. He played very, very nice. Let the Sigvalds watch indeed. Do you know if there will be an ever chosen style invitational for, uh, for chaos dwarfs? It's something I'm going to be trying to work on. Yeah. Don't worry. I'll, I'll, I'll try and make it happen. Regardless, I'll host a big tournament. God, please, no more Slanesh mirror matches. Let me see who's on the other side of the bracket. I think I think we should have some updates now. Um, checking here. All right. So, do we know who won on the other side? Are they still playing? Oh my God. No, oh, that's happening. Oh, <laughs> Liver Rivers. Reverend Sasha is probably the Sigvald ideal fight. Honestly, most self involved, pretentious sword fight you ever saw. <laughs> thank you for the 25, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that was a fun one. Hey, Jay Phoenix, how you doing? Any Dark Elf players today? Uh, I think Dark Elves were played earlier in the event. I, I'm only watching the top four today. We have new models on the site, do we now? All right, let's go take a look. So, shout out to Jay Phoenix. Putting all these new miniatures up on Total Tavern from our community members. So we can take a moment to go look at all these while we have some time. All right, so heading to the back end, which is where I would imagine. Oh, wow. Wow, look at that. Oh, man. Jay, that, that's awesome. You are an extremely talented painter. So that's Rapunce. That's the old school Rapunce model. Oh my God, look at that. Jeez, that's really cool. I like the basing too. The leaves look really nice, yeah. And it looks like a dryad bark is the color you use for the base. That's actually what I do for my Lord of the Rings minis as well. Do dog's on his last game and then, oh wow. Okay, sounds good, Bob, thank you. We have, that's, that's a pretty cool. That's like a really unique like, that's, that's rad. A lot of airbrushing. You can see a lot of airbrushing. You know, whenever I see the wings on units like this, it, it makes me think of like, like, remember how many of you guys went to laser tag in the nineties? Like laser tag arenas or like, you know, those like go-kart places and they have that like spray paint, like 1980s, like nineties art style. Kind of reminds me of that. That's really cool. And then over here, what else do we got? Oh, we have a nice skink Oracle by Morpheus here. Love it. It looks like he's got like a star pattern on himself. Yeah, it's cool. He's got like the, the purple skin with the, the star pattern. I really like that. Hell yeah. Bretonian Knights. Glorious, glorious. Look at that. All right. Taking a look here. We have what appears to be a Cornate Ogre. Oh, that's cool. That's really cool. Look at that battle axe. Oh my God. That's by McIver. Uh, so we're, I'm actually going to hire um, this guy, this gentleman here, McIver, to paint um, a Dark Elf army for our uh, tabletop channel. So that's gonna be very exciting. That is an awesome, awesome paint job. Look at that, and we also do have a Ghost of an Archer. I believe we've seen some of these. Holy shit, look at Bellicor. Bellicor is, uh, that's my Leech Lord. Damn, that's a nice Bellicor right there. <laughs> yeah. Bellicor's tabletop model is so good. It's so, so good. Yeah, absolutely nuts. All right, so. Very cool models. Shout out to Jay Phoenix. Thank you for uploading all those. We really appreciate you. And now let us go ahead and see what they're going to be doing here. Okay, we got Demons of Chaos versus Corn in our next match. Very exciting stuff. <laughs> the dogs have officially been let out. The corn dogs. There's going to be corn dogs battling one another. That was my 10th birthday activity. Ended up with uh, agonizing. <laughs> oh, with the laser star? Laser tag? Yeah, yeah. Laser tag and shooting each other with BB and pellet guns. Yeah, the early '90s. I know. It's it's pretty. Um, man, I uh, I have some crazy memories of like the late '90s, early 2000s. There was one like the amount of like crazy shit that you could just like do as a kid, and your parents would just like let you do it in the '90s was nuts. In the early 2000s, like so, my friends and I we used to do airsofting um, in one of our friends' backyards when we were like 11, 12 years old. So we had airsoft guns and. Uh, it became, it became this like Lord of the Flies, like a Mad Max type experience because 
we had our airsoft guns, but we started to evolve into like like adding like trash can lids to, as shields and um and like we would make these like improvised like maces. So you would get like a stick and like get a bunch of duct tape and make like maces. And there, we would started adding like close quarters like battling <laughs> into the airsoft, and it was so violent and dangerous. I'm just like, like oh, man, the '90s was wild. '90s and early 2000s was a crazy time. Yeah, I'm sure some of you guys can relate, but it got pretty Mad Max. I think it was largely because we were like 11 and 12, but one of the one of our friends who kind of ran the show had an older brother who was like 15 or 16, and yeah, he I think he was the one who instigated a lot of that. It was, it was nuts, but it got Mad Max. People were making like improvised armor and shit, you know. Yeah, it was it was crazy. It was crazy. <laughs> yeah, it was wild, man. Ladies and gentlemen, game two of the semifinal of today's grand finals. It's going to be the Demons of Chaos led by Houseplant facing off against Korn. He's going to be led by the House Cat of War, Valky the Bloody and her cultists trying to take down Bellacor the Dark Prince, coming in with Exalted Plague Bears and some blues as well. Yeah, no childhood so far survive the 90s. Oh my god, yeah. Yeah, on your own kid to figure it out. Yeah, it was, it was especially wild. It was, it was a wild upbringing. Yeah, there was there was a lot of a lot of we'll save it we'll save it for a pod I'll have a podcast recollection of that but there was some gnarly stories of that like I remember it, <laughs> it feeling just like just brutal. All right, guys. So, plague bears, exalted plague bears are pretty good. Their unholy hand grenades can t- take care of single entities if they get too close. They themselves are quite tanky. They do magic damage. They can obviously uh, trade pretty well. Although exalted bloodletters actually can cut through them, but the problem is Bellacor kills exalted bloodletters. So. It's a little bit tricky, but we do have the Plague Bears and a little bit of Zinchian shooting. And I would imagine it's going to be Corn Flesh Hounds in reserve and then Nurglings for Capture Weight is going to be my guess for the Demons of Chaos Army. Now for the Cornate host, it is going to be a uh, Chaos Warrior battle line. Chaos Warriors are really good. Aaron, thank you for becoming a member. Welcome to the Dukes of Haggard. I greatly appreciate you and uh, thank you, thank you. So it is going to be Chaos Warriors. They will trade quite well into any of the Zinchian units with their Silver Shields. And against the Plague Bearers, I think they'll do pretty well from a cost perspective. Having 110 armor is pretty thick, and those Plague Bearers don't have the best armor piercing. So they should be able to kind of hold up here. And we do also have the Double Cultists, both of which are going to have the Gates of Chaos, which is a great idea. Being able to summon those Plague Bearers is just huge value. And they're very fighty themselves. Of course, Bellacor is going to be able to bully them, but if you have Valkia protecting them, serving as kind of the Guardian Angel, the Guardian Valkyrie to these Cultists, they can certainly do well for sure. Anybody know where is the channel? Uh, so I haven't started the tabletop channel yet. I'll, I'll make sure to make an announcement for that. How do you think that Chaos Wars will fare in multiplayer? Uh, I'm sure they'll be fine, honestly. New new factions are generally good. Uh, yeah, and, and then there's like a nerf a couple you know, months after in the case of CA. So we'll have to see. The battle is on, and it looks like here the dreaded House Plan of War is going to be playing a one-lane focus. So he's going to be moving right up the middle and trying to push his opponent right down the pipe. Not going to be contesting the side objective. We do see an isolated unit going for the side point, which is going to be some Marauders, which is smart. Because the problem is if you send a good quality unit over here, Bellacor can just come and farm them real quick before the fighting starts. Whereas if you send a crappy Marauder, it's a little bit less Bellacor, less worth Bellacor's time to come over here. Uh, of course, Corn can bring a couple Marauder Horsemen out. I would imagine maybe we'll see one of those at least. I wouldn't hate to see one. Just to kind of keep Bellacor honest. And Valkyrie the Bloody is a pretty good duelist. She can go fisticuffs with Bellacor if she has Demon Shield. But it looks like Demon Shield has not been brought. So he opted to save the 200 gold, which I think is a little bit of a mistake. I think Demon Shield is really good against Bellacor. You just get in there, you fight him while it's active, force him to run away, whatever. And, and that's how you really do your thing. So, Hey, Wind, thanks for the live stream. Been craving some live Total War action. Well, you're in the right place. Thank you for being a member for five months, my friend. So Valky able to screen out Bellacor, but now Bellacor is going to be bouncing back over. Are we going to be seeing Flesh Hounds and or Marauder Horsemen being summoned out? House Cat of War does summon in some Minotaurs with great weapons, which of course is very good against Bellacor if they can isolate him, but not going to be easy. So the Dark Prince has landed. The Terror of the Old World is here, and he's going to be cleaving through these Coronate Warriors. And these Chaos Warriors, they certainly deserve this. This is this is, exa- this is exactly what they signed up for. They wanted to play with the Dark Powers, and here they go. They, they get Bellacor. Bellacor takes a little bit of damage. Valky the Bloody coming in, but the Dark Master is active, and Valky's melee attack is going to be heavily debuffed, down to 24, and uh, she's doing the dreaded uh, humping animation there instead of uh, attacking, which is always funny to see. On the side point, we see Marauders moving in, and Exalted Demonettes. Oh, this is cool. So we see Houseplant bringing in Exalted Demonettes of Slanesh. Now, they will tear apart low-quality corn infantry on the side. So that's going to be pretty fun to see. So Valkyria finally lands properly and is able to get a couple attacks on Bellacor in tandem with the Marauder Horseman. And Bellacor is going to be forced back. So in terms of value trading, pretty even here as Valkyria the Bloody does hunt down your boy Bellacor. 
Now, side objective is going to be going to Houseplant for sure. There is no way those exalted ladies are going to be uh, getting beaten by the, uh, well, unless Corn brings a lot over here, which it kind of looks like they're going to. We see the two cultists setting up in the high ground. And is Houseplant's army going to be rotating down to the low ground? It kind of looks like it. Is that going to be signaling the advance for Corn here? I would wager Corn will be advancing up in the high ground. We'll have to see how this unfolds here. Now, Marauders are chasing, and the little popcorn bandits are running. Just look at these little gremlins. Just, oh my god, they're so ridiculous. And the Demonettes are also going to be pulling back. So very, very cautious play here from Houseplant. I think he wants to make sure that he gets, uh, you know, a serious, serious number of good quality infantry before he goes in for the Alpha Strike and tries to get that sweet, sweet karate shop. So we'll have to see. Exalted Demonettes pulling back. Other Exalted Demonettes are here, and Valky the Bloody is here to support. Bellacor potentially going to be countered by the Minotaurs if he gets caught. Lots we'll to see. And uh, Korn needs to press the high ground objective right now. I think this would be a huge mistake. At the very least, send those two cultists over there and maybe like two warriors. And Korn does know. They, they see the play. It's very obvious. If he's moving his whole army down there, you gotta you got to punish him. Because the Plague Bear army is very slow. Because right now, Korn's in pretty good shape, to be completely honest. The Minotaurs move in, and they start beating down these uh, Blue Horrors, but they're going to want to pull back here. Nice throwing axes. Throwing axes are able to drag Bellacor back, and uh, he takes quite a few axes right to the face. They asked him a question, to say the least. And where will Bellacor go next? The Minotaurs with Grapplins have pulled back. Exalted Demonettes are going to come and be a big issue. Exalted Demonettes are absolute lawnmowers. They will cut through Corn Chaff Infantry. They'll massacre Corn Warriors. Uh, they'll honestly trade very well against most corn infantry, I would say. Um, here comes the Slopnir. Slopnir is going to go down. Very, very nice cast right there. Beautiful. Goes right through the Exalted Demonettes. And now up in the sky, we have a Duel of Fates as the two uh, Champions of Chaos do battle. Who will win? The Champion of the Blood God or uh, the cast, the Outcast of Chaos, I guess you could say. Valkyrie will trade very well here, though. I mean, of course, she's going to get hit, but from a cost perspective, it's pretty good. Now, we do see some Flesh Hounds coming in. The Traitor is Flesh Hounds, betraying Valkia, but the Minotaurs with Great Uplands should be able to deal with them pretty easily. And now Korn is going to be pushing up on the High Ground Objective as they do get the two Cultists in. This is a really good play. Uh, throwing the Cultists in, absorbing the ammunition from the Unholy Hand Grenades, while also charging your uh, summons. <clears throat> it's pretty massive, so that's going to be very strong, as the High Ground Objective is going to be flipped to the Blood God. Down here on the low ground, we see the Marauder Horse and a Corn. This is this is really, really good from House Cat of War. He's dragging uh, Bellacor around, getting really, really good throwing axe play. And now we see some Marauders with dual weapons coming out to try and trade. And the Exalted Demonettes, uh, yeah, of course they defeated Marauders. No surprises there. The Exalted Demonettes able to take down some of the Flesh Hounds. And the bottom objective is going to be flipping to the Demons of Chaos. As a Pit of Shades is going to go down, hit some Chaos Warriors. But at the end of the day, Corn also takes the high ground objective. So I would say Corn is... Probably in a little bit of a state of advantage. I, he, he's a little bit ahead here. It's a close one, but he's got the high ground. The value's like dead even. Uh, he's got the points lead, and he hasn't made any mistakes. We'll see if House Cat of War can carry on this really, really solid play against a very, very tough opponent here. So Bellacor attempts to land. Now, the Minotaurs do get hit with the Dark Master, which is a really nice play. It puts their melee attack to zero, which doesn't mean they can't hit you, but it gives them the minimum chance to hit. That's how the Dark Master works. And they're also charmed, so it would be funny if it could go negative. But Bellacor is kind of getting smashed a little bit. You have to remember the bonus for its large, it does play into account. And uh, Valkia, the Valkyrie of Corn, such a cool character, moving in as the Marauders, also going to be getting a rear charge. Marauders of Corn will trade pretty cost effectively here. They're cheap and they have a bonus for infantry, so they should be able to cut through the Demonettes with some effectiveness. And your boy Bellacor is getting smashed. Yeah, he's getting hammered. And, you know, the last event that we saw Houseplant in. I don't believe he dropped a single game. When Houseplant of War, uh, no, Houseplant of War, when Houseplant won the World Championship, he did not drop a single game. So, I mean, taking a game off him alone would be a very, very impressive feat. Valky the Bloody still battling the Dark Prince. Sweet Sorrow is active. It looks like a Pit of Shades attempt, but House Cat of War is going to be able to dodge that. Up at the high ground, Corn seems to be out trading. Yeah, look at that. Corn using the Blood Letter Summon. So he summons the Blood Letters behind the Plague Bearers. And they're pretty good against Plague Bearers. I mean, they do magic damage. They have a bonus for his infantry. And the Exalted Plague Bearers are being massacred by the Coronate Infantry here. As we see the, the pit fight breaking out. Very, very intense stuff. Looks like your boy, Bellacor, able to get away using the Dark Master and the Minotaurs. Did probably save him from getting karate chopped. A couple Flesh Hounds sitting here for Houseplant. But the value lead massively ahead for the House Cat of War. As his Marauder Horseman play, his Valkia hunting the Valkyrie has just been relentless. And the Coronate Infantry just doing great work uh, with the Cultists backing them up. The Cultists are so good. Not only are they just an awesome tanky fighting presence, but the fact that they get those summons can just turn the tide, turn the tide of entire fights. You guys remember when the game launched, how basically summons could be used instantly and how broken that was? They're still very good, but um, it's just kind of a testament to how powerful those uh, those summons are. We get some Screamers coming in. I don't think that's going to do it. I think House God of War is going to take this game. The Screamers are an okay answer against the Flesh Hounds, but there's a lot of Chaos Warrior infantry. Um, this objective is going to be flipping soon, too. Now we see the House God of War moving up with Minotaurs and uh, various combinations of Warriors and Hounds. Valky the Bloody also going to be piling in to help, and it looks like Korn, the God of Blood, 
Going to be punishing Bellacor for his uh, for his insolence here. We'll have to see. I don't know if there's any avenue of a comeback. I mean, Bellacor is pretty insane. Uh, if any character can find a way to get back in a game and, and weasel something out, it could be Bellacor. But it's going to be tr it's going to be very tricky once a triple cap happens and the points really really start to uh, pile in there. Aaron, thank you so much. Damn, dude, hundred dollars. My two uh, my two week old has uh, heard your voice more in her life than mine and probably thinks you're a real dad. <laughs> Oh man, well congratulations. Uh, hope all's going well with you guys. And uh, thank you so much for that. That's really funny, dude. Well, we'll, uh, we'll do our best to keep both of you entertained. Yes. <laughs> Cheers, Aaron. Appreciate you, man. Thank you, thank you. All right, the battle rages on in the honor of Aaron and, uh, and his, his two-week-old. As we see objective number three being flipped here, it looks like the champion of the Blood God going to be able to get that sweet, sweet objective three. As uh, your boy Bellacor is pushed back. Bellacor, you know, he can do some work, but he doesn't have capture weight himself. So he's not going to be able to flip this objective terribly quickly. There is a unit of Plague Bearers here. But Korn is just so, so powerful still in the battlefield. They have so many units down here. And now Korn is simply going to be rotating up to objective one and could potentially stop the um, stop the comeback here from uh, House Plan or stop House from having an, a, an opportunity to get this objective back. Nurglings are coming out. And just like we talked about, usually Demons of Chaos players, the standard form formula is Nurgle Infantry. Nurgle melee infantry, Zinch shooting, uh, and then, you know, corn mobility with like flesh hounds. That's like the most status quo thing ever. 100%. So over here, objective number three is going to be held. It looks like the festering stooges, look, the festering stooges are just sitting here and the corn dudes are like, you know what? You guys just, I don't even want to deal with you. I wonder why he's not killing the festering stooges. He could get a full surround and kill them fairly quickly. I'm not sure. Valky the Bloody getting it surrounded by Corn Hounds a little bit, a little bit dangerous. Could be a throwing opportunity here as uh, Big Boy Bellacor is going to be landing. And Valkia does not have the uh, the Demon Shield, so she has no way of going invulnerable here. Uh, looks like she's going to be trying to escape. Might as well just turn around and fight Bellacor, but uh, I don't know. You could probably find a way. So if you guys are trapped in this experience, you, it's really good to zoom in as close as you can and see what the best avenue or open spaces for your character to run through. Now, top objective is going to be uh, maybe taken back here by the houseplant, but we do see the Hounds of the Blood God on their way out. So the Flesh Hounds of Corn are going to be swarming in and jumping on top of the Nurglings here. And Nurglings basically get ripped to shreds by Flesh Hounds. It is an extremely brutal fight. We do also see some of the Cultists who Bellacor did smash a little bit. The Cultists could make their way back to objective number one here, move on, and uh, yeah, they would make sure that that objective was held for sure. Looking at the points, 967 to 351. Massive advantage for Housecat, our champion of the Blood God. Ross, haven't been around in a while. Glad to catch you live. Hey, I appreciate you, uh, mighty uh, mouse and or rat in a top hat with a mustache. I appreciate that, man. Great, great picture there, right? It's funny stuff. Yep, Fleshhound's doing the work. Very, very strong, but another Fleshhound unit does come out for Houseplant. Obviously, both players have access to Fleshhounds, having access to the Demon roster. Dude, if Houseplant manage if Housecat manages to... I, I guess, or I should say, if Houseplant manages to come back in this game, that's going to be absolutely nuts. That would just be absurd. I mean, he's kind of closed the value gap a little bit. And here we do see a nice pit of shades coming down. And the Festering Stooges are still going. They have four, 41 models, and they're still fighting. And that pit of shades, oh my god. Is this going to be a comeback? Is is Houseplant somehow going to return? Dude, he's like the Palpatine of Total War. He just he's just the just plays villainous OP factions. Comes back and just f always finds a way to just get back in the game. Although that's actually not an apt analogy because if you really think about it, guys, Palpatine pretty much always loses. Like Palpatine from Star Wars, he's never winning. He's in every situation. He, he gets, you know, a little bit of fun in the beginning, but he always ends up losing somehow, right? So I don't know if that's the most apt analogy, but some, somehow Houseplant has returned. And uh, Valky is on the run. It looks like the Demons of Chaos managed to secure that bottom objective despite there being what appear to be several corn units a minute ago. I, I don't know how that was possible. Granted, at this point, uh, Housecat could win on one objective. So if he just continues to pressure objective one and tries to just, wherever Bellacor isn't, he just goes for it, right? And honestly, using Valkia as a bit of a distraction card effects might not be a bad idea. But what's going to happen right now is Houseplant's probably going to come for a back cap. He's going to come in with his hounds and his screamers. And what Korn needs to do in response is get some infantry up here, like stat, some warriors, something like that. Looks like this objective is going to be flipping here. Really nice pit of shades going to be going down to the Marauders. And I mean, yes, Palpatine did rule the galaxy for a long time, but you know, he always, he always loses in the end. And Houseplant almost never loses. So I, I don't know if it's a really apt analogy. Yeah, I suppose he had his time in the sun. I suppose he did. So here we get the Cultists of Korn moving up. We do get the Flesh Hounds moving over to this uh, back objective here. And Korn needs to just hold on to this one for as long as possible. That's basically just their game plan. Oh, the Sword of Korn with the steel chair. Oh my god, that was... It looks like the Sword of Korn was used by Bellacor. And just nails the Korn infantry, the treacherous one. Wow, look at that. 
So the Demons of Chaos get a random ability from the uh, from the Pantheon there, and it looks like they were able to get the uh, Sword of Corn. Oh my god, House Cat of War was in such a commanding position! And now he's on the ropes, like hardcore. We get some Flesh Hounds being brought in by the House Cat of War. We got Marauders. We do also have some um, Marauders of Corn moving in. And yeah, they're just going to have to Helm's Deep on this back objective, guys. You basically have to send everything you have to objective two now and just try and hold. Because I, I don't think you're going to get any more objectives back from Bellacore. The only time that might be possible is if, for some reason, Houseplant pulls everything to go for the last desperate push and opens up a back cap on this objective here, guys. <clears throat> oh my god, here they go. So Marauders of Corner on the way in. It looks like they're going to be able to defend this objective with the Cultist, but a lot of Nurglings coming in, a lot of capture weight in the fourth quarter. Valky the Bloody is going to probably have to come back and help on the defense. Is Corn going to be bringing more infantry? Yes, we have Marauders and Marauders and more Marauders. And it looks like these units are going to be crumbled down to so the Flesh Hounds are wavering. The Screamers of Zinch are wavering. Units from the back objective are probably going to stay there. Festering Suit just might as well just let them sit there and guard that, I think. we got some Marauder Horsemen back here. Is Palpatine going to return? Or will the House Cat of War find his way to a victory here in this game? Houseplant, obviously not wanting to drop any games. He's trying to keep that intimidating reputation of never losing, which has certainly been the case in the past couple of tournaments we've seen him in. Looks like the objective is slightly in the favor here of Houseplant. It's going to be very dangerous once the Nurglings arrive in droves. A lot of this is going to be depending on the Winds of Magic. If Bellacore has more Pit of Shades in the back pocket, I think he could flip this objective with some ease. And look at this MLG play. Using the Flesh Hounds of Corn to intercept the infantry, even for just a second, could make all the difference in this objective flipping back. 1351, guys. It is really, really close. Valkia trying to head off some of the Nurglings. And will the Marauders get there in time? Flesh Hounds are being pulled. So the Flesh Hounds are being pulled to screen the Marauders from getting to the objective. And they do get a partial screen, betraying their fellow Cornate Warriors. So now, House Cat of War, he's got to find a way to get an objective back. And he certainly has the tools to do it. Granted, Bellacor is not going to be easy. I think at this point, if you're the House Cat, you start playing the side objective again. Maybe send some good Corn Infantry here. Hitman Hippo, thanks for becoming a member. One of our tournament hosts. Thank you, thank you. Greatly appreciate that. And will the Marauder Infantry be able to get this one back? Flesh Hounds of Corn causing a lot of problems. Nurglings will obviously get cut down, and that's kind of the downside of Nurglings. When you send them in a bit of a desperation mode, they're going to be pretty terrible at fighting. And we do see some uh, Chaos Warriors of Corn moving up towards this high ground objective. And Man, oh man, this is an extremely pitched fight. Oh, the Cultist has a summon! So he's going to be getting a summon of Blood Letters. That's going to be super useful for potentially pushing Nurglings off the objective. But man, he needs to go after Bellacor, I think. I think you get Valkia and go after Bellacor. He's kind of low. I mean, he's sitting at 3,000 HP, but Valkia and the Cultist working together might be able to get a little bit of work in there. As we see a lot of Flesh Hounds coming onto the objective, and we are going to be getting a Narcissism. So the Slanesh Lore Passive activated here for the Demons of Chaos, allowing the Flesh Hounds of Houseplant to get the ideal charge. They're going to be getting the charge bonus, which is 46. Not unsubstantial. It's, it's quite good, for sure. And now the Blood Letters moving into fight. Marauders battling against your boy Bellacor. Valkia, I think, needs to just use her anti-large prowess and try and put this game on her back. Because Valkia could kill Bellacor, like 100%. Blood Letters moving into the uh, Blue Horrors here. Going to start popping them like popcorn. Valkia needs to be the hero that Gotham needs. So Valkia does get a nice attack there. The Dark Master is active, but she has really good melee attack and also anti-large, so she might be able to get through the Dark Master ability. Corn going to be summoning in more troopers, but it looks like Houseplant starting to take over. Houseplant once again has returned. How, yeah, he's the new Dark Lord for sure. I mean, dude, the fact that I, I legitimately was saying in my commentary, I don't think there's a chance for, for Houseplant to come back. He, he heard that, he took that personally, and uh, he somehow found a way to win, which is nuts. I can't believe he won that series. I cannot believe it. I think that game was totally winnable by Corn. I just think there was some decision making um, as it pertains to Valkia. Uh, that was a bit of a mistake. And just, just little things here and there. Little things. All right, guys. GG, well played. Bellacor, very strong. But the Plague Bearers also didn't do bad. And the Flesh Hounds, it was cool. We got to see Exalted Demonettes also doing very well. That was a very fun matchup. I liked that one a lot. That was great. Minotaurs, how'd they end up doing? Yeah, Minotaurs. They, it always seems like they can't quite catch Bellacor. So that's going to be a 2-0 victory, guys, for the Houseplant. We'll, we'll see Housecat again in the third place match. Don't you worry. Heading on over to the top four. It is going to be... The Houseplant advancing on to the Grand Finals today. And let me go ahead and take a look here and see who made it. All right. So it looks like it's going to be Dog Person who made it to the top four on the other side. It's pretty funny. So we have... Um, okay, let me get the name here. We have two members of XMT, the Extreme Meme Team, who have made it to the top four. And two members of RTK. They're each having to meet their like their 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 counterparts and have the honorable duel to see who's going to be the champ. It's like they're dueling to see 
who the champion of their clan is going to be, which I think is, is quite a bit of fun, actually. Very, very cool narrative here. All right, so... All right, perfect. So, see you in finals, houseplant, and see you in third place match. All right, very cool. So, let me go ahead and rehost the lobby just to make sure it's not bugged or anything. And there we go. Let's get the invite codes ready. It's kind of sad that, you know, the two, the, the friends all have to play each other, you know, but it's what happens when a lot of the best players uh, practice together. Yeah, it can happen. All right, let's like this. Go domination mode. And for the maps for today. Okay. So where is this? Maps for the next round are going to be the top of the bracket. So Glade of the Ever Queen is going to be the first one. And then we have Itza in the halls of Karagdum. I pwned Kyle. Thank you for the 200. Holy shit, man. You guys are out of control today. You need to calm it down. That was a great comeback. Love your content, sir, and have been watching. Haven't watched anything live in about two months. Got to make up for that. Dude, I really appreciate that. And now we go into the next round which is going to be a duel of fates between uh, two mighty champions of... Wait, is Flying Taco in XMT or is he in QSA? I can't... I'm pretty sure he's XMT. I think these guys are in the same clan. So Dog Person, doing great in recent tournaments, also wrote several articles for Total Tavern and is one of our tournament hosts. So great folks all the way around. Pwn is surprised he didn't make it. Yeah, no, I, I was really expecting you to come in here and, and battle Houseplant Pwn. So if you guys want to see non-meta matchups, this is going to be the best of three for you because both of these guys really, really like to play off uh, like off meta stuff. I'm pretty sure these last two games have been real March Madness. I feel my sanity being ripped to shreds having to watch all this chaos. Yeah, chaos is very good. Chaos is very, very good. Yeah, they don't mess around. Okay, perfect. Dude, thank you so much, man. I, I don't know what to say. Kyle, uh, continue, you know, pwning your enemies enjoying your life i really appreciate that donation dude and uh yeah live content's back man it's gonna be great next few months are gonna be awesome once we get once we get a new season we get you know chaos dwarves coming just all sorts of fun stuff hopefully some balancing changes and the game is gonna be really really uh rejuvenated i am super hyped for it wait they're not playing a bretonia mirror match are they yes it is okay perfect Just letting the players know, match is casted also. Yeah, we're gonna be casting the third place match as well today. So that will be going down. Super Saiyan, dude, <laughs> we have so many people with Pwn in their name. The cult of Professor Pwn is rising. Super Saiyan Pwn, thank you. Thank you for becoming a member. Let's see how we're doing on our old goal for the month. Are we getting there? Oh, we're getting there, guys. We're getting there, we're getting close. 24 of uh, 50. Hey, not bad. Not bad at all. Thank you, guys. It'd be cool to some... Uh, yeah, we they, there have been clan wars. The last one they had, I was busy, unfortunately. I had some other stuff going on IRL, so... A Bretonia mirror match could be fun. Yeah, a lot of cavalry. I'd rather not do mirror matches, though. Like, the spice of life in Warhammer is, is, is the diversity of factions, 100%. Dude, I really thought House Cat of War had that. I really did. That was a crazy good game. Frostlight Demogriff Knights. You know, if I if I ever played if I like played in my own tournaments, like qualified and then I, I, I have a policy where I won't if I, I won't play in my own tournaments like for the grand finals and things like that. But if I ever did, I would bring Demogriff Knights just for you. I would bring them. They're so cool. <laughs> the cult of Professor Pwn. <laughs> is Lou is Lou inviable in multiplayer domination? Yeah, he's super good. I mean, Fane Chantress is the meta, but like Lewin can work. I mean, Franz, Boris, Toddringer, characters like that are viable. So, I mean, Lewin can be made to work too, but Fane Chantress is just so good that most people just use her. Um, but yeah. Dude, Housecat, those games are great. Oh my God, you and Houseplant both played so well. I thought I thought he was done for in that second game. You had like a three or 4,000 value lead. Yeah, it was nuts. So somebody in chat saying, so I main Zinch and it has been getting better after a tough start, but for the love of Sigmar, can someone tell me how to beat Skaven with Zinch? Let's see. So are we... So, Pelly, I need some new like details. Are you talking domination or are you talking land battle? Let me know and I can give you some pointers. 
What else? Um, so Taco typically plays ogres. Um, what else does Taco like to play? I'm trying to remember the last time I played with him what he was playing. It was it's almost just always ogres. Dog person is um, probably one of the best beastman players in the entire game. So if you guys are expecting to see some beastman action today, dog person is your he's your beastmaster. Yeah. Company of Heroes tournament soon. As soon as they add replay features, like live casting features where I can cast games live, I will host tournaments for that game. But until then, probably not. Because, you know, casting via replays. I, I like live casting. It's way more exciting, in my opinion. So how to beat Skaven as Zinch and Domination. So probably what you would want to do is go super wide with Marauders, <clears throat> like Zinchi and Marauders, backed up by, like, Blues. And then you would want to bring um, a big chicken most likely an exalted lord of change and you want to use the 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 fury summon so you use you use your exalted lord of change the summons and um furies to shut down their weapons teams and then you just roll over their front line with a combination of marauders uh uh blue horrors as well as chaos spawn that's going to be your jam so that's kind of the the rock paper scissors of that matchup you shut down their back line with furies um you shut down their ogres with screamers um you know that's that's what I would that's what I would recommend. Yeah, it's been a while, man. Uh, yeah, I I do. So I I prefer when it comes to high stakes competitive play, I prefer domination because it's it's a balanced RTS format. Like I mean, okay, the the format is balanced. Is what I'm saying is like we don't have to have arbitrary not arbitrary but community rules as it pertains to like making players have to attack and play suboptimally to follow certain rules, right? I, I love land battles, but the problem is when we have big high stakes land battles tournaments, there's usually usually some sort of like controversy over rules uh, being, you know, uh, deciphered in a certain way. And, and it's just, you know, I did that for years and it's just, I lost a lot of hair over that. So that's why I prefer Dom for competitive play, but I'm still going to be hosting faction wars and land battles. And I, I will be hosting more, some land battle tournaments using the capture point mod. Um, once the new season starts, I'm also exploring the option of adding a land battle um, leaderboard on Total Tavern, but I, I, I'm not sure if like I would want it to be with the um, with the what's it called with the the mod that adds the capture points or yeah, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. <laughs> the the, the, the pwn though, there's so many pwns in chat. I see another one. Okay, yesterday I beat a guy with the name Not Flying Talk with Ogres and Random Ranks. Surely it wasn't him. I mean, it could have been. I, I don't I don't know if Flying Taco still plays ladder. Most people don't, but um, who play in tournaments, but I mean you might have beaten him. It could happen. Yeah. Yes. We should just have a no rules land battle. Corner camping allowed. You don't have to attack. You can just sit in the trees and wait. And whoever can, whoever has the iron bladder wins that tournament. You just camp in the trees or the corner and whoever gives up first would be the true champion. But like on the subject of like land battles, um, are they waiting for me or something? Let me see here. All right. So banning Slanesh and, oh no, flying taco. Banned Beastman. Oh my God, he banned the Beastman. Oh my god. And then Dog Person bans Slanesh and Vampire Counts, and then Grand Cathay being banned. And Ogre Kingdoms, Lizardmen, and Dark Elves banning Norska being picked. Okay. He banned Beastmen. What a villain, dude. What a villain. What is stopping you from banning mirror matches? Well, it, it's it, that would be kind of a strange thing. I mean, that would be... I don't know. Banning mirror matches is much of a power fantasy as it is, it, is, it is for me. I think like it's part of the game. Just like in other RTS games, there's mirror matches. And even though I hate them there as well, it's still part of the game. So I, I, I do power fantasize all the time about banning mirror matches, though. I'm, I'm not like... From a viewership, like from a viewing perspective, it'd be way better. It'd be way better, I think. But like from player... A lot of players do enjoy mirror matches, so... Yeah. Dog needed... I know, Dog did not ban the Ogres. He didn't. Dog person taking the high ground. He's like, he's like I'm going to take the high ground here and, you know... So, oh my god. I can't believe uh <laughs> the, dan the dancing cow meme. That meme is so stupid. Oh my god. I love it. Yeah, mirror matches suck. Who banned Beastmen? Then I know who to root against. You know, I, as much as I hate to say it, Flying Taco did ban the beat he did ban Dog Person's Beastmen. 
which is, is, which is quite villainous. And Dog Person did not ban his Ogre Kingdom, so he maybe feels confident against the Ogres. And these guys are clan mates, too. This is like straight up uh, like a Star Wars narrative. You know, like two former, you know, training training partners, Padawan and Master. I don't know who's who. But, uh, you know, ult- there's some betrayal going on here. You know, they see, they see the shine of the $50 cash prize and all friendship goes out the window. <laughs> it's actually more than $50. It's not, not much. For anybody just joining, here's the prizes for today. Shout out to Roger, our community member, for sponsoring today's tournament. We got 300 for first, 150 for second, and $50 for third as well. That is going to be that. So, those are the prices. Here are the brackets. We have house plan advancing. We're going to have a third place match as well. So, the third place match will take place uh, after this match, and then we'll have the grand finals. Grand finals are best of five. So, it's going to be a full day of competition. Just want to thank you guys all for joining, but it's going to be a long one. So, hopefully, you guys got your. Uh, Got everything comfortable there. Oh, Skaven versus something. I'm a man of honor turn. <laughs> Taco's the master. I'm the Padawan, says Doc Person. Oh, he's... <laughs> All right, so Skaven banning Ogre Kingdom. So it's going to be Skaven versus Lizardmen or Skaven versus Dark Elves. So classic Warhammer 2 matchups here, guys. Taco is the Sith Lord. He is. He has become the Sith Lord in this relationship. He's the <laughs> banning, banning his, his best friend's main faction. <laughs> Yeah, it's great. Mirror scene, Stephen, though, why take a mirror if you can take a counter? Well, sometimes, like, in the case of Slanesh, there isn't a counter. So the best way to beat Slanesh is with Slanesh. So that's why you see those mirror matches. Does the victor of the tournament... You know, I think I think someday... Someday I'm going to host... You guys can maybe remember this, okay? Whoever here, whoever's here for the stream can remember this. But someday, it's been a goal of mine for a long time to host an in-person LAN event in Total War and make it like kind of like a cool in-person thing and uh, fly out some casters. Someday we're going to do that. And then the pri- when we give the prize for that event, it's going to be one of the prizes will be an Applebee's gift card. You guys remember this. I don't know. Is Applebee's, they're still in business, right? For anybody who's wondering about that story, it was from a previous stream. But basically, I got at my old company, I was an athletic director. And I literally was working 70 hour weeks. I closed, I closed the partnership for my organization that made them hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I got employee of the year um, at my company. And they gave me a $10 gift card to Applebee's as a reward. That was like, they, at the big meeting, the CEO invited me up, shook my hand and gave me a $10 Applebee's gift card. It's one of my crowning achievements in life. And I wasn't even mad. It was so funny. It was so funny. I just was like, I was like, this is the most magical moment. You know, you can't make this shit up. Applebee's is like a really haggard chain, like a like a diner, a diner. Yeah, yeah. It's gonna be a long event, guys. It's gonna be a long event. It's my favorite story. It's so good. <laughs> it is. It, you know what's even like funnier about getting a ten dollar Applebee's gift card is that it's not even enough to buy something there. Like the burgers were like eleven or twelve dollars. I think I was able to get like an appetizer. I don't think I actually even ever used it. I think it just like ended up in a box somewhere. Yeah, I'd throw the tournament for the gift card. <laughs> yeah, second, first place gets like 10 grand and then second place gets an Applebee's gift card just to make them feel really bad about losing. <laughs> that would be like the worst. Oh, uh, yeah. It's pretty funny. Oh, no worries, man, no worries. Just, I should have framed it. Oh my God, it, I'm going to frame it. If I can find that gift card, I'm going to frame it. I'm going to look. I think I know where it is. I think I have it in my old work bag. Yeah. Don't hate on the mozzarella sticks. Man, I'm allergic to cheese, so I can't even eat cheese. I mean, I can, but it makes me feel terrible. How long after you, until you left? Uh, I left the company about six months after that. Yeah. Oh, give or take. Because then I started doing YouTube full-time. Yeah, all that sort of good stuff. Is there an American ver- version of Weatherspoons? Yeah, it'd be Denny's probably. Denny's Cafe. Yeah. I don't know. It's not called Denny's. It's just called Denny's. Denny's is like where college, like drunk college kids go at like 3 a.m. and just like, yeah, just like eat the most questionable breakfast food possible. <laughs> oh, whatever you want to do that. I mean, we could do it. I'm down. I'll send them to people. <laughs> I'd rather eat a McDonald's. <laughs> You're cursed just like my brother, am I? Yeah, is that the case? Yeah. I do, I do love some cheese. So we got Skaven versus Lizardman, guys. This is going to be a fun matchup. It's a classic one. Seeing a little rat, little rat people fight against uh, dinosaurs. It's great. Who doesn't, who doesn't want to see this? This is like peak Warhammer, right? 
Skaven versus Lizardmen. Just like two of the most absurd factions you can you can possibly conjure, conjure just, just going at it. Did you ever go with the idea of tournament winner minis? Yeah. So we sent those. So the last faction war winner, we, we sent him a miniature. Granted, he was in Poland and it t- it's taking. We sent it like, I don't know, like a month ago? Maybe like three weeks ago? So we sent miniatures to the... Uh, my wife painted the mini. I don't know. Does she have a picture of that? I'll ask her if I want to run into her. Yeah, I'll ask. We had a whole Applebee's conversation and he didn't make one Ricky Bob reference. He's losing his edge. Yeah. He is getting old, man. I'm, I'm losing my edge. Wow. Oh, yeah. I'm pretty sure I've been to a Denny's and I saw a cockroach running on the floor. I, I When I was in college... Speaking of, you know who I used to hang out with at Denny's? You guys would you guys would probably not guess. But Italian Spartacus. So I knew him in college. In 2006, him and I went to college together. That's how where we met. And we used to just play World of Warcraft until like 3 a.m. And then like wake up for class at like 7. But like right after the 3 a.m. World of Warcraft session, we would go to Denny's and just like get, just get destroyed eating all their terrible food. Oh my God. That like... That is such a horrific feeling, like the morning after eating Denny's and staying up too late. Oh, God. Yeah, it's brutal. It's pretty brutal. But yeah, that was that was how, you know, how we bonded back in the day. Yeah, yeah. You want it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Send it. And it's going to send it. <laughs> yeah, that was way back in the day. That was 2006, 2007. When Sparty and I used to, used to hang out at old Denny's. <laughs> Denny's is for people who want to go to a Waffle House but can't fight. <laughs> That's so ridiculous, dude. Oh my god. Does he eat? I don't. I don't, I don't remember what he ordered. I'm pretty sure when we went to Denny's, we would just get like those disgusting breakfast plates, like this slam breakfast plate or whatever it was called. Yeah, it was. It was good. He's great. Yeah, no, he's great. Yeah, he's covering. He's covering a lot of different games now. Dog person scheming a build. And, uh, you know, remember to give the players a little bit of a break today when it comes to picking their, their builds. It's a high stakes event, so they want to make sure their builds are fine. So we're giving them a little bit of a cushion here. Matt, um, I don't know what Arcon looks like. <laughs> it looks like I'll ask all at Applebee's. You know, I, I don't know what's worse. Would it be like uh, like the closing at an Applebee's restaurant or or like the, the morning of a Weatherspoons? The Grand Slam, that's what it was. Yeah, it was a Grand Slam. Yeah. Thank you, darling. Okay, let's pull this up here. Okay. Let's do this. Let's pull this. And we are going to do it. Yeah, so when I went to the UK, I'll, I'll tell you guys the story here in a minute about that. Right now, I'm just trying to pull up the picture here. Okay. So this was the prize for the last um, Faction War tournament. So the lady painted a uh, Way Watcher, like an old school Way Watcher. So you can see here he is in just an awesome base. So she like she like, I think, 3D printed... Like, I don't know. Did you 3D print those mushrooms? Yeah, she got, so she got these like mushrooms and made this whole like base and like diorama. And it, yeah, so it's, it's, that's going to be like the, the prize for faction wars going forward is you get a, a mini painted from your favorite faction. So we'll order the mini for you and we'll, we'll paint it up and everything and, and do that. Jamie, thanks for becoming a member. Welcome, welcome. Yes. The Dukes of Haggard rise. We got four new members today. Thank you guys so much. And uh, yeah, so the wife will be painting minis for the winners. It was kind of interesting because we're like, what happens if Cathay or Kislev wins? They don't really have minis. We're like, we're going to have to figure that out. Yes, do it. Wait, is that a quaddle? I was I was reading chat and I missed the dreaded quaddle, guys. This is, this is Flying Taco. I, I love that no matter what, we have happened here today. It's going to be like the, a member of the extreme meme team with like the most like meme, but yet competitive builds versus like the more sweaty style. It's going to be a really interesting grand finals. Yeah. Yes. The lady dropped a link in chat and there's her store. If you want to take a look at all of her glorious creations, what I was going to say about weather spoons is yeah. So 
Maybe we'll save it for after the game because they're about to load in. So I think we should save the weather spoon story. If you guys can remind me to tell, I told you guys the weather spoon story before, but there's more to it. Like there's more detail, which I haven't like, which I haven't gone into about the weather spoon story, which was pretty fun. I can't believe he brought it. I can't believe he brought a quaddle, dude. Escaping are pretty good at killing big monsters too. So I'm going to be a little bit precarious. All right. Battle will begin shortly. It is the dreaded flying taco versus the dog person. A person who is also a dog. They'll be doing battle. And here it goes. Taking a look at the army here of the Lizardmen and the Flying Taco. Taco's been a Lizardman main since I can remember. Can you say? Why, why am I saying that? I feel like this is a trap. Am I being lured into some, some Zoomer meme that I'm not aware of? My, my boomer senses are tingling. All right, guys. We got a Quaddle. Quaddle is going to be here. And, uh, you know, it causes terror. It makes things invisible underneath it with the uh, Master of the Sacred Places. And it does also have a couple bounce spells. On top of that, we got a million skanks, a slan mage, a slan mage of life, just to heal up the big quaddle, uh, quaddle, quaddle. I don't know why my tongue is just getting so twisted trying to say that, but um, yeah, the slan mage is going to be able to drop fat heals on that terror causing beast, and it's basically just skinks. All right, guys, he's got a mass skink army. I don't see a single Saurus in sight, and a quaddle. <clears throat> oh my god, it's going. <laughs> it is a trap. Yeah, I figured it was. You guys, you guys, trying to get me, huh? Now for the army of dog person, it is going to be uh, Skaven Slaves backed up by Clan Rats. We do also have Warlock Engineers with Flensing Ruin to try and do some AoE punishment. And we do also have the Chieftain. So the Chieftain's going to be here with the anti-large poking stick. Skaven Slave on Summon Lord, very standard using the Chieftain Power Grab combo. Hopefully something that'll be, uh, I don't even know, Skaven aren't like super strong. So they're definitely considered to be like a lower tier faction, like mid lower tier, kind of in that range. But ladies and gentlemen, uh, I don't know what to say. There's a quaddle here. This is literally the most high stakes tournament we have in our, at least in the community that I'm a part of. And uh, yeah, he is he is here with it. It's happening. It is a hell of a lot of skinks. He's got he's got 16 or maybe 14 of them, I think. Chameleon stalkers. Oh my God, he's, he brought chameleon stalkers also. Dear God in heaven, look at these things. You almost never see these things either. I mean, I guess against like clan rats, they're not bad. They have those like precursor shots. These guys are so cool. Chameleon Stalkers are such a rad unit. And you know, in um, Age of Sigmar right now, the uh, Lizardmen are getting a huge range update, like all new models on a ton of different things. And uh, that's all obviously going to be used in the old world as well, which is very, very exciting. <laughs> my, my wife in chat saying, like the stream or else a meteor hits the lizards. Yeah, you know, she's got a point. She's got a point. The battle is on. The quaddle is going to be moving up, flying across the field. And I would imagine is it doesn't give itself stock, which is such a shame. You know what's really funny is I bet you that dog person maybe thinks that something is hiding under the quaddle, but there's just nothing hidden. It's just the, the dreaded solo quaddle. It's going to be moving out. So we'll see. Disgraceful Lord Unsummoned versus Chad Quaddle. <laughs> I don't know. That was so funny, dude. Oh my God. It's just ridiculous. All right, guys. The quaddle's on its way up and the dog person... He's moving up with the Skaven Horde. What is his answer going to be against the Quaddle? I guess just like Ogres? No, Teeth Breakers. Okay. So we got the uh, we got the Teeth Breakers coming out. These things are really, really good at killing monsters. If there's like one big target that you need brought down, you bring out the Rattling Gunners, and they're going to be able to put some massive damage onto those big dinosaurs. Flying Taco just moving up with his Unholy Zerg of Lizardmen, and it's going to be summoning in some Salamander Hunting Packs. Hunting Packs, good against Rat Ogres, good against Hellpit Abominations. They still do okay damage against Infantry. They have a little bit of splash on their attacks. And the Skaven are just going to be playing defensive, trying to minimize fighting until it's really, really time to fight. Dude, I can't believe he brought a Quaddle here. I just, uh, I can't believe it. Look at this. And it's not hiding anything. Maybe he assumes there's a Dread Saurian under there. Although, the thing is, most of these high-level players, like, you can look at an enemy army and, like, kind of start to add up all the costs. And you can you can kind of tell if there's anything hidden based on that by, by you know, comparing the numbers up in the top and everything and uh, doing that. If you really, really are super sweaty. So will the Quaddle be a useless, terrible monster like it usually is? Or is it going to carry the game and surprise us all? And will a new meta be born? Because that are the parameters with which we are playing. Now, summons. Dog person saving up. He's at about 900. Flying Taco at 700. Dog person summons in a play clock catapult, which is an excellent choice. Really well played here by Dog person. That is a, a great call against all these skinks. It'll just nuke them and obliterate their leadership. So clan rats, we got we basically have the gremlins of these factions fighting. The skinks versus the clan rats and skaven slaves. So the fight is on. Oh, we have the crouching tiger hidden salamanders, I think. I think they're hidden. Let's see. Yeah, they're hidden. They had the they had the buff. Alright. 
So we got some hidden salamanders right there. Now the skinks gonna be colliding with these Skaven slaves, and they should win that fight. Skinks have really good capture weight, and Salamanders getting a nice salvo into the Skaven Slaves here. Javelins going into Skaven Slaves as well. I wouldn't hate seeing like a little bit of a flank, like sending two Chameleons or two um, Lizardmen, just basic Chaff units, to go back here and try and shut down that Play Claw Catapult. I think that could be quite strong. But the Salamanders should be revealed now that they're shooting, and the Quaddle is going to be coming out to play. Rad Ogres, the Pit Fighters of Helm's Deep being sent in, but I would imagine the Salamanders going to be saturating in and getting big, big damage. You can see the Rad Ogres getting absolutely pounded by that firepower. Really, really nice. Uh, immediately, they take big damage. And look at this. The big Chungus is here. Where's the Quaddle going? Oh, my God. I think it's trying to attack something. I'm not sure what's happening. No, wait. Is it flying or is it on the ground? It's so hard to tell with those things. Anyways, the Quaddle drops. Oh, look at that. The Quaddle dropping a spell back here. It's going to be doing something. Okay, never mind. It didn't do much. But it's still trying its best. Flensing Rune is active on the Quaddle. And the Rattling Gunners are just nuking it to the Shadow Realm. We all sat here as if we expected something different to happen with the Quaddle. But, um, yeah. Kind of what's happening with it. Although it does survive. And here we do see the skink cohort able to get past the clan rats. And they do jump on top of the rattling gunners, which is turbo cost effective. And it still is a big terror causing monster. The quaddle is attacking what appears to be rat ogres here and uh, might be able to break them. As the salamander firepower in the back doing big, big damage. The feral bastillon also being summoned in. And the battle continues to rage on as the skaven player casts the plague. Now back objective owned by the skaven. Objective number two owned by the Lizardmen, and objective number three is currently owned by the Skaven. So the Skaven have a double cap. Looks like they're going to be calling in the Council Guard. So that's a really good choice. Council Guard, pretty good against a lot of these big monsters. Unbreakable, anti-large, heavily armored. What's not to love? As now the Dread Quaddle is going to be attacking. The Quaddle is going after the Teethbreakers here, trying to shut down one of the few elements in the battlefield that can actually deal with it. And how is Flying Taco going to be dealing with Council Guard? He does not have Dwellers Below or any sort of a big anti-infantry punishing piece. Uh, I guess the Quaddle does have a couple bounce spells. It looks like a regrowth is going down as the Bastillodon continues to rampage across. And the Quaddle is just methodically chasing down the Teeth Breakers, trying to take that bad boy down. Now, on the back objective here, we got Clan Rats versus Saurus. So now we start to get some good quality infantry coming out. So it was Skinks initially, but now we start to see some Saurus infantry making their way into the battlefield. As the Feral Bastillodon tanks here and does a pretty good job of doing that. Yeah, look at that. It's basically occupying the Council Guard and also allowing the Salamanders to get nice splash damage into the, uh, the Pit Fighters of Hell's Deep right here as well as the council guards who's certainly not bad now on the side here the quaddle just getting nice terror routes able to terror out these guys off these clan rats probably will be terror routed shortly as well back objective owned by the lizard men and this objective actually is being pushed by the cohorts although i think clan rats do beat cohorts i'm not sure and wow in the backfield i didn't notice it guys chameleon stalkers getting extra sneaky they move back here you guys probably saw it i saw some of you guys mention it in chat but the chameleon stalkers able to ambush the play claw catapults wow man i can't believe we're seeing it that's crazy stuff Flying Taco pulls a little bit ahead on value, taking that artillery down. And the Dread Quaddle has gotten back. It looks like it's retreated because now the Teeth Breakers are back online. So trying to avoid that beast. As the Skaven player here, the, the Dreaded Dog Person, doing a great job shutting down the Bastillodon. Moving forward with the Council Guard as the Quaddle tries to use one of its bounce spells to do some damage. Now we get Feral Cold Ones coming out. I think Feral Cold Ones intercepting some Rat Ogres in the tree line here. Where is the Quaddle going to go? It looks like it could keep battling these Glen Rat Spears, although that's not really a great choice for it. But the Chameleon Stalkers ambushing back there is uh, is super, super good. That That's massive, taking down a big artillery piece and also kind of camping the spawn. So now if the Skaven try to send out any sort of a, a range unit, the Chameleon Stalkers with their massive speed advantage over Skaven Slaves and Clan Rats uh, is going to be able to intercept any of those range units. So a really, really nice, nice usage of that unit. But the Skaven are still maintaining pretty good dominance on the objective. Dog Person obviously has some nice swarming efficiency, which is very Skaven. We see the clan rats all over the place. They have pretty good leadership, obviously. And uh, I feel as if Flying Taco doesn't have enough anti-infantry in his build. Like, I don't know, maybe like Croxagors or something. Saurus Warriors could also be quite nice. We're not seeing any Globideers coming in from the Skaven. So I do think we could see some good usage out of, uh, you know, like some good quality infantry like Saurus. But again, it's, it's usually something against Skaven. You don't want to bring good quality infantry because Skaven are like the dark, dark masters of killing infantry. So Quaddle getting some routes. Supported by the cohort of Sotek, this back objective actually being flipped here. So it looks like the Lizardmen might be able to get this objective as the Chameleon Stalkers just trolling around in the trees. Look at this. So Flying Taco is basically just running in circles. He's just all over the place trying to be as much of a distraction as he possibly can here in the backfield. But this objective might flip to the Lizards. It's pretty close. There's not a ton of capture weight right there. You could move the Slan up on the objective. He's an okay fighter and, uh, you know, I mean against Clan Rats he is and does provide a little bit of capture weight. So I wouldn't hate seeing the... Um, the old uh, Slan Mage moving over to Objective 1 right there. Now in the backfield, are the Skaven threatening this? It does not look like it. Objective number 3 is firmly owned by the Rats, but there are some Saurus Warriors here who are 
able to kind of shoot through some of these units. Granted, they are the spear variant, so they're not going to be that good against clan rats. What are the summons going to be for Taco? Taco's going to be summoning out more skink cohorts, as well as, is that a mobility piece? It looks like it's just more skink units. Up in the sky, we do see the Quaddle getting an Earth Blood. And did I see Rod? Oh, it's Lord Skrulk. It's the big stinky. Okay, so Lord Skrulk is actually out on the battlefield. We didn't notice this before, but the big stinky could potentially get gooned by the Quaddle. I mean, it's a big scary monster, and he's, uh, he's, he's he is but a humble little rat, so I don't know how that fight would go for him. So taking here, we do see Objective 2 owned by the Lizards, but perhaps not for long, as the rats were able to route them off Objective number 1 and are going to be moving on over to Objective number 2. It looks like it could be a pretty solidified triple cap here for Dog Person. You have to remember, though, there's a ton of healing for the Lizards. The Quaddle has been healed easily over 1,000 value in damage, so the value is probably really close. But overall, the Skaven are swarming, but there still is terror on the battlefield. The terror routes could be very pertinent, as Lord Scroll is going to be caught in Mortal Wombat here with the uh, Quaddle and its uh, Haggard attack animation. So, I don't know, would Lord Scroll actually find a way to win this fight? I don't really know. The Quaddles have such weird attack animations. That's why one of the reasons why you don't see them used terribly often. But Feral Cold One's on the way out, and Lizard's trying desperately to hold on to this objective as rats and rats and rats and more rats swarm on top of it. Lord Scroll accidentally gets knocked on top of the objective here. Feral Bastilodon probably should have been unsummoned a while ago, so you could resummon a fresh one, but it looks like Taco did have a little bit of a misplay here, as Dog Person continues to swarm all over the points with his rats, and uh, yeah, truly playing very, very strong Skaven, as he, he knows it's a numbers game, and that's how Skaven are in lore, that's how they are in tabletop, that's how they are in pretty much uh, every format I've seen them in. It's, it's a numbers game, they just like to swarm. So Dog Person falls even further ahead, as the Quaddle um, doesn't appear to be pulling its weight. It's got about 800 value, it still is a source of terror, I suppose. You see the slam moving in here, but yeah, just it seems the lizards did not have enough to deal with the massive swaths of um, of just yeah, of just rats. There's just so many of them, and skin cohorts aren't going to be able to cut through clan rats very effectively. They only have 20 melee attacks, so like clan rats are actually kind of jacked in comparison. I mean, their melee defense isn't amazing, but 18 as compared to 20 isn't that big of a differential, right? So Lizard's still trying to move and grind, and uh, he does not have Ruinate. He does not have the Bound Banishment either. He really needs something to punish these mass infantry. If there was like, uh, if there was some sort of a Dwellers Below, a Ruination of Cities, uh, any sort of a Bound Bombard effect, I think that the Lizards maybe could have ran away with the game. It's hard to say. Unless Grolf Daddy's going to be getting hit, but he does drop a Fat Plague right here, so the Plague's going to be going down, and uh, basically it kind of just looks exactly like Scroll, but... Is not bad at clearing out infantry. It's an okay spell. So salamanders get on the flank. We do also see some uh, chameleon skinks trying to get a little bit of poke and stroke. Chameleon skinks swarming in, but these uh, these clan rats going to be taking some of those little darts to the face for the horned rat. And the backside, the chameleon stalkers, the ones that we forgot about that were like looping around the map, they managed to get back on the objective. And chameleon stalkers can certainly beat up some basic clan rats here, a hundred percent. Still a pretty close game. This objective could be retaken by the Lizards. The side objective, though, looks firmly in the control of the Rats. And the thing is, Dog Person's getting such a huge lead right now, and he's very close to winning on one point. So the Lizards are going to need to get a double cap here uh, very, very, very soon if they want any chance of staying in this game. Rat Ogres on the way in. Sara Spears uh, just does not seem like there's enough cap weight here as the Vermintide is just all over the battlefield. All over the place. Chameleon Skanks trying to fight off Clan Rats, but not terribly cost-effective to have those bad boys in melee. Now on the backside, we do see the Chameleon Stalkers battling against the Clan Rats of Spears as the uh, the war rage is on here, guys. A very pitched fight. Chameleon Stalkers should win this pretty decisively despite the numbers advantage, but there's just an unholy horde of rats coming in. Yeah, some pizza needed to be delivered from Itza. Yeah, and it doesn't seem like it's going to be the case as the big chunky rat ogres are on their way in, backed up by even more rats. So rats upon rats upon uh, even more rats. Hopefully that's what you guys are looking for as uh, the Grand Finals rages on. Bottom side of the uh, semifinals. Now we get another Bastilodon coming in. Bastilodons are pretty good against infantry. Not bad. We do see the Quaddle trying its best to fight here. Flying Taco doing his clan proud. You know, truly a lord of the extreme meme team here. As he does pop this regrowth and gets that vigor. But the Quaddle, will it pay for itself is the question. Almost a thousand value, so it's getting there. The Teethbreaker still have 18 models despite being at literally like 5% HP, which is pretty nuts. But yeah, now it's in triple cap territory. So if the Lizards wanted any chance of winning, they're going to need a triple cap. We do see a Play Claw Catapult summon back out. And the Chameleon Stalkers, actually, these guys did great. Um, they were able to shut down the Catapult earlier and also took that back objective. And it looks like the Dinos finally get their objective back. So the uh, the fact that it was close to their home point, they're able to get reinforcements in at a little bit more of an expeditious rate in conjunction with some of the terror routes. But they're really on the clock, like super, super hard. We do have a little bit of a theft attempt coming here. Red Cross and Skink's going to be trying to jack this objective, but easily going to get pounded by Rat Ogres. Rat Ogres aren't bad against infantry, especially like squishy ones like, you know, Red Cross and Skink's have 19 melee defense, so... They're not going to be super good at holding. But this objective does flip. And Flag Taco uh, getting a little bit of momentum back here. And looking at the rat army around the battlefield, it looks kind of sparse. 
It doesn't look like the rats have a whole lot, but the damage could have already been done. It could have already been done, as uh, I think that dog person might have enough of a lead, and dog person's a very strong player, that I think he'll know how to prioritize his reinforcements to make sure that the remaining points don't get um, taken by the you know much slower Lizardman army. But objective one would probably be the next goal here. We get a play claw catapult in the back, which is shooting into the chameleon skinks. And the rats do get their council guard up in the point, but council guard will grind all day with Saurus warriors, and it's going to be pretty cost effective here for the Saurus, I would say. But yeah, you got to get multiple objectives. On the side, you get cohorts coming out. Cohorts going to get charged by ogres, which is going to be pretty terrible for them. They try and get their javelins off, but they're going to get punched in the face by these giant rat, ogre, man, bear, pig things. And uh, down they go. In the backfield, we get feral cold ones. Skin cohorts on the way out. Taco going to be swarming. So his game plan basically is going to be trying to swarm this objective with this reinforcement pocket whilst moving everyone up to this objective here. But I don't think he has enough time. I think Dog Person has sealed the deal. And the Skaven, the Under Empire is going to be cackling once more in the deep. And this is Dog Person's revenge for Flying Taco, banning his beloved Beastmen. You know, this is this is, this is is the karma. He tried to win us back with the Quaddle. You know, he, he came close, but the Bray Herd hath been banned here. So the Quaddle did do okay. 1400, not bad at all, ladies and gentlemen. Not bad at all. Side objective being pushed. We got the 1420, though. Not going to happen. It's going to take the Lizards too long. And it looks like Dog Person has clinched the victory in Game 1 against Flying Taco. The Padawan taking a game off the Master. We will see if Flying Taco can come back in the next match. Will he have even an even more vile, terrifying meme prepared? If there was a little bit more time in this game, the Lizardman might be able to come back, but... The rats were able to hold on, sac and that's very Skaven tactics, guys. Sacrificing so many clan rats just to win. That's just, that's like Skaven 101. Just throw the rats into the old, you know, Lizardman grinder here, and uh, yeah, just just see what happens. Lizard's trying to flip this one. That is going to be GG well played. Game one, <clears throat> going to the dog person. Need some water, jeez. Mm. Yeah, if, you know, if you can't play Beastman, you got the rats. Rats are basically Beastman, right? Hey, Templar Knight, thanks for the years of content. Can't wait for many more now. Yeah, many more good years to come, guys. Many more good years to come. As long as you guys are interested in watching, I'll stick around. All right. So, looking at the rat army, uh, it was just swaths of rats. Skrulk did good. Catapult, not bad. The, the weakness of this army, it, it had no infantry killing power. Like, nothing in this army was good against clan rats. Okay, let's just break it down. Not, not good against clan rats. None of this. Maybe the chameleon stalkers are okay. Uh, Colden Riders, terrible against Clan Rats. Salamanders, mediocre. A couple Sar Spears, really inefficient against infantry. Um, Feral Cold One's not going to be cost effective against Clan Rats at all. So basically, Taco's army had one glaring weakness, and that was dealing with swaths of infantry. And of course, you're playing Skaven, so that's what's going to happen. GG. Game one in this best of three series goes to the dog person as we move on to the next match, ladies and gentlemen. And we are on Itza, if I'm not mistaken. It's a me. It's a. Should they should have cast me to do the voice of Mario, in the upcoming movie here. All right, let's see what they do next. Quite excited for this one. No, you know not everyone takes dwellers because like dwellers is is it would have been really good against Council Guard for sure. That would have been a huge momentum shift. But um, typically against Gaven, you're kind of like, is it really worth spending you know 15 plus wins of magic to kill a clan rat? Uh, usually more like cheaper crowd clear could be better. I don't know, maybe like a wind blast, but like life is really good. And yeah, like if, if you can just spam heal your, um, I, I, you know what? I feel like a Dread Saurian would have been really good there because Dread Saurians can clear clan rats all day. It'll just tear out them like instantly and buckle them off points. <laughs> the Professor Pwn says, I do a killer Mario. I bet you do actually. Was that Chris Pratt on the bike just now? <laughs> I could probably do as good of a Mario impersonation as Chris Pratt and that's saying something. Yeah. I can't believe they had Chris Pratt as Mario. That's so... They're, why would... it's Isn't it animated? Like, why would they not just get the voice actor from the Mario game to do it? Like, I don't... I know they're trying to get star power attached to the movie, but... Oh God, man. What a missed opportunity, right? Yeah, it's just absurd. Comet of Cassandora takes too long and clan rats are pretty fast, so they could probably dodge it would be the problem. You know, growing up, when I used to play Mario Kart, like on Nintendo 64 back in the 90s, I was always, uh, I was, I always played the, uh, let's see here. <laughs> Let me pull up the character. No, not that one. Yeah, Wario. <laughs> Wario was always my favorite. I don't know why. Yeah. Holy shit, he was fun. 
Yeah, I was I was a Wario main. Yeah. It's good times. This is the, this is the most Italian impersonation you've heard, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I have a, a lot of my ancestry is Italian, actually, give or take. Yeah, mostly Italian and Irish, if we're going to go back. Obviously, my family's been in the States forever. Yeah, so. But yeah, no, a lot of Italian uh, and uh, Irish ancestry. Turn next to a stream, turn and will need to give their versions of how they'd have done Mario. <laughs> oh, God, dude. They, had, they held rehearsals and literally had the guy whose life was a perfect Mario impression like dead on and turned him down. Really? Oh, what a shame. What a shame. Weatherspoon story. Oh, you want it? Okay. Uh, who would want to listen to lore accurate Mario for an hour and a half? Lore accurate Mario. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I think it'd be fun. There would also be like a nostalgia factor where everybody who's like a Mario fan would like hear the voice of the beloved voice actor, you know, and just, yeah, I don't know. Have you guys seen the SNL skit for Mario Kart movie with Pedro Pascal? It's really good. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah. Yeah, it's fun. Awakening of the Wood? Ah! Awakening of the Wood. Hmm. Yeah, it could be okay. I don't know. It's still not like amazing. But yeah, it would trigger Life Bloom, which could be good for like a very wide army like you had. Oh my God, Weather Spoons. Yeah. You know, like in, in the States... Here in the United States, we have our own version of like, we have like, you know, biker bars, we have dive bars, you know, we have, we have bars where, you know, alcoholics might go like, you know, usually late at night, you know, and, and, you know, do their thing. But going to Weatherspoons in the UK was a very different experience because we were there in the morning, um, like morning, early afternoon, and there's people just lining up at the doors to get in and just get drunk as soon as it, it opens up. It's crazy. Yeah, it was, there was some, there was a motley crew of characters in there as well. Yeah, it was nuts. Fun fact, Mario's voice actor did Alduin from Skyrim. Oh, seriously? Huh, that's wild. Yeah, Staganon could have been a good choice too. Um, but here's the thing. If you bring a Staganon or a Bastilladon and you put, like send it to your opponent's council guard and they're going to have a hard on, you then just drop Dweller's Blow and it just basically hard counters their unit and you just like run away with the game. Like that can be very strong. Yeah, that could be very, very strong. I thought from Australia. No, no, I'm from uh, from the States. Yeah, I live in California. Grew up in the mountains of California, like a little mountain village, actually. Uh, yeah, was, Weatherspoons was something. And oh, we had no idea about it, actually, when we first went there. We had some we had some guy, like... I, I When we went to Weatherspoons, like, one of the... One of the oh, my God, we have a Nurgle pick. Oh, he's going to go Nurgle with no bands. Oh my God. Nurgle, no bands. Nurgle, literally the worst faction in the game with tons of counters. And he goes, no bands. Holy shit. Well, that's why we love Flying Taco. All right. So what I was going to say is one of the first characters we saw at Weatherspoons was this guy. Like his, his, his he had like jeans on and like a plaid polo shirt, probably like mid forties. He, he like, he had like, his jeans were just like tattered and ripped, but not in like the stylish way. And there was like blood and like dirt on the side of his leg. And this was like at like, I don't know, whenever, whenever they opened for drinking and he was just in there and we overheard him talking to one of the other patrons about, about like how he had just gotten out of the, the hospital. And he has, he said he has a hole in his heart. He's like, oh yeah, I got a hole in my heart. And he's just like, just putting them down with like, oh my God. Yeah. He was just one of the Motley crew characters. That we have seen here. <laughs> so you have chosen death. Yeah, man. This is a weird position, right? Okay. Oh, hold on. So dog person went corn, Norska, and warriors of chaos. And then the response was Nurgle. Okay. I missed that. So it's either corn, Norska, or warriors of chaos. Yeah. Is this? Yeah, that was a weather spoons. That was in Horsham. That was in Horsham. Is there a bounty on Nurgle? There should be one. I should make a Nurgle toad bounty. <laughs> I'll go paid by the burrito to, to throw the series. Oh my god. Yeah, it was wild. It's a real price of geezer. Oh my god, yeah. I, I had a great time though in in, uh, in Horsham. I, I, I loved it, man. I really liked the small town feel. You know, it was fun. And people, people out there have like a good respect for the, the hobbying and nerd culture, at least from what I experienced. So that was, that was pretty fun. There was like, 
there was tons of people I talked to who worked at um, Creative Assembly and, you know, in the town who were, you know, kind of knew about Warhammer and stuff. And yeah, it was fun. Yeah, you well, Horsham is where the Creative Assembly headquarters is. And back in the day, we used to do like in-person uh, Everchosen style events there. So they would they would fly they would fly myself and Spartacus out there to do casting. So um, I got to go out there, and it was super fun, super fun. Yeah, we went to some nice pubs. We did, we did. We went to nice pubs. We did. Yeah. All right. So what do we got here? Gonna go Nurgle, no bands. Um, <laughs> let's see what dog person. He'll probably go Demons of Chaos, right? Oh, Warriors of Chaos. Yeah, why would you not just go Warriors of Chaos and bring Archeon? Archeon, like, torches the entire Nurgle roster. He, he like, just can goon all the characters. He's got Burning Head. Oh, he's going to go Corn. Holy shit, he picks Corn. Wow, that actually is winnable for Nurgle. I mean, it's a 50-50 matchup, in my opinion. I think this is a fair matchup for Nurgle. That's a very honorable play by Dog Person to not pick Warriors of Chaos. Yeah, I, I think... So yeah, we got we got dog person versus uh versus taco Nurgle versus corn. It's on, man. The Nurgle bounty should be to just win with them. Uh, there is a Nurgle bounty to win a single faction tournament. So if you win a single faction style tournament with Nurgle, you get a special bounty. But that that's a that's a special one there. Nurgle is much better in land battles, but not. They're still like any faction with range is going to karate chop Nurgle in land battles usually, in my experience. But um in dom in, in land battles, Nurgle can crush melee factions because they don't have to play points they just sit in a mouth breathing blob with kugath and they just like come at me dude and then you typically just win yeah man this is gonna be fun if i play in these tournaments i don't think i could resist not going for a bounty every opportunity yeah yeah you would try and collect them we need to add some more bounties speaking of hold on all right let's let's while we have you guys here let's let's add some new bounties together all right so let me pull the page up where i can add them I love that we have this. It's so much fun. <laughs> Taco's just like minimized his game, just watching us add an Urgle bounty and changing his army as we do it. It's like win a game with four rot flies. Okay, hold on. Pulling it up right now. Green Olgor versus red Olgor deathmatch. <laughs> it could happen. It could happen. All right, so hold on. All right, so I'm adding more bounties right now. So. What about what about winning one with um, uh, we can add the Randy Savage? I think that's a good one. So the Randy Savage would be um, okay with. So I'm adding the Randy Savage right now. Win a game with Ragarth. <laughs> That one wouldn't be too hard though. Dark Elves are pretty good. Win a, win a semifinal match with a full Savage Orc army. All right, so we just added the Randy Savage, which is the Savage Orc one. So you have to win. Um, so we got Randy Savage here. Win a game with four Giant Slayers. That's actually kind of cool. Slayer of Giants. Win. A game with four giant slayers. I'm I'm doing it. We're we're taking taking suggestions now. Must be in starting army. I like the Slayer of Giants one. That's pretty good. Okay, we got two of those. Ooh, that's a good one. Um you fly lord. Okay. Win a game with four rot flies and a herald on a rot fly. Has to be win a semifinal match. Okay. And getting this all set up here. All right, we got some new bounties added. This is good. Quaddle, Quaddle could be a bounty. Hmm. Don't worry, I'm gonna go back to the names. I don't, you can only bring one steam tank for some godforsaken reason. Okay, so an ogre army with only Noblars, is that possible? In domination. Let's see. I can't. Can you bring. If you have unit caps on. Can you have a full Noblar army? So you do Noblars. Noblar trappers. So that would be eight units. Plus iron blasters. Scrap launchers. Saber tusks. Hmm. I don't know if you would have enough units to be able to do that. 
Yeah, I don't know. Skin Wolves are already a very good unit, so there's no point in really giving them a bounty. Okay. The Fly Lord. Okay, we need to have a Toad Bounty too. Right? I think the Toad Bounty needs to come. Okay. I like the idea of a Toad Bounty. So with Toads, we need um, win. I'll show you guys the page once I update it. Matt's had a great bounty, 600 light pound with Kugath and Uncle. <laughs> win a game with Kugath and Uncle for Uncle. All right. The Chungus Toad uh, win. Hold up. All right. So win a semifinal match with, how many Plague Toads can you bring? Max uh, Plague Toads in your starting army. Okay. Must max on both variants. Okay, the Chungus Toad and... <laughs> All right, so we're adding this one. We're almost ready. And by the way, if you guys have more suggestions, send them send them to me. Uh, or leave them in the comments of the stream afterwards because uh, it's hard to keep track of all of them. Okay. Win a semifinal or final match with both uh, Kugath and uh, Uncle for Uncle in your starting army. All right, guys. So let's go to the bounties page and check it out. And see what we got here. Players are loading in, so it's good timing. Okay. So now we got some new bounties. Players are loading in, so we have a moment. So we have the um, Randy Savage, which is winning with a full Savage Orc army. So you'll get Macho Man Randy Savage as your picture. I'll come up with a better name for this. Four Giant Slayers. The Haggard Fly Lord is with four Rotflies and a Herald on a Rotfly. The Chungus Toad is uh, Max Plague Toads. And you have to max as many as you can bring in your starting army. So it'd be like, I, I don't know what the number is. I'll have to double check it before I give out the bounty. And then we added the Kugath one, which is winning with Kugath and Uncle Frunkle. Yeah, that's already hard because it's Nurgle. So, like, winning with Nurgle in a semifinal match is hard enough. So, that's like, yeah. We'll come up with more. Stop hammer time. Oh, that's good. Win with max ha dwarven hammers. That's a great one. Okay, I got to add that real quick. It'll be the last last, last one for now, and then we'll, we'll add more. And obviously, once we get our clutches on the Chaos Stores, we'll be adding more. The Rocky Balboa. Win with either 10 points left to your opponent to win. Oh, that's an interesting one. Stop hammer time. Uh, all right, so win a semifinal match with Max. Okay, so we're gonna add the hammer time with Max hammers in your starting army. All right, cool. So we just added a, a lot more bounties, which is gonna be fun. Uh, I'll be eager to see if anybody makes an attempt at some of those. I think the Macho Man Randy Savage one is doable. Are there enough Savage units? Oh yeah. Because here's with Savage Orcs, you go, you go Wurzag, you go with, um, you go with Savage Orcs, you go with Savage Orc Biggins, Savage Orc Boar Boys, Savage Orc Boar Boy Biggins, Savage Orc Air Boys. Um, we could also say a Rogue Idol is allowed in that army. Like we'll, 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 we'll add some stuff. Yeah, when, one for Goblins and one for Savage Orcs would be really good. Oh my God, what if Taco just like rolls up and completes the Uncle for Uncle bounty right now, just like without even knowing it's happening? Ladies and gentlemen, game two in our second semifinal match, it is going to be Kugath the Plague Father, who's really good. People laugh at Kugath, but he is he is insanely good. He's a raid boss, so there's pretty much no characters in the game that can fight him one-on-one. -on -one. Like, if you put Kugath up against Belakor, he beats Belakor. He's, he is he is really scary. Um, we got Marauders of Nurgle with great weapons. So a lot of, like, armor-piercing chaff infantry units going to be trying to deal with corn armor. And uh, Chosen of Nurgle. Oh, that's so Chad. The Chosen of Nurgle in the tree lines. Hell yeah, dude. Kugath definitely going to have to carry this game. Can you have non No, the everything would have to be Savage with that build, I think. Yeah. So Hellforged Host is going to be really nasty. Uh, those guys will pack a punch. It's going to be a double Exalted Bloodletter, uh, backed up by Minotaurs of Corn with the anti-infantry tools. Honestly, I think Dog Person's army... Oh my god, Dog Person with the meme! He's got a Chaos War Shrine of Corn. Holy shit, look at that thing. That's so cool looking. Oh, that's so cool. Okay, so he's, he's summoning his inner uh, meme build now. But I mean... This is probably, everything else looks pretty good, except the Warshine. Warshines are pretty terrible in my opinion. Um, except the Slanesh one. 
Herald of Corn on the motorcycle. He does have the buffs for his nearby units and does also heal in combat. He's not a bad lord and pretty good against infantry, so. Yeah, man. This is gonna be fun. Yeah, Marauder Horseman's spam McCoy isn't as common as it used to be because Marauder Horseman got nerfed in the last um, patch. They're still good, but they were bugged before where they threw in combat. So you would have Marauder Horseman fighting you in melee, but they'd also be getting their ranged attacks and doing just like double damage base. Not double, but quite a bit more. Wow. No, Kugath is a raid boss. He's really good. Like, I'm a Nurgle main. I play Nurgle, like, whenever I can. I just played in a tournament the other day and got a win with him. And uh, he's he's really, really good. I, it was actually the same matchup. I played Kugath against uh, Korn. Yeah, I think I was playing Hitman Hippo in that one. Can we expect more Grand Alliances? Yeah, I'll get back to those. I will. So the battle is on, and uh, this is going to be interesting. If it becomes a... Oh, look at Kugath with the downtown shot. The Hellforge host getting nailed, losing no models, though, thankfully. In a straight fight, like, if it becomes a blob fight, Kugath will definitely win it. Um, it looks like it's going to be Festering Sue just coming in. And typically, Korn wants to avoid a blob fight. Like, you don't want to brawl like this with, with Nurgle. Um, even if your unit composition is a little bit better, Kugath alone will just, like, squash your army with more engine. So Festering Sue just going to get run over. I love the Korn motorcycles. They're so cool. The Harley Davidson. It sounds like one, too. Yeah, I've, uh, I used to ride a motorcycle. I had a couple friends who rode Harleys, too, and they're very, they're very, they're very high-maintenance bikes. I would imagine this is as well. So Festering Suges are in combat. Kugath's going to be coming in, and this is not what Korn wants to be doing. Nurgle's going to get the side objectives for free, or at least one of them. And here we do see Marauders. I don't know how they'll actually fare against Fleshhounds. I think the Marauders would win just with the numbers. Be a bit of a close fight, though. Yeah, this is going to favor Flying Taco a thousand percent. I have tried this before to try and outgrind Nurgle with pure DPS using like Hellforged Host and a War Shrine. It was one of the first meme builds I ended up doing back in the day. No, the Empire is my main faction. You can main multiple factions. And now the Barons of the Bogger are coming in. So this is going to just be an absolute squash. Basically playing into Nurgle's dread clutches here, as the Barons of the Bog are uh, going to be draining down. So the Miasma of Rot heals the vigor of nearby allies, and the Wasting Sickness basically nerfs the stats of all these units. So these Bloodletters are sitting in only 38 melee attack, and uh, yeah, this is not looking good for Korn. I know the value is even, but that is not like the reality here. Oh my god, we got Plague Toads coming out. Check it out. The Toads are on the way, ladies and gentlemen. Although Flesh Hounds do dominate Toads pretty hard. So, I mean, there still could be a way that Korn could win just by having, like, decisive fights on the flanks. But um, you're going to be losing several Exalted Bloodletter units. What you would want to do is split your army into two sides. So if you're Korn, you go out this way, you go out this way. And if Kugath goes this way, you rotate to the middle. Like, wherever Kugath goes, you just stay away from Homeboy. Because, like, blobbing with Nurgle here is going to be incredibly tough. Incredibly tough. But even on the side, the Marauders do get broken down. Baron to the Bog doing their thing. Festering Stooge is bumping and grinding. And you know what? I'm actually pretty impressed how Dog Person's army is like staying the course here. But I would imagine they'll want to withdraw from combat soon. Up in the high ground, Nurgle trying to defend. It looks like some of the uh, Doggos were taken out. Chaos Fury summoned in to deal with Marauder Horsemen. Marauder Horsemen of a uh, corner are actually quite good against Furies. It, they can turn and fight them. They have 44 uh, weapon or melee attack with a very good bonus for its infantry as well. So they can take down those type of units. But it looks like Big Daddy Nurgle is going to be flipping that side objective as the Marauders try and chase down the Flesh Hounds on both sides. But we do see the really terrible Chaos War Shrine is here. And uh, what kind of a buff is it giving off right now? So taking a look at its buff, let's see. So, okay, it's giving 15% base weapon damage to all nearby units. But that's pretty much being countered by the Wasting Sickness. Because the Barons of the Bog are going to be debuffing your stats so heavily. And now I think Dog Person has realized... That he doesn't want to be, he doesn't want any of this. He's, he's going to peace out and use his mobility, which uh, is definitely going to be the stronger play. War Shrine going to get finished off, I would imagine. Looking at the value, Flying Taco is up in value by 2,000, which is a really, really bad sign for your boy Korn. Uh, anytime Nurgle can get up in value against you, you are probably going to lose the game. Because Nurgle has a ton of healing, like a ton of healing uh, and sustain via Festering Stooges, Fecundity, their army ability, as well as, uh, you know, Fleshy Abundance. And units that passively regenerate. So, yeah, it's not going to be good. Dude, Kugath, is, he's ghost riding the whip right here, dude. Look at him just rolling. Trying to trying to take down this Chaos War Shrine, which is now broken. And, uh, yeah, I don't see Korn getting back in this game. Unless there's some sort of a big misplay. I know I said that earlier and I was wrong about the dreaded houseplant. But um, I've played this matchup many times with Nurgle. And uh, I've seen this situation before. It ain't my first rodeo. So this objective is going to flip. But uh, Nurgle, what Nurgle wants to do now is reinforce its top objective. I would probably send the Baron to the Bog up there in tandem with like one really good quality infantry like a chosen and just sit up there and then just sit on the middle and be like all right man i'm just gonna win on two objectives nurgle can throw the game if they try and like overextend and chase and you know hunt things down all across the field but um and in this case 
I don't think uh, I don't think it's gonna work out. Yeah, the trying to fight Festus and Barons of the Bog in a blob fight is basically an auto loss. Yeah, Sword of Corn could be good. I think there are some chosen, um, chosen, chosen of Nurgle, chosen of Nurgle. They haven't taken much damage, but Corn is gonna start trying to play the side objectives, and Corn still could get back in this game because Nurgle is awful at playing mobility. So if he doesn't allocate his resources correctly to the side points, then Flying Taco probably will lose this game potentially. You gotta. With Nurgle, the, the hardest part about playing Nurgle is like the decision making of where you're going to allocate units and what objectives and how many of each thing you're going to send where. Because they're not like, you can't react very quickly, so you have to have good foresight and good planning. Very meticulous. Forsaken on the way in. Forsaken, not a bad choice. They're fast, they're furious by Nurgle standards, and they do have a good cap weight, so they can get up and they can certainly fight some of these flesh hounds and different tools like that with their armor. Granted, the Marauder Horseman might be a bit of a problem. Now it looks like the Nurgle Horseman going to be moving up to the high ground. And yeah, Kugath just sitting and throwing his bombardments, which is great. Looks like he's trying to pick off the Minotaurs, which isn't a bad choice. Although it's a little bit better against infantry, probably using it against the Bloodletters would be slightly stronger. Exalted Bloodletters, though, being held to only 380 value in a big pit fight with tons of buffs, right? Just a true testament to how good Nurgle is in melee. So here they come. Plague Toads, Marauders, and Hounds, and the Barons of the Bog, I think, are on their way up too. Because Kug nobody's going to get this from Kugath. You just sit here with the Festering Sieges and you just cackle all the way to the bank. This one's going to be held by Big Daddy Nurgle. And we do see the Chaos Warhounds uh, able to jump on top of the Flesh Hounds. Obviously, they'll lose that fight pretty heavily. But basically, just buying time, applying poison. And uh, the Toads are here. Who let the Toads out? Well, apparently Flying Taco did. Is the Forsaken have finally made it? Additional summons coming in. Dog Person, what do we see? Uh, we see the two Minotaurs sitting on the side objective, kind of camping that. We see some Marauder Horsemen coming out. A very good choice. It gives you good utility. They can also help deal with Minotaurs. They can deal with elite infantry. What is not to love, ladies and gentlemen? Is Marauder Horse and a Corn going to be pulling back? Forsaken on the way across, chasing him off. This objective uh, is going to be flipped here by Nurgle in just a second. Good play by Dog Person, though. What he's doing, if you guys are a little bit newer to the game, is he's parking his units on the edge of the objective to maintain capture weight and deny your opponent. So if you've ever played uh, Age of Empires 4, when you have multiple units from each army on the objective, it keeps you know them from capturing it. And the same thing in Company of Heroes. Uh, you could obviously tell Domination was very inspired by those kind of relic style um, capture points. And uh, yeah, that's the same case here. Although it doesn't fully deny it. Like in Age of Empires and Company of Heroes, if you have one thing and they have 10, you're denying them until your unit is gone. Whereas in this game, it's a capture weight contest. So basically each unit has its own respective capture weight based on its health and unit type. And that determines that. So. Chaos Furies over here, battling it out, but this is going to be a really, really tough comeback. Look at this, Corn, Corn doing a big, big movement here, just trying to loop everybody back in around. But now what you do if you're Nurgle is you probably just summon some Nurglings, like two Nurglings, and just go grab that. That's that's probably what I would wager. And he's going to try and hold this, but there is an opportunity for Corn to get a little bit of an isolation here. We see these uh, Chaos Furies push back. Barons of the Bog waiting to cackle here in the Sweet Night, and now it looks like uh, Kugath Chungus Father. He's going to be heading up to the objective. He takes his time. He's a slow, ponderous dude, but, you know, he throws his bombardments. He's already got 2,400 value. So, yeah, he is uh, he is a, a beast for sure. Baron to the Bog going to be debuffing the stats. These Minotaurs go down to 79 weapon strength. The Wasting Sickness is so good. It's such a good ability. It lowers their mass, so it makes them harder for them to get away also. And just weapon damage by 25% is super solid. So, not bad at all. Minotaurs here being dragged down. Forsaken do really good damage. And uh, they don't have a great armor piercing, but they still have 60 plus weapon strength. So Forsaken, a great, a great, I actually really like Nurgle Forsaken. They're a good combination of like damage output and tankiness. Um, granted, most Forsaken have melee defense like in the sub 20s, but theirs is 25 with armor, which isn't terrible considering their damage output. But this objective, kind of close to flipping. Nurgle not going to make a play for the low ground. It looks like uh, Dog Person preemptively expecting a back cap here. So this is a good play by Dog Person. He's got his Chaos War Shine, and he's just going to be chilling here with some Halberd Boys. So they're going to make sure that objective doesn't get stolen. And Nurgle's just going to continue on playing its two points here. And I, I think they got this one in the bag. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised after this failed attempt on the objective to see Dog Person tap out. It's hard to say. We do see 10.1 to 7.4 here. I just think uh, I think he's too far behind. It looks like Flying Tacos, Haggard, Nurgle forces have gotten it. Who would have thought we would get a Nurgle W in today's tournament? This is like... This is the sweatiest possible tournament we can have. Usually, you know, there's there's a cash prize. It's it's uh, for a seasonal title. And we're still getting Nurgle mirror matches and we're getting to see some quaddles and uh, a lot of fun stuff for sure. Marauder Horseman here, getting them throwing axes, bombarding into these bad boys. They're currently wavering 10 leadership. Of course, throwing axes is pretty good against uh, bigger targets. And Kugath just absolutely dominating. Wherever the Chungus father goes with his little Baron to the Bog, you know, Havoc, uh, Havoc follows, or I wouldn't say Havoc, Entropy. Entropy would be the correct way to describe Nurgle's uh, advances. 
Here, Exalted Bloodletters just getting Mortis Engine down, being annihilated by Barons of the Bog. You know, the, the Pox Riders of Nurgle are, I like them more than the Toads. They're actually really good against Demonic Infantry because they do magic damage and, and have anti-infantry. So they surpass the 20% physical resist of a lot of these units. Looking in the middle here, we do see uh, old Nurgle. I really like this Nurgle color scheme. I think it's really, really cool. Yeah. I think the aesthetic of Nurgle units is some of the coolest in the game. Like Korn as well, but Nur nothing beats Nurgle. I mean, look how rad these guys are. I mean, that's, I guess that's why I play Death Guard and Tabletop. But Minotaurs are broken, and it looks like the Chaos Warshine and the Halberds going to be making a collapse on the middle. And the top objective firmly, firmly owned by Big Thick Nurgle. As the Forsaken going to be clamping down on that point with some Chaos Warrior great weapons. Chaos Warrior great weapons are actually quite good here. And... Uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is, I would say this matchup is even. I, I think Korn and Nurgle are a 50-50 matchup. And there's not very many of those for Nurgle. Nurgle actually has like a 30% win rate in tournaments. But um, one of the matchups in which they are a 50-50 and are very close in is against Korn. But it depends on the map. If we're on a bigger map and Nurgle and Korn plays mobility, I think Nurgle has very poor chances. But if it's a smaller map like Itza, like this, it's certainly a more viable situation here. So here they come. Nurgling's on the way. Which is time. Chaos Warriors of Nurgle have arrived. Marauders of Nurgle are also here. Marauder Horsemen going to be parking behind these bad boys. And, you know, shout out to Zog Person, man. He's a tenacious fighter. Still going strong in the fourth quarter. But alas, I don't think there's going to be any chances. It's just going to be a slow grind, a slow, miserable death at the hands of uh, the Plague God here. As he's got a lot of good quality units here. Chaos Warrior Great Opens actually will hurt this uh, this Warshine character. Granted, the Warshine character does passively heal in combat, which is quite nice. Marauder Horseman, good positioning, getting throwing axe fire into the armor of the uh, the motorcycle. Motorcycle does have 110 armor, so you certainly need some armor piercing to deal with it. But it looks like a couple of the Flesh Doggos do get a good rear charge onto the Marauder Horseman. They were uh, perhaps pursuing something off the battlefield, and more and more Toads are on the way up. So Plague Toads giving you the mass. They can, of course, fight Flesh Hounds to some extent. They do have uh, they do have magic damage, again, like all the Demon units, so they're good against other Demon units. And the Marauders here are going to get broken. So yeah, Korn's still fighting, still scrapping. This objective, though, firmly in the hands of Nurgle as they get more Nurglings up here. And the Hellforged Toast has been summoned once more. But Kugath is going to roll up this heel. And he's going to be like, you know, how many times must I teach you this lesson, Korn? He's rolling. And everywhere he goes, entropy follows. And the back, Forsaken coming in. More Nurglings. They so just got to maintain the capture weight. They have a pretty decent little lead. Uh, looks like the back objective is the Halberds keep thinking like they want to come in here. But, like, these Halberds, do you know how badly they're going to get smashed by the most Chad Chosen in the game? These these Chosen of Nurgle. These guys will absolutely dominate these Chaos Warriors. It will be just a straight-up bully beatdown right there. So you don't want any of that, that's for sure. Now, this objective in a little bit of danger. It looks like Korn's Hellforged Toast getting in. And is Dog Person going to pull a Houseplant? And perhaps waddle his way back into the game here. And bark his way back into the game. We will see. The objective pretty close to flipping. But when Kugath gets there, that's when the truest test is yet to come. Well, is going to come, not yet to come. So Kugath getting Fecundity down. It's going to be healing the Nurgle army. And the objective is immediately flip back to Nurgle as soon as the big Plague Father arrives. Chaos Warrior Great Opens doing good work. And the Hellforged Toast is going to be getting hit with a Mortis Engine effect. If you look in the tooltip up in the top right, this is where you would see such effects. Right now they're out of range, but they were getting nailed by that. Now Halberd's kind of looking like they want to fight here. Even with the Warshrine buffing them, they would still lose horribly. Um, Halberds typically have slower attack rates than Great... I mean, it's not that much slower, but the Great Weapons just have such good armor-piercing values. And um, yeah, they would just crush through those bad boys 100%. Somebody in chat saying, let's go XMT. Well, they're both XMT, so it's a tough one. It's a civil war. Basically, we had two RTK players playing the other side of the bracket. Now we have two XMT players dueling it out. See who's going to be going to the Grand Finals. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a 1-1 series. Nurgle with the Steel Chair. Now, I think Dog Person took the head-on fight. I really liked it. He tried something new. He experimented. He brought the War Shrine. Maybe thought he could out GPS Nurgle, but with Kugath there, it's um I've tried many times. It's it's not it's not it doesn't play out like that. It does not play out like that, ladies and gentlemen. All right. So let's get this. Checking here. All right, perfect. And let me go ahead and get the map. So where is the map for the next one? It is going to be. Uh, one second. All right. So the next map here is going to be the bottom side of the bracket. It's going to be the Proving Grounds. No, not Proving Grounds. It's the Halls of Karag Doom. Very cool map from the Total Tavern map pack. Hopefully CA will add these. CA, if you're listening, please, please help us. We're too weak. You know, we're too weak. Dog person says in chat, just to be clear, that build was not designed to win. Okay, he was trying trying something fun, memeing about a little bit. You know, he was. I think he was throwing Taco a bone for the first game. 
He was like, "You brought a quaddle. I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw you a war shrine. Let's, let's call it even. Let's go from there." All right, guys. So, well, the, so here's the thing, Bob. The players, uh, I, I thought about doing a pre-ban system to prevent target banning, but um, in this tournament, the players knew who they were going to be playing beforehand in the first couple rounds, so it wouldn't have stopped target banning. They would have just target banned their first round opponent to increase their likelihood, and then it would have led to some weird picks and bans. But I'm going to be exploring new pick and ban formats for future um, seasons and future big tournaments and things like that. So, all right, guys, I'm going to go get some water real quick. I will be right back and uh, get ready for some more uh, sweaty action here in game three. All right, guys, I'm back. Let's see what their picks and bans are going to be for the next match. I want to thank you guys all for joining today. <laughs> see, I got hills and don't care. All right. So we haven't seen it yet. Aces. All righty. Making sure there's no issues or anything. And let us see here. Yep. Just doing picks and bans. Halls of Cataract Doom is a really cool one. If you guys don't haven't read the God Trek and Felix books, it's a, it's a recreation of... Um, of one of the scenes from that where the 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 dwarves Gotrek and Felix go on an expedition to a lost dwarven keep the halls of Karak Doom. It's very cool. It's basically a rip off of Lord of the Rings. Gotrek and Felix and uh, this expedition of dwarves go to the uh, the deeps of Karak Doom and they uh they find something ancient and evil in the depths. It's very fun. It's very very fun. Yeah, Philip, at some point sure. Depends on the game. Okay, so let's see what the picks and bans are going to be. It looks like they're coming right now. This is the rubber match. The winner goes on to the grand finals. I think we're going to get Ogre Kingdoms here, maybe. Yeah, because he can't ban Ogre Kingdoms again. I don't think. I'm pretty sure Dog Person banned them earlier. I'm not sure. Um, did he? Let's see if he banned them. Yeah, he did ban Ogre Kingdoms before, so. So he goes Tomb Kings, Norska, and Ogre Kingdoms. And he's banning, still waiting on the ban from Flying Taco. We'll see you in a second. And again, for anybody just joining today, <clears throat> here's the prizes and all that sort of good stuff. First place, $300. Second place, $150. Third place, $50. Bucks. And a little bit of a fun uh, secondary prize as well, which we'll be getting into eventually. Let's see here. One sec. Okay, cool. For a second, I thought the stream was lagging. I was like, oh, God. Of course, they would wait until we get into the rubber match to tank the internet. I hope we get to see Ogres. I mean, there's no way he can stop Ogres, actually. Um, he bans Dark Elves. Okay. So he picked Tomb Kings, Norska, and Ogre Kingdoms, and he banned Dark Elves. So this should be interesting. Now, what is Dog Person? Dog Person's uh, Beastmen are not available. Tacos, his Ogres are there, so Dog Person's probably going to pick something he feels comfortable with against Ogre Kingdoms. Norska is very strong. Norska is a somewhat meta faction. Tomb Kings have kind of fallen from grace a little bit. They're very much a mid-tier faction now. They're not overpowered, I don't think. See, in, in CA's defense, they actually did a pretty good job buffing the um, or nerfing the Tomb Kings. They did a good job with it. They're still viable, but not like broken. Yeah, that was that was nice. I'm happy about that. Tomb Kings were so oppressive before. Oh my god, they were awful. Now they just need to do the same thing to Slanesh. <laughs> Fourth place notable mention. Yes, exactly, Patrick. <laughs> the fourth place player gets an Applebee's gift card. That would be pretty funny. You know what? Uh, hold up. Do we... Okay, guys. I'm putting a poll up. You guys can, you guys can decide right now if this is going to happen. Because I will... If you guys decide that you want it to happen, I will, I will, make, I will buy the gift card and I will, I will send it. I'll, I'll give the receipts, too, in the community section. <laughs> Even if they're in Europe, they're getting an Applebee's gift card. Well, I wonder who votes no on that. It will be ten, it's a, it's going to be a $10 gift card. Can, let me see if I can still get this. $10. Applebee's 
Gift card. <laughs> Probably the first person ever to Google. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Okay, I can get it on Amazon and I can have it shipped to them. All right, guys, it's been decided. Whoever gets fourth place today, here, let's make it extra haggard. We, you know, I try and have a, a good front facing, you know, I'm trying to do graphics, but we always have to go back to just things looking terrible. Hold on a sec. Uh, add a uh, text. <laughs> Hold on, guys. <laughs> All right, perfect. There we go. Oh my God, it's so long. Let's see here. Sorry guys, I'm just trying to shrink it down. There they go, okay. So fourth is gonna get the dreaded Applebee's gift card. So that's gonna be in the rubber match. It'll be 10 bucks too. <laughs> oh God, I love it. So it begins. The poll was over so fast, it was so one-sided. Yeah, it was so over. Are all the finalists American? Uh, let's see. So I, let me check. I don't know where, I think they are actually. Yeah, dog person is central, tacos east coast, houseplant is west coast, I think. And I think, yeah, I, I actually think it, it could be relevant because each of the uh, each of the players, they're all American, so it would be relevant to them. Fourth place is basically first place now, I know. Would you rather get $300 or an Applebee's gift card? It's perfect. Badger Knight, do you think you could pin one, uh, you could pin one, let's see, in this scenario he has no armor? No, definitely not. Badger Knight, no. Dwarves are super strong in Warmer Fantasy. They would kick. They would probably be able to out wrestle any human, even a super. Well, not any, but you know, most. Applebee's is on me today, chaps. There you go, Josh coming in with the Applebee's donation. Hell yeah, dude! If I knew it was on the, you would have joined the tournaments if you knew that was the prize, huh? In Netherlands, we just have them all over, all of Amsterdam. Oh, okay, you have them there. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> People are going to be throwing now. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, they could still, if they get third place, they still win 50 bucks and they could go to, um, they could go, go to Applebee's and truly treat themselves, you know, take their, take their partners out on a nice date. Uh, Norska versus Ogre Kingdoms, guys. Oh, hell yeah. Norska versus Ogre Kingdoms. It is on. Yeah, US has been doing, US has been doing, the US players have been doing pretty good. We can actually see where most of the players are from. Um... Looking at the top 16. In, in Warhammer 2, it was there was definitely some very strong American players, but it was it was a little bit... Yeah, so Kark, Kark is yeah, Korean. Houseplant is American. Platypus is American. Dogperson's American. Subutai is American. Housecat is also. Hadrius is American. Sandwich, Tim, all American. Uh, Serkia is German. Uh, True Bretonian is Korean. Draken's American. Um, F-Pod is American. Uh, Roflin Russian and all record Russian as well. Yeah. So there's, there's, there's a handful, but yeah, it's definitely been art. Most of the RTK guys are from the States and they, they train very hard. They train very, very hard. Yeah. All right. All right. It's not the same if you have to buy it. That's true. It's true. Cause then like, if you get the Applebee's gift card, it's kind of like, you just, you know, it's all you can spend it on, right? You can't spend it on anything else. So it's kind of like, it forces you to have that haggard experience. Norska does have some good tools. Marauder um, champions are going to be pretty nasty here, backed by javelins. I feel like that's a really good combo. And skin wolves are also like super good against the uh, against the ogre kingdoms. <laughs> yeah, so it should be fun, man. Doom diver slayers. Oh, that'd be an interesting one, right? Like slayers just flying through the skies. Bretonia is really good, I think, in the hands of specialists. So they're not an easy faction to play, but. Um, yeah, they're kind of like that, and like they're still very niche in both land battle and dawn, from what I've seen. In land battles, I've heard I've heard the elves, obviously, the dark elves are doing pretty good in land battles these days. Yeah, pretty fun stuff. It is time. Let us get this party started. It is Norska with four armored condom wolves. So that's pretty good because most ogre bull units do not have a ton of armor piercing. So having the armored skin wolves makes them even more resilient. We do also have a match core. A metal caster with final transmutation, I'm guessing. Maybe, maybe Plague of Rust or Searing Doom to clear Noblars. But yeah, probably final transmutation. Wolfric with Seafang. And uh, yeah, he could be on the Mammoth as well. We'll have to find out. 
For the taco, he's got a Slaughter Master and a Fire Belly. So he probably has Troll Guts just for healing his giant and his big uh, big cavalry. Fire Belly for Burning Head to clear out Norsk and Infantry. A single Lead Belchers to kill Marauder Champions. And it is going to be a bunch of uh, Novel Art Trappers. Does the Faint Chantress have more dissension on tabletop? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I am not sure about that. All right, guys. The battle is soon to be on. This is the Halls of Karag Doom. Once again, amazing maps. Our community map makers have done such a good job. Like, can you guys imagine how stagnant, stagnant and haggard multiplayer would be if, in domination at least, land battle has more more maps just because of the base campaign and stuff. But like domination, if we just had Black Ark and Itza to play on over and over, it would just it, that would be so awful. We would have to pretend like Arnheim and like Crossing of the Sea of Claws are good maps. You'd be like, all right, these maps are. These maps are all right, right, guys? Like, Arnheim is so awful. It, like, one side has a huge forest to hide in, and the other guy is just an open field and, like, a shooting gallery. It's so imbalanced. Yeah, this map's really cool, though. Got the dwarven statues. There's, like, an epic ruin here. Yeah, it's pretty fun. Pretty fun. So the hall, uh, Cataract Doom is a, a dwarven hold that uh, essentially f was overtaken of the Chaos Waste. So the Chaos Wastes in the northern Warhammer fantasy world basically have been expanding southward as the power of chaos grows. So um, many dwarven holds from the ages of long lost uh, basically were overtaken by chaos. And there were dwarves who tried to stay there and fight, you know, and, and, and hold the keeps against the hordes of chaos, but inevitably they were usually overwhelmed because they had no reinforcements. You know, very much like the Tome of Balin in Lord of the Rings. And um, yeah, some of them some of them obviously became chaos dwarves as well, like in these lost holds. That's, that's like part of that in, in tandem with some other fun lore. But yeah, it's, it's great. Pedro, thank you. Meat's back on the menu, boys. It is. Thank you so much for the donation, my friend. And let's get this party started. So, got Marauder Spearmen, backed up by these Skin Wolves. I explained why the Skin Wolves are good. The armor here is awesome. Noblar Trappers don't have good armor piercing. Ogre Bulls, not the best armor piercing. Therefore, having the armor on something that's super solid against Ogres is just really smart. The Searing Doom and Plague of Rust, no final transmutation. Just going to be using Searing Doom uh, to synergize with the Condom Wolves because they don't have good AP. So if they have to fight like an Armored Ogre unit, like a Crusher or something, uh, you can use the Plague of Rust to lower them down and get the uh, the big old Werewolf Claws on those bad boys. So, And that looks to be it. Feral Manticore is, uh, is there to party and cause some terror. Now, for the Ogre Kingdom, the Master of the Ogres. I like that both players are bringing like... In game three, the deciding game to see who goes to the grand finals, they both had their meme game against each other. And now it's time for um, it's time for them to bring their like their mate, like some of their main factions and just go at it. This is great. Now giants aren't bad. I think they're pretty underrated, especially with ogres, because troll guts is a massive heal. So giants, uh, for their price point, can fight enemy monsters super well. Like they dominate mammoths. And uh, yeah, can receive the healing. We got the two fire bellies, the two sumo wrestlers running. We got Burning Head and we got Troll Guts. And they're not a bad goon squad either. Firebellies and, and Slaughter Masters are actually really good in combat. So, Noblars, Noblar Trappers. We have the Flying Taco Special, which is going to be the Sky Striders. And somebody in chat asking, uh, why do I call them Condom Wolves? Because I feel if you were at a, a gas station in the 1980s on Route, on, uh, you know, Route, uh, what is it, 76 or whatever. You know, like some American old school highway and you stopped. And I feel like the really cheap, haggard condoms they would be selling there would be called skin wolves and they would have like a roaring wolf and like an eagle on the side of them or something yeah i just it's just this image that just popped into my head and it's just been there ever since so all right skin wolves are moving up mance court as well in the backfield we do have ogre bulls on the way in the slaughter master of the great maw and the fire belly coming to uh try and deal with wolfric as well as the metal caster here and it is time ladies and gentlemen the ogres are there the Sky Striders with their big old crushing hammers are going to be looking to concave in. They can certainly dunk on Wolfric and, and or any of these characters. Like, Sky Striders are absolute monsters. You know, there's 12 of these bad boys, and basically three of them hit as hard as a Legendary Lord if you add their stats together. It's pretty close. Like, it's going to be over 400 weapon swings for just three of them. So, if you get fully encircled by Sky Striders, uh, yeah. <laughs> Route 69, yeah. Something like that. I, I The number in my head just got all mixed up. Yeah. You, you guys got it. <laughs> Route 66, yeah. All right, guys. So, ogres are coming in. The giant just chilling on this point. Really, it's just Noblars and the giant who are going to be holding down Objective 3. It seems as if the epicenter of fighting is going to be taking place on Objective 2. The metal caster is a very interesting choice. The Plague of Rust isn't bad. Um, you can lower the armor of Sky Striders down to 60 with an overcasted Plague of Rust, and then Skin Wolves can actually put up relatively, uh, you know, decent damage against them, which isn't bad. 
Now, who's going to get this point, though? It's going to be pretty big. Halls of Karak Doom has objective one and two. They're in a straight lane here. And objective three, of course, is kind of the contested neutral one. This is the home objective for the Ogre, so they should have a bit of an advantage here. We do Ogre Bulls on the way in. And what are the Lead Belchers going to be shooting? Are they going to go after the Skin Wolves here? Lead Belchers trying to push those guys back, but uh, haven't been able to find any uh, anywhere to shoot yet. Norska does get the objective, so the uh, Skin Wolves able to jump there. A couple Noblars are trying to grab it, but Flying Taco. Oh, the dreaded double... The, 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 the double Mornfang Cavalry. These guys are crushers. They're a little bit more elite. Mornfang Cavalry are, are certainly a weaker variant, but this is going to be pushing back the Norsk army. And I think this objective is going to be flipping to the Ogre Kingdoms here in just a second. Yeah, it looks like it is. So we do see the uh, Skin Wolves are going to be peeling out here as the uh, other Skin Wolves preparing a little bit of a surround. But these anti-large cavalry are going to be very, very nasty. They are beasts. And Plague of Rust can only be on one unit at a time, and oftentimes those units can simply retreat when the Plague of Rust is active. So a couple Ogres going to be chilling here. Now the Giant's coming across to you know, bolster this fight. A couple of the Ogre Bulls do get caught by the Werewolves, but it looks like they're both going to get away with no casualties as the Mornfang Cavalry circle back and prepare to do battle on Objective 3, which is now starting to flip for the Ogre Kingdoms. On the far side, Shaman Sorcerer Metal looks like a full surround, and this is really risky. Dog person's going super deep to try and get around the Mornfang Cab and get some isolations, but what that means is Saber Tusks are probably going to come in like here, uh, while the Ogre Cav come and sandwich you from the top, and then you're really going to be paying the Troll Toll. So the Giants here, Mornfang Cavalry in reserves. We do just get basic Ogre Bulls being called out, and yeah, these Condom Bulls are going to get smashed. Oh my god. Yeah, these, these Mornfang Cav, a super hard counter. I mean, they're heavily armored. Skin Wolves lack a lot of armor piercing, and that's going to be a bully beatdown right here. So this backfield fight could be a little bit of a disaster. Sky Strider's pulling back now, letting the Ogre Bulls absorb the charge. The Giant's coming in. We do have the Slaughter Master nearby, getting ready to cast the Troll Guts, most likely, on the Mornfang Cav. Or maybe on top of these guys. Plague of Rust is active, so we do get the Plague of Rust. I do like this play as well from Dog Person. Using the Feral Manticore to go after the Slaughter Master is a very, very strong play. Very strong play. In the backside, Troll Guts is going to be going down on the Mornfang Cavalry, which is going to be healing them up. It is a fat, thick heal. It is literally 40 seconds of healing at .80. It's, it's crazy good. Searing Doom going down on Noblar Trappers. Noblar is able to hold on to this objective. The back objective here being defended by some Skin Wolves and uh, just some basic Marauder Chaff units. But overall, this is really the epicenter of combat. And it seems as if we do have a Gooning attempt here. So the Slaughter Master and the Firebelly are fighting shoulder to shoulder, trying to uh, you know fend off Wolfric as well as its Manticore. And it looks like they're going to have success. And obviously the home field advantage of the Ogres being able to summon in Saber Tusks and uh, those units in their backfield is going to be pretty massive. And uh, where did Wolfric go? Did he just die? No, he didn't. Okay, for a second, he just like sl slipped out of my, my vision there. But the Manticore is pushed back. Flying Taco is pulling a bit of a value lead. The Mornfang Cavalry, the Sky Striders are being swarmed a little bit. That Plague of Rust was a nice play. It allowed the Skin Wolves to actually cut through them. But for the most part, these big Ogre Cavalry are uh, probably going to be able to stay pretty well in sustained combat, assuming they get like another Troll Guts or another heal here in a moment. The Giant is also in saturated combat. The other Mornfang Cavalry are in really, really good shape as well. They still have 12 of 12 models, and the Sky Striders have pulled back, and uh, yeah, trying to kill Flying Taco Sky Striders is never easy. A little bit of housekeeping being done as Noblars are being unsummoned and sent back to the old pasture there. This objective could perhaps be taken by Nors or by the Ogres here in a minute. Norska does own it. They have some Iceborne Marauders and some Marauder Spearmen coming up, which is going to be a very, very good choice. And this big, ugly backfield fight does continue to rage on here as I think Flying Taco continues to pull a little bit of an edge here. The Armored Skin Wolves are being swarmed by Saber Tusks as well as the Anti-Large Cavalry. The Giant's going to be putting a bully beat down on whatever it can encounter here, and uh, I do think the Ogres will win this one. But what are the reinforcements of Norska going to do? And it kind of looks like Norska is taking a bit of a fight here. They actually sent some Armored Skin Wolves to objective number three, which I think is a bit of a mistake. Noblar Trappers with their Haggard Ninja Stars. Uh, though they have some armor, it's still going to get through. It's, it's just a volume of fire thing. And Skin Wolves are really, really bad at clearing out uh, infantry. Like, really terrible. They just simply don't get the job done. Yeah, they're, they're designed against large targets. We do see the Skin Wolves being pushed back. Mornfang Cavalry here getting slapped with another Plague of Rust, which has proven to be pretty good. And look at that! Dog Person gets a nice goon. He actually gets the Slaughter Master with the Hunter of Champions and Wolfric and the Manticore, the second Manticore that was summoned in, are able to take the Slaughter Master down to about 10%. That is a big, big win. If they could actually kill the Slaughter Master before it can get unsummoned or something, that would be uh, that would be huge because it would be a huge leadership penalty on the Ogre Army. But the Ogre is trying to push back. We do see some Spears coming in. Could we see the comeback of Dog Person as a nice Searing Doom goes down right there and uh, is able to tag? Are there any Noblars in there? Yeah, it didn't do that much. Oh, these are Iron Guts. That's why it didn't do much. They have the, the big armor. So we do get some big Iron Boys in there. Iron Guts are pretty good against Marauder Infantry. Marauder Infantry typically don't have good armor piercing unless you use the great weapons, which you wouldn't probably see in this matchup. 
So bringing in Iron Guts as like a tech piece, I think is very, very strong. The subjective owned by Norska. Norska does have a sizable point lead. They've had the cap advantage here for quite some time. But um, I have this, this feeling uh, as if the Ogres are going to kind of break this fight. They're going to win it eventually. And then there's just going to be a huge pushback because uh, Ogres are fast. And once they get an advantage on you and they're ready to feast, it really, um, it really, really starts to go, you know, south very, very fast. Ogres have good capture weight too, so they can move up in the points. So we got more Iron Guts coming in. Dude, I love the usage of Iron Guts. It's so fun. So Iron Guts are here. Those bad boys are going to be moving up and heading to the objective. So there they are, as we see the uh, objective flipping to the Ogres. Skin Wolves trying desperately to fight, but the healing on the Sky Striders and the Giant is just too much. It's just too much, as those Skin Wolves are just being buckled back. And I think the dreaded Flying Taco is probably going to be going to the Grand Finals. It looks like he is potentially going to be taking the dub here. Sky Striders, man. I, I love seeing the Mornfang Cavalry do work. And all the Norse skin, skin Wolves are going to be pushed back into the Shadow Realm. Cass, thank you! 250! Damn, dude! That's so generous! To our fearless leader, thanks for setting up an awesome casting. Hey, Roger! Well, thank you. So, he, uh, the, the individual who just donated uh, put up the prize for today's tournament, man. So, shout out to you. Thank you so much for supporting all of us. And uh, thank you so much, brother. Thank you. Thank you for putting up the prize for today. That It makes a world of difference, bro. Really appreciate that. Back objective is taken in the honor of the Chungus Kingdoms. As the giant continues to crush, Norska going to be trying to re-rally its forces. Norska does have healing as well. You have to remember they do have the Skin Wolves and they do have a points lead. So Norska has a little bit of time to consolidate its forces before they go in. And it looks like the Manticore is going to be going for a kill on the Ogre Lord. So the Slaughter Master being dove by the Manticore here. Roger, thank you again so much. Um, terrified? Is he going to get the heal off? It looks like he's casting the heal on the Sky Striders. This is the most selfless Ogre Tyrant I've ever seen. He's like, it's okay. My life will be sacrificed and forfeit for you, mighty Sky Striders. And the Sky Strider is getting a fat troll guts, and then they're going to be exacting the vengeance of the Great Maw here. And that Feral Man score is going to be uh, getting beaten down pretty good there. So Giants cruising and grooving, heading on over to Wolfric. On the backside, it looks like the Noblars are just hanging out, but did they move up and take that? No. Wait, what is that? I'm a little bit disoriented here. Yeah, it's the other side. No, they're just kind of hanging on that point. I, I switched sides, and it kind of screwed up my perspective a little bit. Searing Doom there, pretty big one. Does nail a lot of those units. Norska moving in for one big last push. Is Norska going to be able to claw this game back? A lot of the Ogre units are looking a little bit tattered, but so too are the Skin Wolves here. As we get more Noblars and Ogre Bull Iron Fists on the way in just for the extra melee defense. Norskin Ice Wolves, the best boys in the old world. Some good old doggos going to be doing battle with the Saber Tusk packs. I actually don't know who wins this. Saber Tusks do have less models, but slightly better damage output. Bit of an interesting duel of fates here. But anyways, Sky Striders move across. Anti-large attacks. These hounds are considered large, so they're probably going to be winning that fight for sure. Now back on the objective, the Giant is still proving to be a huge menace. And I love that Giants can actually be meta and can do pretty well. So we get the Giant trying to do, you know, the big terror routes where he can. And you can see the terror routes are pertinent here against the Skin Wolves. Because Skin Wolves cause fear. Units that cause fear are immune to fear. Units that cause terror are immune to terror. So basically, if there's a terror-causing unit, it means it cannot be uh, routed by terror. There are a couple ways to do it. I think Bellacore has some way of removing immune psychology from units and whatnot, but... Burning Head going down to the Fire Belly, trying to roast off some of the Marauder Spearmen. That's a very nice combo. And the Iron Guts, they got their big their big beaten sticks out, and they're going to be chasing down these Marauders. The Marauders do lack armor piercing, so even though they do have anti-large, the uh, Iron Guts are pretty tanky, and the Fire Belly is also running rampant through them. It's so cool to see people who are specialists on their factions just, just doing work. Very, very fun stuff. But uh, looking at the value, it looks like the Ogres have maintained their value lead, and with healing being taken into account, I think the advantage is even more substantial. It seems as if Norska has struggled on their second push to get the Giant off the objective. They did get him a little bit lower, but um, the Giant's going to be certainly taking this guy to the club. Yeah, there he goes. Blasting some 50 cent from the headphones in his uh, big old helmet there. As the Feral Manscore score has shown who the tr true monster is in this game. Another big attack. Man, Giants are actually pretty beast mode, man. I would love to see them be incorporated more into the meta. They're pretty vulnerable against shooting, but Norska doesn't have any, like, you know, it's not necessarily a shooting faction. They do have some, but... Yeah, that giant did some serious work. He's, he's walking with some serious confidence in his step here. As now we're getting into the stage of the game where the ogres are coming to get you. This is where they play their theme song. This is where they head for the back objective. And I don't know if Norska is going to be able to do a whole lot. Norska is going to be trying to do a little bit of a maneuver. Dog person using the very savvy domination tactics to head on over to objective three. So he's going to be coming here to try and grab this bad boy. The iron guts are uh, on there. But yeah, skin wolves will do okay against iron guts. But if there's nobler trappers underneath them, it's not going to go great for those guys. More ogres on the way in, and now the ogres are coming to get you. They're moving on over to objective three. That theme song is so good. It's so good. One of the best, 100%. Dude, just look at this unholy blob of ogres here. There's so many of them. 
So yeah, it's going to be kind of whack-a-mole now. I think that Norska does have a little bit of mobility via the Skin Wolves and Wolfric, but um, it's it's just going to be, you know, this big death ball of ogres. But ogres are pretty good at, at playing whack-a-mole because they're very fast. Um, their baseline infantry have 54 speed, so they can really just catch you wherever you're trying to go. And yeah, very very tough action now maneuver. Skin Wolves fighting valiantly on the objective, howling into the moon one last time. Although I guess in the halls of Karak Doom, the werewolves do not have access to the full moon. That's probably why this battle went bad for them. I do think the dive into the ogre backfield is a bit of a risk. Like this first fighting we saw over here, like Dog Person did very well considering how tough of a position that was, but it gave Flying Taco very expeditious reinforcements. And I think that was one of the reasons why it went south. I think more conservative fighting, like grabbing objective one and contesting objective three would have been safer for Norska. They could summon in Marauder Horseman easier, like right here, just like he just did um, to defend, the, defend against some of the ogre mass. Whereas, like, fighting back here, the Ogres had all the advantages and were able to kind of get that going. So I think um, I think that was the big variable there. Ogres going to get that triple cap. It looks like they're coming across with quite a bit. We got the uh, the, uh, the Iron Belly or the Fire Belly. Iron Belly is kind of a cool name, too. Oh, he just kicks that wolf in the face. Did you guys see that? Dude, the Fire Belly just straight up Sparta kicks that werewolf in the face. Only in Total War Warhammer. The Firebelly was like King Leonidas in 300. He like he like looked back to his fellow ogre wife back here and was just like, oh "Yes, uh, okay, I have I have your permission to Sparta kick this werewolf in the face. Yes, I'm gonna do that." Uh, that was that was pretty great. See, it's moments like that that make Total War Warhammer just the best RTS ever. I know it's filled with glaring issues here and there, but it's just in what other situation do you ever get to see anything like that? So objective three or two is owned by the ogres. Looks like Norska coming in to try and do a little something something, but I don't think it's gonna work out. We do see a little bit of a points lead, actually. I think all three points are owned here by the um, Ogre Kingdoms. <laughs> Wasn't that great? That was more like to the head, dude. He kicked that wolf in the face. Dude, and imagine the flexibility. Have you guys ever tried to like lift your leg up that high and kick something? Dude, I can't even touch my toes. And like that ogre, like that, that fire belly, this obese creature is able to just like lift his leg and sparta kick a werewolf. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, belly bounce attacks. Yeah, we need some of that too. Well, they kind of do that actually. When ogre bulls charge, I think they some of them use their gut plates. Yeah. So giant's on its way to objective one, which is going to be flipped back. It looks like Norska got some rotters. And uh, yeah, flying taco is pretty ahead on points too. This is a very very tough fight fight from behind for Norska, but valiant fighting to the bitter end, knowing this is this is for the marbles. And again, there still is a third place match as well. So the Norska ice wolves are going to be chasing down the uh, the ogre bulls here. But there's so many of them. The Ogres are coming to get you, man. They're coming to get you. Wolfric has done pretty good this game. You know, he's been able to goon many of the characters. Now he's shutting down the Lead Belchers. Wolfric's just a great character in general. Uh, Seafang is super good. Hunter of Champions is great. He's got good weapon strength. A little bit low in the armor piercing department, but many of the Ogre characters don't have the most armor and Ogre units in general. Greasus? Greasus would actually probably beat Wolfric in a fight, which is pretty funny. Wolfric's like a character whose whole demeanor is like being one of the best duelists in the old world, but he literally can't even beat Greasus, who's just like, you know, the hot dog lord on his mobility scooter there. Uh, Ogre Bull Iron Fists and Noblars battling against the Spearmen, but the Giant's eventually going to break this position, most likely. Oh, the big fire belly burning head's going to come down. Beautiful burning head right there as it goes right through the ranks, tearing through the formation. Look at that. That was some nastiness as the Giant continues to take him to Pound Town. That's going to be a leadership route as well, because it does have the burnt effect, so their leadership gets really low, making them even more susceptible to terror routes and different things like that so on the back side objective three is retaken by norska man dog person is scrappy as hell it's like one of those little uh like chihuahua terrier mixes that just you know will look at a big dog and just you know have all the fight ready he's just he's just good to go it's like our chihuahua we have a chihuahua terrier mix she's she's like she'll like look at like a hundred pound like german shepherd and just be like it's go time let's let's do battle i'm gonna go to doggy valhalla on my shield we have to we always have to hold her back well, Greasus would also win in the lore. Would he really? I feel like Wolfric would defeat Greasus in lore. I don't know. Maybe, I mean, I don't know. You guys know, the, I don't know Greasus' lore. So I'm going to have to trust some of you lore, lore folks in chat. But that, that certainly is an interesting one. So Objective 1 is owned by the Ogres. And Objective uh, 1 is retaken by Norska. Norska actually manages to retake two objectives. But they would have to get a decap. How the hell is this happening, dude? This is nuts. Dog person's down by like 3,000 value, but he does have a lot of healing on skin wolves that we didn't take into account. And the giant is kind of struggling to get around. It's like waddling between the objectives, but it can't be uh, everywhere at once. The Sky Striders have been resummoned. All right, this is how Flying Taco is going to try and close out the game by bringing in the Sky Striders. 
Back objective here in the process of flipping. It looks like there's a couple Marauder Horsemen of Dog Person. He is so scrappy, dude. He is so scrappy. Just fighting to the bitter end, trying to get this objective back. But it looks like some Saber Tusks are going to come and get this. Would you also see Noblars moving in and Saber Tusk packs? Objective one, firmly owned by Norska. I don't think that one's going to be flipping back anytime soon. And this objective looks like it's owned by Norska, but not for long, as the Ogres are able to finally get the Giant. And the Sky Strider is coming in as well. So the Sky Striders have arrived, and they have absolutely dominated the Wolfric in a fight. So here they go. Wolfric's trying his best. There he goes. The big beatdown is coming. Oh, and Wolfric gets bonked on the head by the Sky Striders. And down he goes. Flying Taco closing out the game. He will be the champion of XMT, but shout out to Dog Person for playing some awesome matches. And ladies and gentlemen, now we go to the third place match. And we will see a duel between Dog Person and the House Cat. Dude, we have the duel between the House Cat and the Dog. This is great. We will finally find out who is greater, dogs or cats, on today's stream. I'm more of a dog enjoyer myself. I like dogs a lot, but, you know, cats are fun too. <laughs> Anna likes cats. I like cats. I like some cats. I like her cats. All right, so 2,000 value, 1,400 here. And yeah, it was just a really fun game, man. That was super, super intense. I just think the initial overextension maybe caught, cost him there. I think that maybe cost a little bit. So Flying Taco is going to be advancing onto the grand finals. So let's go ahead and do this. What's pretty crazy is um, in today's tournament, Houseplant was, Houseplant was like in the top two seeds uh, and Flying Taco was in the bottom two seeds. So... Flying Taco came in with the lowest leaderboard entry, and he made it to the Grand Finals. But a lot of that is because Flying Taco memes a lot, and he also doesn't play as often as some people. He's a really good player. Um, but yeah, quite a duel of fates. So now we have Dog Person versus House Cat of War. So they are going to have their uh, third place match, which is also going to be a best of three. And uh, yeah. And we go from there. Let's get these bad boys. Host the game. All right. So let's find him and get it going. House Cat of War versus Dog Person. Third place. Best of three. Finals is best of five. Long day. It's going to be a long tournament today, guys. So hopefully you're ready. How long have we been going for? Oh, about three hours. So yeah, it'll be about a six hour tournament, I would say. No biggie. No biggie. Okay, perfect. Let's get this all set up. Players are joining. It is the it is the dog versus the cat. House Cat of War with some great games against Plat, uh, against uh, House Plan earlier. I always get Platypus and House. It's like just the most ridiculous thing. And uh, yeah, this is going to be two. We have two XMT versus RTK duels here in the grand finals, which is pretty exciting. Okay, so that looks good. Got to make House Cat of War's name fit on the nameplate. It's too Chad. Too long and powerful. And let's pull up the maps and see if the players have any issues connecting. Dog person's on the way, man. Yes, yes. Okay. Let me get the maps. Just checking real quick with the players. Just check in to make sure. I don't, don't think they all knew. Okay. Outstanding. Okay, so for the third place match, it's going to be Rift at the World's Edge Mountains is our first map. It's a really cool one. It's, it's a very North skin kind of Northern inspired one. All right, Dog Person says, let's do it. So we got our third place match, ladies and gentlemen. It is on, and then we have the grand finals. This is the duel for the Applebee, Applebee's gift card. Let me, let me tell them, by the way. So, by the way, House Cat of War and Dog Person, I've decided with chat that fourth place gets an Applebee's gift card as well. $10. All right. Uh, let's see what they have to say about it. <laughs> It's, it's happening. Oh my God. This is really funny. <laughs> I'm waiting for their responses. Who's player one? So uh, it would be the top side of the bracket. So uh, 
So... House Cat of War says, I'm taking the third place money prize to Applebee's so I win anyways. They should be paying me for all this advertising they're getting. Uh, all right, one sec. So top side of the bracket is going to be dog person. So dog person is P1. Okay. All right. Outstanding. And we're all set. Best of three format. And yeah, you know, this is cool. This is cool. We're going to be able to figure it out. Maybe bring some fun or unorthodox builds now that some of the pressure is off. House Cat responded to this chat, did he? Oh, sweet. He's here. Hey, Bob. Thanks for being a member for, man, 20 months. That's great. 20 months, a long time. You know that in the Storm of Chaos, Grimgar saved the Empire from Chaos. He came to the fun. Yeah, yeah. I've heard I heard the Storm of Chaos was pretty uh was was a pretty ridiculous time in, in the old Warhammer tabletop. Wasn't it like an event that GW did where basically like they they collected data from all the games like and uh, then created like a story narrative based on the player's experience. It is. It's the cat cat versus dog match. Yeah, we got dog person versus cat person here. <laughs> it's really almost a punishment. All right, so ogre kingdoms and beastmen being banned. Oh, house god of war has got his claws out, dude. Ogre kingdoms and beastmen being banned. Wow. I thought I thought they would be chilling out a little bit, but no. I know the beastmen bans are wild. They're really putting a lot of respect on his uh, his beastmen. The thing is, if they ban beastmen, then it leaves other really powerful factions open too. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited uh, if we actually get like some proper balancing with the upcoming um, DLC. I'm really excited to revisit like the pick and ban system and like look at some options. I think that's going to be really fun. Yeah, well, I think I think if we get proper nerfs on Slanesh, we won't need globals at all. Yeah, it's just because like right now, if you leave, if you don't have global bans and like you're at the sweatiest, highest level tournament, you're pretty much guaranteeing Slanesh like every single game. And same with vampire counts. Like most people would just play them in, in Slanesh. It's just too, super easy. So it's tricky. But yeah, I, I'm thinking like if there is any semblance of a balance patch that we'll just try not using global bands for a while and see what the stats look like and gather some data. That's that's kind of what I'm thinking. Yeah. Who let the dogs out? I don't know. We'll see. We will see. So Slanesh got banned and then now we, uh, dog person has one more ban. That's, that's kind of what I'm thinking, Hadris. Slanesh actually lost most of their rounds this time. Maybe in the earlier rounds. Yeah. But I think when you get, I think when you get like, yeah, to the real, real scary late game, yeah, they're just so strong. Slanesh isn't global banned for the tournament. The players have, have, have global bans for each round, so they can do that. I was going to do a pre ban system, but they, they, players knew who they were playing, so they still could have just target banned. So it was kind of like belt redundant. There were at least two Slanesh mirrors. Yeah, I'm sure there were some Slanesh mirrors in the earlier rounds. Their units are just so cost effective. Like having 10% physical resist on your entire roster is pretty insane. That should definitely, like they need, it needs to be nerfed. They're so strong, dude. They're so strong. So yeah, Slanesh lost, but also won, yeah. Okay, let's see here. Do we have that? Okay, so it looks like banning vampire counts. So Slanesh and Vampire Counts are being banned. And we will see what they're going to be doing next. Players will do their picks, and we will go from there. Dude, I can't believe we had a Nurgle win in today's tournament, too. Nurgle getting in there with the steel chair. Yeah, we've had some great games. We've had some great games. I definitely do want to revisit the pick and ban system, though. I, I don't like people banning other people's mains. I like bans being used like on a per-match basis. But like without globals, it would be very problematic. It would just be we, all you guys would see today would be Slanesh, like nonstop. So it's it's a little bit of a conundrum until they until they get brought brought because like in eighty they have like an eighty percent win rate or something like that. So it's pretty nuts. Yeah. So it has to. It, it's a really quite a conundrum you're put in. All right, check here. I didn't even like. I didn't even share that I was streaming. Oh my god. Okay. And check here. Alrighty, everything looks good. It looks good here. All right, perfect. But the AI doesn't take over the map center. <laughs> I know that's kind of the problem, right? I, I think they know though. We've 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 made it we've made it clear to uh well I've I've 
communicated to Creative Assembly that Slenish is pretty OP. So hopefully, hopefully the data will lead somewhere. I mean, they have been nerfed a little bit, like the past couple patches. I uh, and I understand conservative nerfing. You don't want to like ruin something, but the problem is the length of time between patches that we get. So it's like. If you don't do it properly, then it's just another six months of suffering, you know? A Nurgle win with no bans, I know, it's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> XMT at the whims of Mark, the master faction main spreadsheet. That's so funny, dude. Okay, Warriors of Chaos, Norska, and Corn banning Demons of Chaos is going to be the first pick here. Let's see what it's going to be. And now we're waiting for the House Cat of War. So, what is he going to pick? Is there a way to custom cap Slanesh units to keep a semblance of bounce? Oh, well, you could do it through a mod, but yeah, it sucks having to do bounce through mods. That's usually like when a game is like fully dead and you know it's never going to be supported again. That's usually what you see happening. That's like, you know, Dawn of War 2 and just really old RTS games. And yeah, but I hope we don't, we're not at that point yet. Like, you know, that's that's like that's when you're really desperate. How about you pick uh, <laughs> if you pick them, you have to use their worst units, the worst theming units. De basic demonettes are pretty bad. I don't know what it is about them, but you would think they'd be comparable to blood letters. Just like faster and squishier. Maybe. I don't know, but they just like, they're just so haggard. They're so haggard. Oh God. All right, one sec here. Warriors of Chaos, no bans. Okay. So are we going to get a dreaded Warriors of Chaos mirror? Oh my God, that could happen. Or do you take Norska against them? Norska, okay. So we got Norska versus Warriors of Chaos today. And this match, kind of a fun one. It's like we're at the rift of the world's edge. It's totally a place where like chaos would be trying to subjugate Norska. Norska would be like, screw you guys. We're doing our own thing. You know, when you play the Wolfric campaign, you get to like choose if you want to join Archeon or fight against them. I always thought that was a really cool thing, how you could like choose to be independent. What is your rank in AoE 4? Uh, well, season one, I got Conqueror. I got Conqueror season three. And right now I haven't been playing. So it's probably like Diamond or somewhere in that ballpark. I'll, I'll, I should be able to get Conqueror before the season ends again. Yeah, I think we'll see. Low conqueror though. I'm not like high conqueror. I'm like I'm like just I'm the gatekeeper. Hey, I'm glad you're enjoying it, Bruno. Josh, my friend. Hope you're doing well. So we got Norska versus Chaos, the Rift at the World's Edge Mountain. Where are all our our Chad Empire players, huh? I want I want to see some Sigmar. You know, in the best of five, which is going to be the grand finals, we're most likely going to see some some cool stuff. Warriors of Chaos should have the advantage here. Yeah, I can see that. I really feel like Archie is really good. Archeon, like I feel like he's such a raid boss. The Norsk Alexis map, yeah, it's a pretty cool map. It's really rad. I asked earlier about Nurgle and how to deal with large maps, ranged artillery heavy units. So Nurgle can play mobility. You can go with um, Soul Grinders. Like I often will use Kugath. Kugath, double Foot Cultist and a Plague Bearer and then double Nurgle Soul Grinder. So what I do is I send Kugath to the most prominent like central objective with his dudes and I have the soul grinders like bombard and maneuver and like try and play the side. Yeah. You got Empire. Somebody banned Empire, really? Against you? That's wild, yeah. Yeah, that is the problem with global bans, is is target banning mains is kind of silly. Yeah. So hey, this is probably the last time that we'll have it for our uh for our big events and whatnot. It's just been a necessity of Warhammer 3, sadly, but you know. Good times are on the horizon. Good times are on the horizon. Yeah, because without without targeted bands, you'd certainly get more faction diversity. You, I think you would. But again, with balance being what it is, with Slanesh and vampire counts and stuff, it's like, it's tricky. Will you have any... Um, let's see here. Uh, yeah, as soon as I can, obviously. As soon as I can, Weston. Yeah. Don't you worry. I, how do I think uh, the chaos? So what if, from what I've seen in the like little campaign videos they posted, I mean, if they're like dwarf infantry are really really solid in in like with basic dwarves. If they're anything similar to that, like I think they'll be in a good spot. And like having cheap, expendable like chaff units is also quite good. So I, I yeah I think they'll probably be fine to be honest. <laughs> yeah, Adrian, ain't that the truth? Yeah, we're getting close. We're getting close. Like, if we look at the total tavern stats, the bounce looks pretty good, with the exception of, like, a couple outliers, which is really solid. We just need a little bit of a push to get there. Then we'll be fine. Chaos Dwarves seem a lot like... Well, you know, Cathay, Cathay has... Like, Cathay's damage output is, is, is definitely questionable in the infantry department, in, like, close quarters. Whereas I feel Chaos Dwarves' damage output will be much better in melee. Yeah. I think Chaos Dwarves will be way better than 
Cathay. I don't know what it is about Cathay. I guess they're not bad. Yeah, you just really got to maintain that shooting in those formations. Like, Cathay's killing power in melee is so pitiful. It's so pitiful. All right. Let's see how this goes, ladies and gentlemen. It is time. Hmm. Let the games commence. It is going to be Festus the Leech Lord with a hell of a lot of great weapons. And then we have, oh my god, you know what? This build that Dog Person brought might actually be very good. I don't know, like, because he brought, like, Nurgle Warriors of Chaos, and there's what appears to be... It could even be a Double Mammoth. Uh, what is it? Oh, my God, it is Double Mammoth. So, Double Mammoth and the Cold Voider. Holy shit. And it looks like a Deathcaster with Buna, which is super strong against Chaos Warriors, man. Basically, just, like, point and click, methodically take down Chaos Warriors. I hope you're doing well. Yeah, I'm doing really good. Thank you. Yeah, Cathay's killing power in infantry is awful. So that makes them good at grabbing objectives initially, but when they lose lose it, they just can't get it back. Yeah, they just can't get it back. Yeah, Cathay is very OP in land battles because they can just sit in a box and cackle. You know, they don't really have any incentive to move. Dog person is such a chad. Look at this build. Yeah, no, for sure. This is it's a very fun build. I mean, honestly, any despite being a little bit funky, it might actually be very strong here. So this is best of three. This is the um, this is a third place match here. Yeah, I would agree with you, Platypus. I would say Cathay is a solid B-tier faction. Yeah. I I, I just, uh, I don't know. I don't enjoy playing Cathay that much. I don't know what it is. Oh, man. Is my screen freaking out? Is, is the screen looking? Is there like these weird disturbances? I guess we're in the realm of chaos, so anything could be happening. But yeah, it's a very cool map. Like what I love about it is seeing all the chaos corruption on the periphery of the map, right? So if you look over here, you have Nurgle corruption. You got like this big Nurgle like corruption over here. You have corruption of uh, Zinch, and then on the other side, I would imagine it's going to be Coronate corruption, or is it just those two? Oh, I guess Corn is like this big menacing tower with lava in the middle. Yeah, so Slanesh is, I'm sure, around somewhere in the distance, but it's a, it's a really, really cool map. I like this one quite a bit. Hey, welcome, welcome, yes. It is the third place match. And then we have the best of five grand finals after, which is going to be between Flying Taco and the uh, dreaded Houseplant. Houseplant has yet to drop a tournament match in the, either the World Championship or today's tournament. Not a single game, I don't think. Although Platypus, you can you can let me know. Did he lose any games in the earlier series that he played? Well, it's not a Nurgle army. It's Warriors of Chaos with Nurgle. <clears throat> so Festus, Mass Chaos Warriors, and that's pretty much it. So yeah, it's just an unholy horde of infantry here. And now looking at the build here of Dog Person, there's not really much to analyze here. It's basically just swarming with infantry and healing. It's, it's basically playing Nurgle without being Nurgle. And just having access to some mobility to call in. And we have the Warshine Mammoth. So this thing does have the Giver of Glory. So it can give a little bit of physical resist. Favor of the Ruinous Powers. Couple Spears. Backed up by Wolfric. A Buna Caster. And it is going to be the Cold Voider. Cold Voider is pretty good here in theory. I mean, Breath Attacks. Good Gooning. I mean, it can go kill Festus. This is quite a bit of fun. All the maps that we use are custom except two. Because honestly, there's only like two good maps that Creative Assembly made. So... We, we took it upon ourselves to make new maps since we weren't getting any. Um, and they're really good. They're really good. They're great maps. But this is the uh, world's, uh, the battle at the world's rift or the edge of the world's rift or something. I always I always forget the name off the top of my head, but it's a very epic one. Very good. So yeah, a lot of Chaos Warriors are probably going to be Hellstriders being summoned in after this. Uh, Marauder Horseman would obviously be really good. Like throwing axes would be awesome. I think that the meta for Norska is Marauder Champion spam. So he is like trying to counter the Marauder Champion. Bob, what is the name of it? No Slanesh Corruption on this map. They don't deserve it. Bob, what was the name of this map? It's a Rift at the World's Edge Mountain, right? Yeah. Rift at the World's Edge. I just always, always get it confused. You have to let me know, brother. It's a great map. I love this one. It's really, really nice. But yeah, this seems to be very countering like Marauder heavy spam, right? Like you have a Mortis Engine. You have like great weapon infantry, but... Like, the Mammoths could be a big problem for this build. They could be a really, really big problem, so. Wolfric's coming. The Giver of Glory is upon us. The Cold Voider is here. Pretty cool seeing this thing in action. It's, uh, it's gonna get some fat breath attacks. I always forget the Cold Voider has Guardian? What the hell is this? Jeez. Like, it's one of those weird units that you don't see terribly. You, you almost forget it exists. But it has Guardian. It has Chilling Aura, which is also quite good. I would imagine Abuna's just gonna come down on some Chaos Warriors. And now we see Armored Chaos Trolls coming out. Rift at the World's Edge. There you go. Appreciate that, F-Pod. Thank you, thank you. So Chaos Armored Trolls are waddling up, and the Cold Voider is on the way. Fat Breath Attacks. I'm going to be trying to get lined up here. But typically, you want to wait to use Breath Attacks till you're really embroiled in combat. But what Norska is going to be doing, coming down here, grabbing this objective, and then contesting here. 
And same thing for chaos. So you're going to park one unit here and move this way. And they're, they're going to kind of cl clash somewhere in this, uh, this center area. Now, it looks like the answer is going to be trolls. So chaos trolls are going to be the anti-armor option, which can work. They, of course, do suffer leadership issues. So you got to watch out for that. Norska does have access to some condom wolves. Ooh, breath attack. Not bad. Not a bad one. It does tickle the pickle of these chaos warrior halberds. It's a little bit over a thousand HP. Not bad at all. Now the mammoths are going to be really disruptive, and uh, you know they can fight trolls. They still have 500 weapon strength, so they can they can get those big old tusks into the trolls and cause some problems. But now spears moving up. Spears stacked with mammoths seems like pretty cool stuff. The Shaman Sorcerer of Death in the Shadows, just hanging out. Marauder Horsemaster is now being called in. Horsemaster is going to be the countermeasure against throwing axes and or trolls, I would wager. And these are not armored trolls, I don't think. Are they? No, they are armored trolls. So they brought the big 110 armored trolls. Those guys certainly don't mess around. So the Infantry Corps of Dog Person is going to get smashed. He definitely needs the Mammoths to get in there. And the Marauder Horseman will be up soon. Marauder Horseman, you basically just want to have them zeroed in on the throwing axes. Also, another idea, you could use Buna on the horseman throwing axes to kill them instantly, and then that frees up your mammoths to go ham. So the first wave of Marauders is gonna get thrown in as the movement kill show no mercy. Mammoths are just so cool, man. Oh my God, and it probably did a bunch of damage too. And they're just gonna be rampaging through the line. So look at these warriors just getting plowed over. Quite a bit of damage coming in from uh, from the big mammoth here. Dumbo's certainly showing no mercy as the Miasma Pestilence is gonna be getting used, lowering its melee attack and charge bonus. And now the two armies prepare to clash under the uh, under the mammoths. Trolls move it in, spears nearby. Where are the Buna's gonna go? We haven't seen any Buna attempts yet as the Mammoths still do some good work. Stream of Corruption from Festus, not a bad cast. As it looks like the back objective is gonna be pressured by Marauders and Chaos Warriors. So the infantry quality of Dog Person is certainly gonna be hurting quite a bit here as it looks like there's gonna be a breath attack from downtown. So there it goes. Tickling into the old Marauders. And there they go. And a Buna as well. Okay, so the cackling Buna is down. And the Trolls are trying their best to fight here, but they're gonna get wrecked by Mammoths as well as Skin Wolves. So the Skin Wolves with Anti-Large will tear apart Trolls pretty well. Granted, they are armor trolls, so it's not going to be the most one-sided one fight in the world there. So Mammoth's still Royal Rumbling, side objective owned by Norska, but not for long. The Chaos Warrior Grey Weapons will get in there. We get more Marauder Horse Masters coming out, and it looks like Norska is just going to be trying to win this blob fight, which, you know, they can afford to lose the side objective for a period of time. Not too long, but certainly for a moment. And immediately we see one of the trolls get routed, so the troll does get terror routed there with the Skin Wolves and the Mammoths nearby looking a little bit bleak for those bad boys. And the value trading is very, very close. Um, they're both within like 200 points of one another. Uh, obviously, Nurgle does have access to healing, so the healing elixir is active, which is going to be a fat heal. But with trolls routing off the field, if they do actually get chased off, it could be a little bit precarious. The Wolfric needs to get back in the fight and make sure to stay on top of Chaos Warriors. And the Marauder Horse Masters of Dog Person probably want to park like up here and get those throwing weapons into the uh, into the backfield if they can. Warshine Mammoth still Royal Rumbling, moving through. They're both in okay health for the most part. Side objective though being lost is a really really tough one. And what is Norska going to be summoning in? It looks like basic Marauders. I think sending one Mammoth over here wouldn't be a bad idea. Like, one Mammoth fights here, the other Mammoth goes and tries to win this side. Cold Voider needs to start trying to goon Festus. Festus is very weak in combat. Not weak, but he's he's definitely vulnerable to being gooned by, like, a big combat monster. So, I think getting the uh, Mammoth to get in there and try and shut down your boy Festus could be very, very good. Marauder Horse Masters of Dog Person do reposition to the point here, so they park and uh, they are able to mitigate the capture weight. Shaman Sorcerer's on the way in, and it looks like the Mammoths are going to be rotating over to the side point. As House God of War does pull the value lead, though. Cold Voider, I really think a Gooning attempt on Festus could be good. Although, if there's trolls near him, it's probably not going to be a super effective fight. Shaman Sorcerer tries to fight here, but they only have 30 armor and low combat stats, so they can actually get beaten up pretty bad if they uh, decide to stay in combat. Nice Sea Fang right there. So the Sea Fang does go down. Now we see Hell Striders and Slanesh coming out for the House God of War. As Wolfric the Wanderer does turn about face, Spears continue to fight, and uh, in the backfield, we do see ye old Cold Voider. So where's he going? Cold Voider going to be coming across, trying to peel, but the backfield pressure is going to be quite nasty as the Hellstriders do get right on top of some of the Horse Masters. Skin Wolves are a decent counter against them, though. Skin Wolves, uh, assuming they don't get charged, can do quite a bit of damage against Hellstriders. Mammoth in the back cleans up some Marauders. This Mammoth, Wolfric, trying his best, but now he's surrounded by anti-large cavalry. And Festus and company are making their way over. But the value is still close. Dog Person is a little bit behind, but he's keeping it in the ballpark. He's Skin Wolves, of course, do have access to healing. And the Mammoths are being disruptive. They are plowing through a lot of the Chaos Infantry. And many of the Hellstriders are getting uh, quite beaten up in the sustained combat. As Cold Void are landing in the backfield, this is very risky. If some Hellstriders are summoned out from Vanguard and able to get a surround on it, it's basically dead. You'd be trading a very expensive unit for uh, you know, a very crappy one. But Dog Person holds on to this objective. Nothing really happening on the backside. Marauders just kind of camping here. Both players basically just playing a land battle-esque fight as they duke it out with their big monsters and the horsemen pull back more hell striders of slanesh are in will the cold voider be able to get back up in the sky that is going to be the question okay so it's running 
It's getting some throwing axes. Cold Voider is still in very, very good shape. And again, Festus is looking just like a juicy target over there. Norska holding on to the point. Marauders battling against Marauders on both sides. Norska does have better Marauders than Warriors of Chaos. Uh, they have the same stats, but they also have the Enrage mechanic. So they're, they're just objectively better, uh, which is they should be. Norska needs to have some unique variables considering their lack of diversity. And it's crazy that Norska hasn't gotten uh, like any sort of like a DLC or anything. Like, God, they're just like, they're such, they're such caveman things. Yeah, but anyways, Marauders trying to fight the trolls here. Cold Voider going to be pulling back. It looks like Vuna going to be going down on Hell Striders, which uh, doesn't feel great, but... Yeah, it do cost 650 gold, I think, so it's not the worst thing in the world. It's not like trying to get a, like a spearmint or something. Up in the sky, the Cold Voider does get afflicted by the Miasma Pestilence from Festus. Mammoth's still Royal Rumbling and managing to hold on to the objective as Wolfric's going to be going over here after the Chaos Warriors. Hellstrider's trying to push into the backfield, but being kited a little bit. Buna, of course, does fat, thick damage. And some of the Skin Wolves of Dog Person are going to be uh, crossed over, and they should be able to sandwich, although the Hellstriders look like they're going to be sounding the horn and retreating. So the Hellstriders will probably retreat off the edge of the battlefield, but this objective looks like it's in danger of flipping for sure. Mammoths are still very much in good shape. Several units of Skin Wolves still, you know, doing their thing, but the points are going to start adding up, and it's going to be uh, it's going to be some tough pressure. It's going to be some very very tough pressure soon. Norsk is going to start feeling the squeeze. Some Marauder Horse Masters shown why they are the masters of horses, as we do see the Chaos Warriors here getting run over by Mammoths, and uh, also the Cold Void is going to be landing to assist against some of these guys. The Norskin monsters are all still in reasonably good shape. The the army here of Chaos is, is quite numerous, and they have a lot of halberds kind of mixed in. Their own horse masters will be very, very good against these monsters. And will Norska be able to get an objective back? Are they going to be trying anything over here? It looks like we do see marauders uh, with great weapons coming to try and clear this point off with a little bit of marauder horseman action. So dog person kind of planning ahead, knowing that he's going to need multiple caps here. So trying to threaten from a couple different angles as we do get the Warshine Mammoth jumping on top of objective two right here. There they go. Gets a little bit of a charge. Wolfric, of course, clearing out these great weapons, but will it be quick enough? Skin Wolves chasing. More Skin Wolves on the way in. North Skin Infantry, are they getting Mortised? No. It looks like it's Healing Elixir, so there's no Mortis from Festus. It's basically just been a healing engine this time. And uh, again, I really think a Gooning Attempt on Festus could win the game if you just take him out. It could be pretty brutal. Nice Javelin fire there, but the trolls do get on top. Cold Voider going to be diving into the backfield. Cold Voider does have that, that slowing aura. But he uh, starts to turn around, actually, and rearcharges the trolls. And trolls basically instant route when they get recharged usually. Especially by a big terror-causing monster. So I wouldn't... Yeah, there's the terror route right there. So they break, and this objective is held by the Warriors of Chaos, and then flip to Norska. Able to get it. Deathcaster chilling over here. Marauders on the way. Norska does get this one, and now they're going to be heading on over to the other side while these uh, Marauders just battling your boy Festus, who still has healing elixirs on, so he's not going to be getting any of those sweet Mortis engines, but... Yeah, Norska's mobility and kind of bouncing around the map has been reasonably effective this game. Uh, the big mammoths certainly are disruptive, and they could get a two cap here, but it, they are so far behind on points, it's going to be uh, very, very tough. But there could also be like the variable that the monsters are enduring, and if it does get down to a knockdown, like kind of drag out, knockdown, drag, uh, whatever, however that expression goes, if it gets to that, uh, it's going to be, it's going to be favoring the monsters, right? So big, uh, big beastie getting in here. Chaos Trolls going to get routed. The Condom Wolves ripping apart the trolls. And their anti-large bonus is quite big. Wolfric going to be uh, here as well with his 500 plus weapon strength. And the Marauder Horseman of Dog Person getting a beautiful surround right there and hammering into those guys. Uh, but the trolls, these ones actually stand firm. That armor really makes a big difference. So more Chaos Infantry coming in. Halberd's obviously a great choice to try and deal with the big monsters. This objective is going to be getting flipped. The single mammoth over here, the War Shrine, getting there to uh, clear out the bat side objective. Just super MLG. Looking at this, it looks like it is Norska controlled. So Norska has that double cap now, ladies and gentlemen. I believe they could still win if they just hold on to two objectives. Dog person has the value pretty close. Uh, Festus looking looking absolutely vulnerable over here. If if the void, cold voider were to go after him, he would have no mass to protect him. I really do think the cold voider going there and just trying to butter that bread would be very strong. The mammoths are holding on. This one is still uh, confident despite being super beat up and exhausted. And Wolfric is just rampaging about, causing quite a bit of havoc with his Skinwolf team. But now that Halberds have arrived, it could be a little bit precarious. Granted, Seafang is here, I think. I think he has one charge of Seafang left. And if there is some Buna in the back pocket, the Buna could absolutely wreck these Halberds and basically give Norska a little bit of dominance over this uh, objective as well. You guys remember the days when flying units like couldn't land? They just had to like be stuck in the sky if there was nothing for them to fight. Pretty ridiculous stuff. Rotter Spearman moving in. Wolfric just being a raid boss. Good Sea Fang right there. So he did have a Sea Fang as we expected, and it did nail those Chaos Warrior Halberds. As the Shaman Sorcerer is pulling back, and uh, the big old mammoth going to be trying to fight off the Hordes of Chaos here. It's a very strange color scheme. The one, the, the Colette color scheme, it's very like vibrant blues. But yeah, Buna's going to be going down to the Hellstriders. Not a bad idea. I suppose the mammoths can deal with the infantry, but they can't really effectively deal with Hellstriders. So why not just Buna those bad boys and see what happens? Some more good doggos coming in. Looks like they're going to be clearing off the Marauder Chaff on the flanks. 
Top objective being slightly contested. It looks like a couple great weapons tried to get that one, but they end up losing the fight. So this is pretty much everything for Norska. Norska needs to get this. Um, and I think if House Cat of War manages to take this fight and win this point with his mass infantry and his halberds and Festus' sustainability and healing, I think that uh, it's probably going to be GG. This is going to be very important here. So one mammoth is on deathbed. It does have the war shrine, so its leadership is pretty insane. But the Hellstriders do get forced back by the Buna and the isolation from the Cold Voider, so the Cold Voider is still doing some big work. I think keeping this mammoth alive is, is really essential um, because just the, the buffs it's giving and on top of that, the fact that it can fight on like the wings and just clear out infantry like indefinitely is very, very good for sure. So how's the old Cold Voider looking? It's able to chase down some throwing axes. It does have that chilling aura, so it does lower their speed by 30%, putting them down to 36, which is kind of fun. And I really just want to see someone go after Festus. I feel like he's so vulnerable. Uh, Warshine Mammoth is broken, a little bit tough, and now we get some uh, Norskin Ice Doggos coming in. Oh, that's actually a cool combo. Norskin Ice Doggos chasing down the uh, Marauder Horsemen who are slowed from the Chilling Aura. I don't hate that combo at all. Now, can Wolfric carry this fight in the middle? Can he get some big terror routes? The, the Halberds here are steady, but their leadership's getting a little bit low. Um, I don't think we're going to have any Bunas or anything like that in the back pocket. Looks like there's going to be a Pestilence going down on top of Wolfric, which is going to be lowering his melee attack, but he still has a huge bonus for his infantry. And Festus is infantry sized. So Festus could straight up just die to Wolfric, depending on the circumstances. But he's actually wavering right now, and it looks like he's going to be pulling back. As more horsemen come out, will this mammoth rally? That's going to be quite big. I think Cold Voider needs to get back here and just come, like, honestly, just go after Festus. I know I've been might sound like a broken record, but I do think that would just be such a strong play. I can't tell you how many games I've lost with what Warriors of Chaos and Nurgle, simply because Festus is pretty easy to kill. The Doggo is doing great work, though. We get the Beast of Tashnar, which are going to be battling against the Hellstriders of Slanesh. Not the worst fight in the world, because they are infantry sized and they're anti-large. So if they don't break instantly, they'll actually start to trade okay in combat, but it looks like the throwing axes are going to be enough to break them. The other doggos back here do get a route, so this is really strong. You can see the, uh, the, the two horsemen units get routed by one good boy, which is going to be giving Norska quite a bit of agency up on the points. So Wolfric going up, and Wolfric actually steals the top objective, ladies and gentlemen. So he gets it. Wow, what a play. Just the mobility while tar pitting this one, and that's going to give Norska some time to get back in this game. That Warshine Mammoth routing off the field. That's really unfortunate. It's had a lot of time to route or rally. It still has 1300. Could come back to this point here. But Wolfric just rolls dirty on his Mammoth up to objective number three and takes it. And now the less mobile Nurgle army, which is, I believe, using a Mortis Engine now. Uh, yeah, it's using the Harbinger of Pestilence, which is very strong. Uh, it's just going to be hunkering down at this point. But this is going to give Norska quite a bit of time. Quite a bit of time. Cold Voiders moving in. That's going to be some terror routes coming in. The trolls are getting surrounded, and this could be a big break. And then your boy uh, Festus is going to be listening to some Godsmack, standing alone, dude. So yeah, he is in big trouble. A mass route from the Warriors of Chaos army as the Norskin hordes rebel against the, the tyrannical Warriors of Chaos. And where is this Cold Voider going to go? Is he going to go here? You got to finish that boy off, man. He's still a Mortis Engine. He's killing a lot of stuff. And now we see the resurgence of Chaos as they get Forsaken. They get Hellstriders coming out. Norska does have that triple cap, but not for long. Wolfric's on his way, way in here, and uh, yeah, it looks like they're able to stabilize here. There was a bit of a mass route, but the trolls were able to come back. It looks like the doggo's going to pile in. Wolfric maybe going for a bit of a backfield cap. I'm not sure. Skinwolf's chasing down Chaos Warriors. Cold Voider, not sure what he's doing. It looks like he pulled back and uh, probably just going to be preparing to cycle charge here a little bit, as uh, we do see the Warriors of Chaos re-secure this objective. Now, this is a close game now. It's literally just, just over 100, like 180, 190 points, give or take. So this could go any direction. I do think Wolfric's in a little bit of danger. He's like isolated and there are several Hellstriders out. So those guys are going to be a pain. And the Cold Voider is back in business. Where is it going to go? Skin Wolves versus Hellstriders. Wolfric's going to stack on top of them. He does have some Marauder support, which is quite strong. And Festus still just draining. Festus is doing huge work here. That Mortis Engine is really starting to pay huge dividends here. One Hellstrider unit gets smashed by a Spirit Leech. And uh, Wolfric is being afflicted by the Harbinger of Pestilence. Granted, it doesn't do a whole lot against this type of units. Norse can Ice Wolves versus Hellstriders. Hellstriders will probably win that, but they'll take some damage in the process. And uh, Forsaken is going to get absolutely smashed here. That's going to be a bully beatdown. Wolfric is basically designed to kill such units. Great weapons moving across. We do see the side objective being owned by Warriors of Chaos. Still Chaos just sending infantry and horsemen out, which makes sense. Classic Warriors of Chaos, pretty much what they do in every single game. And the Cold Voider trying to help out in this fight, trying to route off those Hellstriders, man. Value is very, very close. House Cat of War probably a little bit ahead on army value simply because of the healing that Festus has been provided the entire game. Wolfric is going to be pulling back once again. He's got 3,600 HP. Festus, I think, would be such a juicy target. I feel like there were several opportunities where you could have killed, killed and or routed Festus this game and uh, maybe could have given it to him. It's hard to say. Marauder Grey open sitting on Objective 3. Middle Objective going to be going back to Warriors of Chaos. And it looks like Norska is going to be rotating away from Festus over to the third uh, objective here, which they might be able to get with 
some yeah, speed. I mean, Wolfrix three capture weight. These guys are five. Skin Wolves can obviously maneuver over and rear charge these trolls as they try and get in. We do get Norska and Ice Wolves attacking. This objective still in by Norska, and the dogs are on it. The dogs are preventing the cap, I think, just barely. And it looks like the Houndos are trying to circle about. And oh, is this caster going to get on the objective? This could prevent the cap. And Warriors of Chaos take it. Well played. If you had been there a second earlier, it could have prevented the cap, maybe. Now, this one probably going to flip here. We get some Rotter Horse Masters coming out of the bushes. They uh, have emerged to lend aid to their armies. We see the Trolls in Forsaken getting routed. And will Norsk have enough time? It's really close. This game is within 100 points. This is a knockdown drag out fight as the Cold Voider looks for its prey. Now, is its prey going to be Festus finally? It might be a little bit too late to go for a Gooning on Festus. Maybe. Side objective, it looks like they're going to be unsummoned, but Norska pretty safe on that side point. I don't think anybody's going to go for it. And Norska trying to flip this one. The Spears chasing off the Horsemen. Hellstrider's going to be pushed back, but uh, it's not going to be an easy flip. 2,700 on your boy. It's, it's getting dangerous. It's almost 1,300 points for the Warriors of Chaos champion. House Cat of War, he's getting there, man. It's only game one, guys. There's going to be a lot, of, lot more matches today. This is, this is the culmination of season three. This objective flips. Cold Voider comes in. Might be able to get a terror out off the side of the battlefield, which is like right here. That would be incredibly strong. Cold Voider, of course, has been very disruptive. Now will the Warriors of Chaos move? This is so close. As it currently stands, Dog Person would win, but he really probably cannot afford to lose another objective. Like if he, if one of these objectives gets flipped back to the Warriors of Chaos, then uh, the dreaded House Cat will come in and, and take the game. Hellstrider's attacking the dragon, but the dragon is in the woods. It does have the support of some hounds of its own, some Norskin Houndos. There's also Skin Wolves nearby, and it looks like Wolfric is finally broken, but not before he's able to get the objective. So this is probably where you unsummon Wolfric, or it's a, it's, a, it's a tricky choice. The double cap is on. You can see here that Dog Person is going to be flaying the two points. So Dog Person is moving over to objective three, and the dreaded House Cat and Festus going to be anchoring down in the middle. Festus probably has about 2,500 value, I'd wager right now. Let's check. Ah, 2,000, which isn't too bad. You know, he, he's not he's not the cheapest sword, but he's also not terribly expensive with just his Mortis and Heals. Uh, Wolfric's running could be a little bit of a leadership issue. We got Marauder Spears, and the Cold Voider has been doing great work this game, man. Will Wolfric come back in the fourth quarter? It looks like House Cat is trying to chase him down and get the kill, which would be a really, really nice, uh, nice pick right there. Oh my god, this game is so close! It's so razor close, my goodness! And we saw this earlier, how scrappy both these players are on the objectives. So Horsemen are in, Spears are in, Dog Person's going to be bringing in Marauder Spearman as well to try and hold on to Objective 1. And the Cold Voider, the Chad Voider, with its chilling aura, is going to be trying to slow the Chaos Army from getting over here, which I love. So he's just getting in between the two armies. And Dog Person's got a big Alpha Strike force right here. He might be able to steal this objective if it gets abandoned. So he goes after the Chaos Warrior Halberds with the Hounds. He's going to be getting the other Hounds, which pulls several of these units away. And Norska has almost passed him in points. This is so close. 1388 to 1360, man. Absolute nail biter of a match. So here we do see the Marauders moving in, but Chaos does have the capture weight. Festus is nearby. These Marauder horsemen are going to be getting in, and it looks as if, oh, is Norsk going to be able to get them on? He needs the force path. The fact that the spears can't get onto the point, and there's more Marauders coming in, I think Chaos is going to get this one. Now, Dog Person, uh, just barely behind on points. He would need to maintain the double cap here. If he loses this, it's probably going to be too much. And I think Chaos is just barely going to get this one out since they can't get these units on the point. There's a route here. These guys are broken. He's trying to move fast. The Marauders do get on, but Chaos flips the point, ladies and gentlemen. And I think that is going to be uh, GG. I don't know if Dog Person has enough time to flip anything back. It's a, it's a two to one cap, and he was he had just almost passed him on score. Now it looks like he's going to be going for a push in the middle. He's got the double doggos, and uh, is going to still try and pressure this if he can. Well, I simply don't think there's going to be enough time. The two hounds getting a rear charge here might be able to break these Hellstriders. This was a really close contested game, like really, really tight game. I do think that um, Festus could have been killed at several points, and that might have been enough to end the game and win it for, for uh, Norska, but at the end of the day, really fun match. GG well played, game one. It's going to go to House Cat. Doing the uh, W for the cats out there. For all of you cat enjoyers, your champion has gotten it. GG, well played, great match. That was, a, that was a lot of fun, man. I love seeing the double mammoth and a cold voider. And it's not like he played against a very strong, very meta Chaos build. And it was a good build. It was fun. What a great match, man. What a great match. Yeah, it's cool to see Norskin Monster shine. Uh, I think I think we all enjoy that. In fact, you know, old Festus doesn't get the love he used to. It's fun to see him in action as well. Yeah. And we also got to see some trolls, some armored trolls. Trolls are always fun to see. Hellstriders are, of course, you know, still pretty lame, but it is what it is. GG. Game one in the best of three series. Did I put it in the right side? Yes.
Now the next map is going to be, um, let's see here. What is the next map in today's tournament? <laughs> oh man, where are you? Looking at this, it's gonna be the uh, Road to Talapheim. The Road to Talapheim. And the players can do their picks and bans, and they can go from there. Let us see how this goes. I like it. Oh man, poor Kark. He, oh, he's one of the players in today's tournament. He played in the earlier rounds. Um, he, he, had, he was playing like this tournament started for like 3 a.m. for him. He's like, the two monster energy drinks were not enough to carry me. They weren't. Yeah, that was a photo finish. It was really fun. Yeah, well, that Applebee's gift card's on the line, guys. You know, maybe maybe that's why Festus was allowed to live. Who knows? Maybe he's got one close to his house. We may never know, my friends. Thank you guys all for joining. Keeping the old Total War Warhammer community going. All of us working together. It's great to see you. Got a lot of great hosts on Total Tavern. A lot of fun times. Now, I've always I wanted to I wanted to get your guys' opinion on this. Now, I don't need like I uh, what do you prefer? Which do you prefer these days? All right. So I was I was curious about this. Like I'm I like I enjoy both form formats, but it's always it's always cool to kind of read the room and see what you guys enjoy. But I I think they're both great formats in their own way. You guys obviously know my opinions. And, you know, most folks on the, here might be a little bit biased, but I'd be curious to see what you guys think. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I can't wait. I can't wait for this this DLC. It's going to be so fun. All right, so getting a little bit of a look at, at the how you guys how you guys lean these days. Any new movies you're interested in watching? Not really. Dude, you know what I just finished watching, though, was The, uh, was the Expanse. That show is so good. I'm so sad that the last season only had six episodes. What the hell? You guys have, have you guys seen The Expanse? Yeah, I'm kind of the same way. I prefer Dom for a competitive format, but Land Battles is really good for showcases and like those type of things. Yeah. Dom wasn't that jarring for me because I play tabletop Warhammer and like objectives are a big part of it. So for me, that's like having objectives be what you're fighting over makes a lot of sense. But I can understand a lot of people from like a Total War background not not being, oh, look at that. Yeah, that's, that's a pretty nice ratio there, 75-25. Makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think I think Dom is is great, but it needs a few minor tweaks to really get there. Dude, yeah, the Expanse is uh well in the book series that the Expanse is based on. At the end of season six, um, it jumps it jumps thirty years ahead. So maybe that's why I don't know. I don't know if they're doing another season. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Of course, Wacka. Of course. Yeah, 2v2 domination mode, is it really shines in 2v2, I think. Yeah, we'll see, though. I don't really remember season five of... Uh, of I enjoyed every season of The Expanse, if, if memory serves. Some were better than others, but I also have really low standards for, for TV these days. Book fans criticize it, really? I mean, yeah, I don't know. I thought it was, I thought it was great. I, I like the cast. You know, all the characters are fun. It's, it's, it's a cool premise, too. I love science fiction. We don't get it enough. We need more good sci-fi shows. There's so much potential. All right, so what's it going to be? So we have corn. Dog person's going to be on corn. And uh, it's either corn versus Lizardman or corn versus Norska. So you're, seeing, you're certainly seeing the meta. We need some true Sigmarites to get in here and, and play. But the problem is, yeah, well, usually people who play the Empire, like, they 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 like really go into it hard. Like people who play these like weaker factions but specialize in them like really go hard into it. So they usually get target banned nowadays. Yeah. But you need to, maybe somebody needs to practice the Empire in the Shadows. Yeah, did I hear about the line returning in 40K? Yeah, that's pretty fun. I play Chaos. I play Death Guard and you know, I'm, I'm always happy to see the, the armies I'm playing against get cool models. I think it's fun. I think it's very fun. You should watch the DS9 documentary. I did watch it. Yeah. Deep Space Nine is one of my favorite shows. I love Deep Space Nine. Yeah, the Star Trek one. With Quark and the Ferengi. And and uh, yeah, I, I really like that. It's a different take on Star Trek. Like normally Star Trek's about, you know, exploration and 
old old you know tng was like episodic so like the, there would be overarching stories but typically it was like each story was kind of its own thing or episode but i kind of liked how deep space nine had like a central storyline to an extent and like took place in one station you could really develop the characters there yeah i thought it was a lot of fun yeah that yeah some adaptions are better than others for sure um let's see what he's gonna play is he gonna play lizardman okay what's it gonna be Corno isn't going to ban something else. Well, you could always uh, repick if he wants to here. We'll see what he decides to do. Waiting for the picks and bans to come through here. Pick of new models. Did you see the new Farsight and Tau? Oh, that's cool. yeah, yeah. They they're only in that like box, though, right? They're not being sold individually. One of my friends plays Tau. He's the friend I tried to get him into. Uh, I tried to get him into tabletop Warhammer, and I, I literally showed him every faction except the Tau, and he just picked the Tau when he found them on his own. I was like, damn it. <laughs> now I have to play against Tau all the time. They just sit in the corner and shoot you. I love Firefly. Firefly is an amazing show. That's an old school one. Firefly was like early 2000s. I remember when that was canceled. It was like a big head scratcher. It was like, what? Yeah. All right, what's it going to be? So he's picking. DS9 is a soap opera of Star Trek, yeah. Strange New Worlds is good, yeah. That's what that's what you think? I haven't seen it yet. I just finished watching, um, what was it, Peaky Blinders. So I just finished that one. Um, I finished watching The Expanse. I, there are shows I wanted to catch up on. I think Peaky Blinders got like, the, it, it's getting a movie to end it. So it was like, I think they're not continuing the show, but they're doing like a movie to try and conclude the story. I can name the plot of almost every Star Trek episode within 30 seconds from TNG4. Oh, damn, dude. It's impressive. That's impressive. Your friend does his part for the greater good. I know. I, I, I was so sad. I was so sad. Because, like, some of the most miserable experiences I've had in, in 40K are playing against Tau. It, it, more so in 8th edition. It's not as bad now. But in 8th edition, playing against Tau Death Stars who just sit on the corner of the table and shoot you was, like, the most miserable thing ever. It's like, it's like, all right, so if I don't get to go first against you, you know, you, you kill maybe like 33% of my army and then I move up and they kill another 33% the next turn. And then you just have like a couple like haggard ass scraps left on turn three. It was, but that was eighth edition. It's not so bad now. Tau aren't, you haven't seen the new John Wick movie yet. I'll definitely go see that. Yeah. DS9 is low key the best Star Trek. Yeah. I, I, I would be on board with that. I love Deep Space Nine. My wife, my wife likes it too. All right, so it looks like it's Wood Elves. Oh, he's going Wood Elves banning Norska. Okay, so we get a Wood Elf pick, dude. Chad Dog Person playing with the off meta picks to give you guys a little bit of variance today. Otherwise, it would just be chaos spam. Yeah. Oh my God, Eighth Edition Warhammer. When I first, I remember. I remember when I first got into Warhammer, like I was playing Death Guard. I was using like a Poxwalker, like Harbingers type army with like Plague Burst Crawlers and stuff. And at my local store, I had been winning most of my games and I was very like confident. I was like, oh man, I'm really good at this game. And then I, I signed up for a tournament and the first, the first guy I played was this like classic, classic, just tabletop war gamer, every stereotype, playing Tau, corner of the table. And I got tabled so hard that, <laughs> that my ancestors felt it. Yeah. Yeah, man. It was so, I got tabled so hard. Death Guard were pretty terrible against Tau back then. It, it's it's not as bad now. I can play against Tau with Death Guard pretty well. Plus, I have Chaos Space Marines. They can fight Tau, no problem. So, uh, It's going to be Lizardman versus Wood Elves. Okay. It's pretty fun. The, the Wood Elves making an appearance. Yeah, Wood Elves uh, versus Lizards. Let's take it. You know, I've never watched Babylon 5. I've never watched it. That was one that I've been recommended many times. Babylon 5, best 90 sci-fi, no contest. I'll watch it. I'll watch it. I'll put add it to my list. Yeah, I will watch it. 100%. Hmm, let's see here. Well, I'm trying to think of other like niche sci-fi shows that I enjoyed. Yeah, I watched Dark Matter. That one was okay. That was mainly just because I, I had just finished watching, like, I think something that was really good and I was just desperate for sci-fi. So Dark Matter was all right. It was fun. It had it had its moments. 
Turn played versus the what? Yeah, it, it was basically he looked like the guy from the WoW episode of South Park. He did, and he was just so smug too. As his Tau army just his his just anime army just shot my Death Guard off the table. He's just like chortling to himself in his chair. Yeah, <laughs> that, was, that was that's the true tabletop experience. Yeah. Uh, what other like sci-fi shows are there? I really oh Battlestar Galactica is one of my favorites. I love Battlestar Galactica. The ending got a little bit wild, but I love Battlestar. Gal- the, the 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 music score for that show by Bear McCreary is so good. Oh, I loved it. And the um, Admiral Adama and yeah yeah William James uh, Osmos is his name. I think I can't remember the actor's name. He's really good. He's really good. <laughs> yeah, it's good times. Good times indeed. I feel like they need to cast Keanu Reeves in some good sci-fi movies, you know? Like, they did him a little bit dirty with the re- the, the the Matrix remake or whatever was, was pretty bad, I think. They need to give him something good. I never gotten a Battlestar Galactica. It's really good. Yes, I love Stargate SG-1. That's another one of my all-time favorite shows. Like, with the original cast, oh, it's just with, like, it's it's just a chef's kiss. Yeah, chef's kiss. <laughs> Battlestar Sciatica. It's in my. Oh, that's funny, Quintus. Indeed. Oh man, Teal'c is is like the coolest character ever. You know they're gonna make a they're gonna make a live action version of uh of uh what's that of uh a God of War. I really hope they cast Teal'c, the guy who does the voice. They they should just cast him. He'd be the best. Yeah, he'd be really good. He's 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 probably one of my favorite characters in Stargate. And how can you not like MacGyver? MacGyver and MacGyver Stargate is really good too. Yeah, Battlestar gets a little bit wild as it gets going. It gets a little bit wild in the later seasons. It's a little bit disconjointed, yeah. What about the A team? Are you talking about the original show or like the remake from the early 2000s with like uh, with the MMA fighter guy? Yeah, it'd be fun. I never, you know, I never watched Doctor Who. It's one that I haven't haven't seen. So Lizard members, Wood Elves here. Players are building their armies. Let me make sure they have no questions in chat. But this is uh, game two in the third place match. So the winner of this uh, will earn, let me show you the prizes. We added a prize in the middle of the event. So these are the prizes for today's event. And we also added an Applebee's gift card for fourth place. So I will be sending that to the winner if they want it. You know, they, they might say, no, I don't want it. Don't send me that shit. But I, I think it's uh, I think it's truly magical. Yeah. Then they can send a picture of themselves eating their 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 glorious celebration meal at Applebee's, and that that that's how you know we've come full circle. That's how you do it. I made my tourney scene of eighth taking Death Guard against Town Meta Demon Princes. Yeah, no, I, I for sure. I played in a ton of tournaments in eighth edition. Yeah, the Demon Princes of Nurgle were pretty good. You could get you could get Arch Contaminator on them. You could do the uh, Revoltingly Resilient to get the four up. Feel no pain back then. Yeah, and also like the demon engine spam lists weren't bad. Like Plague Wars Crawlers and drones like rushing up field. Yeah, it's some gimmicks, but I my, I usually play Terminator lists. So I would use like a Blightlord Terminator blob with um with like Miasma Pestilence on them in the middle of the board. That's like kind of always how I play Death Guard. Yeah. Good times, man. Good times. I didn't like SG1 as much when O'Neill left. Yeah, it wasn't the same. It was still, I, I agree with your sentiment 100%. Like I enjoyed it, but it wasn't the same. He was really like, you know, he was the guy. Come on. He was the guy. Yeah, that was fun. Those were good times. I haven't seen... A, I actually haven't watched Mandalorian yet, but I really enjoyed The Last of Us with Pedro Pascal. It was super... He's, he's great, man. He, he nails that... He nails Joel as a character. I thought that, that show was awesome. The wife and I just, like, binge-watched that. It's really, like... You know, it's pretty heavy. The show is heavy. It's not like... Yeah, it's... it's, it's, it's it carries weight, to say the least. They send back a photo of all the menu items. It's everything's <laughs> greater than ten dollars. W- what did I miss? Uh, no, I don't know if I've seen that book. No, is that a new movie? I haven't seen that. This is the the downtime where we just talk about random shit while we while we wait for the players to do their thing. Brackets for today. So we have our third place match: dog person and house cat duking it out for the third place prize, and then flying taco and uh, house plant will be playing in the best of five grand finals as soon as we finish the series. So we approached the four-hour mark. I estimated this would be a six-hour stream, and we're uh, we're on we're on target for that. We're on target for that, hundred percent, guys. Thank you all for joining. It's been great. Some good games today. Some really close ones. Very meta. Very meta stuff. 
But, you know, the meta is most likely going to undergo a massive shift. So if you guys are a little bit sick of seeing, you know, a lot of chaos, different things like that, there's most likely going to be a massive, massive uh, meta shift coming in the, in the near future. So stay tuned. No, I don't really like anime. No, I never have. Um, I don't know. There's a couple shows I liked, like if we're talking animated shows, like I like Dragon Ball Z, the original one I used to love as a kid. Um, I remember going to block my local video store in the 90s and renting the record of the Lotus Force. Uh, that was kind of a fun one when I was a kid. Uh, I don't know why. I just can't, I can't get into it as much. Yeah. I just can't, I can't do it. I, I guess uh, I did watch the first season. Oh, I like Avatar The Last Airbender. That was a good show. Although, is that really what you would consider like anime? I guess I guess so. Yeah, Avatar was a good show. That was really fun. Oh my god! Remember the dreaded M Night Shyamalan live remake of Avatar: The Last Air Airbender? Yeah. Removes <laughs> both mod status. I can ban him. Says says Misha. You wanna you wanna get, give phone the hammer? Arcane was good too, but that didn't feel like that feels like it's like Lotus Wars. Yeah. Oh, and my friend and I, I remember when we were kids, like really young, we, we his his dad had uh, the Fist of the North Star, I think is what it's called. It's like this really violent, like, it's where the Omae wa Shinderu, it's where that comes from. And uh, we watched it when we were really young and we're like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, it was great. It was great. I remember that one. That was fun. Yeah, good times. Good times. So ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, the road to Talapheim. It's a very nice map. Recently redone to be a little bit more downscaled in terms of size. Very much like an Itza type map. Very much like an Itza type map. Anyone like The Strain? Yeah, I've seen that show. It was fun. I, that's actually a show I should get back into watching. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Pone, I'll, I told you I would watch One Punch Man if you start playing Age of Empires with me, but it's you've forsaken me for the last time. No more. Ladies and gentlemen, we got the hardwood. There's a big, giant... Erect wooden tree coming in, and he's got purple leaves, and he's pissed. So ancient tree men are great. They're awesome fighters and have a good lore of magic, super durable with physical resist, and I believe missile resist. So they, yeah, they basically have like 35% resistance against uh, basic missiles, which is crazy good. He's going to be awakening some wood, and we do also have earth blood, just a basic healing and triggering of the uh, of lore passive. Spears, deep wood scouts with swift shiver shards, war dancers, war dancers, and some dryads in the back. War Dancers are pretty good against Lizard Infantry. Very vulnerable against Chameleon Skinks, as well as uh, Cohorts with their Javelins and big monsters. But if they can isolate a fight against like Saurus or Cohorts that aren't throwing Javelins at them, they're going to be pretty good. So that's pretty much it for the Wood Elf Army. Just ba very basic stuff, right? Like Archer, Spears, and you know, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Now, looking over here at Yield House Cat of War, the cat, the cat currently up 1-0 in the series. So if House Cat can close the series out, he'll be taking the W. He'll be earning the third place prize and the fourth place prize, the dreaded uh, Applebee's gift card would be going to uh, the dog person in that case. All right, guys. Saurus Warriors. Saurus Warriors. Chameleon Skinks. Always a great choice. This was a really common matchup back in ye old land battle days. On the other side, we do have some, uh, some Saurus and uh, more Skink cohorts hiding in the trees as well. All right. It's on. Get this party started. Slan Mage going to be rolling up on his motor scooter. Fresh out of Walmart. He's good to party. He has eaten his uh, chicken tenders, and uh, no mercy will be had. Burning Head is active. Ten Winds of Magic, very good against Dryads, very good against War Dancers. So Laura Fire certainly is the way to go. But this bad boy can be uh, focused down pretty quickly if he's not careful. Although Slan do have a little bit of base missile resist, I think. of Yeah, well, 40%, really? I did not realize Slan had that much missile resist. I thought it was like 20, but 40, geez. Okay, no wonder those little toads are able to kind of absorb my, that shooting so well. So this is very much like an it's a style map. We got objective one, two, and three. And uh, Wood Elves are going to get one. Lizard's going to get three. And they're going to have a little bit of a fight over the other two objectives, I would imagine. So we will have to see. We will have to see. Puling in chat says, play AOE4 with Turin and I'll, I'll watch one. Oh my god, look at that. <laughs> Bone's considering it. He's considering the offer. No, don't do that. Don't put... Don't... You just, you'll just you just have to cheat and read the spark notes. So whatever he makes you watch, you just have to read the spark notes and just not actually watch it. That's that's the truth. <laughs> so bows are moving up. The tree man in the tree line here. And on the flanks, we do have the glade riders, the spears. Obviously very good at chasing down chameleon skanks. They're not uh, super durable in terms of armor, but if they do get a nice rear charge, they can also hammer cohorts too. 
Like you could take these guys, you could move up and you could run into those cohorts and potentially get some good damage there. So we'll have to see how that all works out here. In the meantime, the battle rage is on, war dancers and spears moving up and the chameleon's gonna start putting some poke on the uh, silver shields. Thankfully they have silver shields, but again, pretty lightly armored. So what I like to do to buffer out the um, chameleon skinks is to use treekin. Uh, treekin are actually really good against lizards because Saurus do nothing against them. Like if you come in with the dreaded like triple tree man build or treekin, I really think most lizard players actually struggle incredibly hard to deal with it, like incredibly hard. In the backside, we do have the bows shooting. So the deep put scouts and glade guard trying to range the chameleon skinks, but chameleon skinks do have a pretty heavy missile resist themselves of 40%. So they can take that like champs over here. Deep put scouts and swift shipper shards going to be repositioning, waiting for something to ambush, but no good targets yet. So we're not seeing any of the tree can. More war dancers coming out, so really going to be trying the brute force fight here and just hunkering down on objective one and two. You could also use the tree man to absorb the shot, so you can run him out in front of your army and just waste the ammunition of the chameleons because he's so heavily armored with you know huge resistances towards missiles and physical that it really won't do much of anything against him. So we'll have to see. Glade Riders of Spears, as well as Deep Wood Scout Swift Shiver Shards looking to ambush the Cyrus Warriors. They are shielded, of course. Everyone's going to bring a shield when they play against Wood Elves most of the time, but Swift Shiver Shards do do some serious damage. You can see immediately they do about three, 400 damage on a volley, and it looks like they didn't even like fully shoot right there. So gonna be trying to drag those Saurus down over the course of a long fight. Wood Elves do own objective number one, and it looks like now they're gonna be making their way on over to objective two. Ben, thank you for becoming a member. You and your epic beard are welcomed to the Dukes of Haggard, my friend. And thank you so much, greatly appreciate it. We got five new members today, man. Fire rises. Deep Wood Scouts hammering into the Saurus. It looks like some more of the Deep Wood Scouts are going to be moving up, but they will not trade well with Chameleon Skinks. Chameleon Skinks are designed to be an anti-skirmisher unit. They, they have missile resist. They have loose formation. They're very good against these type of units. And it looks like there was an Earth Blood there, but it wasn't quite on the right spot. And overall, this little skirmishing trade that we're seeing here with the Chameleon Skinks is going to be favoring uh, the, old, the old Lizards. I'm pretty comfortable with that. Middle objective being contested. It looks like a little bit more capture weight here. I think we need another Eternal Guard for the Wood Elves. And for the Lizards, just kind of keep cruising with these Chameleon Skinks. They each have good capture weight. They have five capture weight apiece, which is super obnoxious. So you can get a massive amount of capture weight. Now it looks like the Wood Elves are going to be forced forward. They've, they've had enough. They've had enough. And the Lizards are going to be coming forward to meet them. And there is going to be some fat burning heads, I would imagine, from the House Cat of War. House Cat going to be showing that this cat has claws. So we will see if the dog is ready to uh, take the bone or if the cat is going to be... Uh, I, us I find that usually in most situations, cats are the ones trolling dogs in, uh, in real life. You know, when people will have like a cat, it always torments the dog. There's, there's always something like that. We'll see how this, this goes here. Eternal Guard moving up with their silver shields. And here on the side, we do have the, uh, the old Eternal Guard buffering off against the Saurus Warriors. On the flank, we have the Deepwood Scouts with the Swift Shiver Shards moving up, putting some firepower here into the Saurus Warriors, but not too much. Now the battle is on. Both players, in terms of value, it's, it's pretty even. We see an Awakening of the Wood. That's what she said going down. And the Saurus Warriors take a little bit of damage. Dryads moving forward to fight them. Dryads, I believe, in a prolonged fight, do lose to Saurus. But they also cost like you know a couple hundred less. So it's really not the worst trade. But the Eternal Guard are going to get it smashed, obviously. Ancient Tree Man going to be uh, roasted here by the Umbral Tide. Oh, that's cool. So we have the Salamanders. The Salamanders with their fire attacks, obviously going to be pretty nasty into the Ancient Tree Man. Though he's heavily armored and they lack armor piercing, there's still 22% damage modifier because of fire damage here. Shimadio, thank you for becoming a member. The Dukes of Haggard truly rise today. We grow in numbers. Huge burning head going down. That was such an erect burning head. Oh my God, it cooks those war dancers and then goes through and also torches those dryads. That was such a good burning head. Absolutely brutal as the ancient tree man is gonna be getting pounded here by the umbral tide. So look at that damage. That is just straight nasty. A lot of the war dancers kind of in reserves. The Wood Elf archers really don't seem to be doing too much as the front line does start to buckle. The Ancient Tree Man tanking it like a champ, but the value lead is getting pretty massive here for the dinos as uh, that fire, man, that was so, so much damage. In the backfield, war dancers, 94 models battling against 60 Saurus. So this is where war dancers can shine. They can do it quite a bit, but a huge banishment comes in and oh my God, is that gonna go through the whole formation? Well, it looks like the banishment does end up going away from the war dancers, so they don't take too much even still, they should be able to beat the Saurus in combat, and the Ancient Tree Man does pull back, and uh, is probably going to be trying to heal. Now, we see a little bit of backfield diving, some uh, some deep wood scouting, as the Glade Riders do penetrate into the backfield, and are going to be jumping on top of the Umbral Tide here, which is a very, very nice pick. Uh, they'll eventually get peeled off, most likely, because the Chameleon Skinks are going to shoot them to pieces, but even if you could just shut them down for a second, it's pretty cost-effective. On the far side, a little bit of concave here. 
We see the Deep Woods Scouts of the Wood Elves uh, rotating around the side, shooting the Saurus Warriors in the back, and it looks like they might be able to break the positions as the Wood Elves seem to be scrapping back a little bit. Another Burning Head in the backfield is used to clear off the uh, Glade Riders, which is definitely much better than the Burning Head being used on the War Dancers. If it was used on the War Dancers, that'd be a much bigger loss for the Dog Person here. So far, the Lizards seem to be holding their ground, maintaining their value lead. Saurus Warriors just kind of bumping and grinding the Ancient Tree Man, moving over to the far side objective as the Lizardmen do have a two cap right now. And the Wood Elf Archers against the Chameleon Skanks. It just seems to not be doing too hot against that 40% missile resist and those sweet, sweet loose formations. But War Dancers do break through here. War Dancers trading quite well as it looks like some of the Glade Guard Hagbane tips trying to shoot down the Umbral Tide. Umbral Tide does have 80 armor though. It's like people forget these, these dinosaurs, they got some scales, man. They're not messing around. Another Glade Rider going to be trying to penetrate through on top of the uh, Umbral Tide, which is good. Need to shut those down. Ancient Tree Man should probably maneuver into combat and, you know, start helping out a little bit here. Uh, I know he's a little bit worried about the Umbral Tide, but I think that would be a pretty strong play. Wood Elf Archer is guiding back. Swift Shiver Shards are shivering and sharding into the faces of these Skin Cohorts with Javelins, who I believe have Bronze Shield, so they should be able to take that like champs. As far as reinforcements go, we see Clever Girls coming in, so House Cat of War going to be summoning in Velociraptors, so here they come. We got two of them, and uh, those boys are ready to party. As the Wood Elves, what is their response going to be? They're going to get Glade Riders and Eternal Guard, so pretty standard stuff. Now, Big Charge here is Blood Statue with a spike going down. You can see this Banana Toad here is just doing a great job protecting the backfield, but it looks like the Umbral Tide might finally get broken, so that dive, probably worth it, as now the Tree Man can move in, and he can start to uh, squash him with the Saurus. Granted, these are Saurus Spears, so they might be able to attrition him down over the course of a long fight. Pitch battle for sure. Lizards are a little bit ahead. Um, the healing from the Earth Blood and the Earth Bloom across the entire army has made it a little bit more even, but it does seem like the Dinos do have a nice critical mass of units here in the center that might be able to push back these War Dancers. War Dancers have very good leadership. I mean, they, they have great base leadership, but another Burning Head is going to be brutal here. Oh, man. Fire Magic is so good against Wood Elves. If you're ever playing against Wood Elves, guys, you should pretty much always bring a Firecaster if you can. If you're the Empire, if you're the Lizardmen, it is so incredibly strong. So Glade Riders move up. What are they charging into? Sar Spears, unfortunately, not going to be great for them as they take a massive amount of damage. A lot of these archers using their ammo into 40% missile resist skinks, not going to feel terribly good for them. And I really do think the Wood Elves needed something like Treekin. Uh, getting some Treekin in the mix to tank. Like, nothing in this Lizardman army, nothing is good against Treekin. Maybe the Umbral Tide and some Clever Girls are okay, but they have tons of armor and missile resist, and uh, yeah, they, I think they have physical resist too, they, because they're tree spirits. So um, yeah, I do think some Treekin in the mix would have been really good for buffering the front line, more so than the Eternal Guard. The Eternal Guard ultimately did not feel very useful. I think Dryads are probably a little bit of a safer pick with Treekin. Uh, I, I guess maybe you're expecting some big dinosaurs, but you can usually counter them with um, some sort of like missile shooting or something like that. So. All right, guys, looks like the side objective here is uh, held by the dinos, and I think they have a triple cap. So this looks like it's the end of the road here for the dog person as he gets the big tree, and he's going to be tree slapping into the skin cohorts here. And the battle is on. The underhanded branch attack of doom. Let's look at the other side. We do see the dryads and the old glade riders battling it up in the front line, but the house cat has sunk his claws to his opponent here. He is hissing, ferocious. As his chameleon skinks move up, and it looks like many of the wood elves are going to be pushed back at this point. Really, the wood elves don't have a whole lot left. We have some eternal guard in the tree here, and uh, kind of looks like the end of one of the recent Company of Hero 3 games I've been playing, where it's like, you know, they have a couple units running around, but really all the objectives are captured. Ladies and gentlemen, that looks to be a victory. So, I think House Cat of War claims this one. Don't see any way to come back. Literally no chance. Um, it looks like there's going to be some dryads and spears coming out, more dryads over here. The tree man is fighting valiantly, but it is just such a value deficit. And a point deficit, usually if it's like flipped, like maybe if you're behind on points, but ahead on value, you have a chance of coming back. But if you're behind in every way, you're typically going to be the one paying the troll toll. I really like this color scheme. It's kind of like like light brown, some yellow. It's uh, it's kind of like that spring spring color scheme there. I don't even know. More like fall. Yeah, like a fall color scheme. I don't know what my brain was thinking there. Umbral Tide chasing back the big man. Awakening of the wood on the Saurus Warriors. Able to awaken some wood and uh, do a little bit of damage against those guys. On the other side, Glade Riders of Spears sweeping up. Glade Riders is trying to find a way, but everywhere they go, their path is blocked. Hmm. And the Clever Girls are also very strong. The Clever Girls have 90 armor, so Glade Riders lacking armor piercing and not having the best weapon strength will probably lose that matchup, honestly, which is very cost-effective for the dinosaurs. We see War Dancers on the way out. Ancient Tree Man going to be sweeping around from the other side as well, and I think that is going to be it, guys. I don't know. I don't know if he's got any schemes in his back pocket. Is he going to be summoning Mel Gibson from the deep or Ariel, perhaps? I think we needed some Treekin. Treekin could be quite good. 
the dog will eat at Applebee's today. Perhaps so, if he wants it. If he wants it. He will take it. So we got more word answers moving in. Chameleon skinks will probably finish them. It's just the remnants of what we saw before. We see the clever girls um, versus the Glade Riders fight. It looked like it was actually a pretty even fight until the cohorts came up here. But yeah, it's a it's a 10.1 to uh, 6,000 value differential right now. And with healing being taken into account, maybe like a, a thousand less, but that's still like a 3,000 value lead, which is going to be way, way too much. Widow's fighting pretty valiantly to get this point back. And, you know, they do have the Ancient Tree Man, which is a big terror-causing fighter. But they're just, even if he just a miraculous comeback were to happen here and he were to karate chop all this, it would take too long for him to get the other points, even if he somehow swung this fight, which, you know, would take a long, long time. So GG, well played, guys. Once you eat at Apple Peas, you become an instant Nurgle main. That's true. It's true. You, you start to, you start to, you know, grow to the proper Nurgle size. And uh, it's one of those places that's like so mediocre that it's bad. You know what I'm saying? It's not like, like horrific, like a Denny's where you just know the food is being prepared with like zero care. <laughs> but, you know, it, it's in that ballpark, but it's just like, it's mediocrity more than like it tastes bad. You know what I'm saying? Like that's really always been the jam. Word answer is getting burning headed again. The burning heads have just been huge this game. GG, well played. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, House Cat of War is going to be clinching the third place in the season three finals. And Dog Person claiming fourth with the Applebee's gift card. And now we'll move on to the grand finals to see the ultimate sweat, which is going to be very interesting for sure. Uh, I was an athletic director, which one? Yes. All right. So 2000, Saurus Warriors did good. Chameleon Skanks were MVPs. That's why you need like Treekin, man. Treekin are so solid. It was a really badass build. I liked it from Dog Person, but yeah. It's just you need something that can absorb their, their shooting without just getting pounded. Burning Head MVP. It was. It sure was. So let's get the grand finals all set up. Let's reset the scores and uh, go to the brackets. All right. So now we have our grand final match. I'm going to remake the lobby here. All right. Host this. And let's host the battle. No, I'm not playing for this. I am a spectator. All right, so let's grab this and get you guys. And now we have uh, Flying Taco versus uh, Houseplant. We don't have to feel bad for either of their time zones because they're both based in the United States. So it's not late for either of them, which means it's going to be a nice fair matchup. I always feel bad for European players when um, they play in these tournaments and they go really long. They have to play at like 3 a.m. and their opponents are all just awake and stuff. It's a rough one because that is a big variable for sure. All right, Houseplant's in here. The Dark Lord himself, he arises. This is this is truly an underdog saga. Because Flying Taco was the lowest seed coming into the tournament and Houseplant was basically the highest seed. He was in the top two. Uh, so yeah, this is this is pretty. This is this is quite the story, quite the narrative here. All right, domination mode, and let's get the uh, the tournament back up here. I wonder if Houseplant's gonna ban his ogres. I wonder if he's gonna tar like if he actually will. That would be really interesting. Top side is. So top is player one. So that would have been. I'm just checking them maps and opponents, and that's gonna be flying taco. Okay. All right, so they're doing their picks and bans. Let's get the names all set up here, and then we'll get the maps. This is best of five, so let me go ahead and update all the name plates here. Very good. I want to thank you guys all for joining. Hopefully you've been enjoying the sweat today. I'm really excited for the meta to change. I'm really excited for it. You know, It's one of the reasons I haven't been doing as many tournaments. The meta is very stagnant. But this is a good, a good send-off to a, a great season we've had. We've had a great season three, tons of games, tons of tournaments, and this is the, the culmination of that, so... Yeah, it's going to be good. Eli, great stream as always. I've been grinding out my master's thesis for the last three days, and this has been a welcome break. Hey, I'm glad to hear it, man. And uh, hopefully you get through that and slay the dragon and, you know, accomplish all the goals you seek in life. Thank you, man. Greatly appreciate that. Ogre Kingdoms and Lizardmen. Oh, man. the And then Warriors of Chaos and Slanesh. Okay. So no Warriors of Chaos and Slanesh, which honestly, that's this actually was kind of fair. Like, I saw some target bans earlier that I felt like both players got, like, a bad deal. But in this one, you know, there's no Warriors of Chaos and Slanesh, which are two factions that obviously Houseplant would love to play. And there's no Ogre Kingdoms and Lizardmen, but there's still, you know, they both had two of their mains banned. So it actually is going to be a very fair Grand Finals, I think. Let's see. Yeah, Bretonia could happen. Taco might try him. We'll see. Houseplant's probably going to play Dwarves. I think, 
My guess would be Houseplant on Dwarves, Houseplant on Demons of Chaos, um, Houseplant on Corn, and, and or Norska. He usually plays the really powerful kind of Chaos factions, in my experience, from what I've seen. Meta is changing because of the Dowie Czar. Oh, so pretty much every time Creative Assembly does a DLC, they, there's a balance patch to come with it. Like, so I'm, I'm hoping there will be something like that. Almost every time there is. Did you see the Total War voice actors are going to be casting battles? In yeah, I think somebody mentioned it to me earlier in the stream. So, yeah, no, I'd, I'd love to see that. I, I don't think Chaos Dwarves as a whole will be OP from what I've seen in their campaign footage. But I think they will have a, like one or two units on their roster that's really overtuned and works too well. That's usually how it is. Like when Vampire Coast was OP, it was because Depth Guard were broken and busted. You know, like there's always like a culprit. Like Hellstriders, there's always like one thing that just slips past the, the, the radar, you know? Oh, yeah. I'm actually, I watched some uh, Diablo 4 footage and it didn't look bad. Like I'm, a, I, I love playing Necromancers in every game I can. So like, I like if he's if they brought the necromancer class back, I'd be interested in giving it a try. Yeah. So we'll see. We will see. Finally, Total Tavern been waiting uh for you to record a live Warhammer 3. Yeah? You watch them all live? I need new content. It's been a while, I'm sorry. You know, we're it's been a bit of a dry spell. Um it's been a long time. God, this this season has been going for what, six months or so? Yeah, some long amount of time. Just because I was waiting for something new to come out. And it's just... And it didn't. <laughs> Until now. Okay, picks and bans are on the way. Demigriff Knights. Yeah, they brought the Necromancer back. Sweet. That's my favorite class. When I The one time I played D&D, I played a Necromancer. Well, I played D&D maybe like seven or eight sessions. Like, like, like leagues or I don't know what you would call a full one. I mean, many sessions, but... The most recent D and D session I played, I made I played a necromancer. It was pretty. It was pretty fun. I don't really care for role playing in D and D games. I prefer to just fight and you know, do all that. But um, yeah, it was fun playing it. And you know, the reason I like necromancers is because it's I don't have to click very much. You just let your minions do all the work, so it's, it's pretty great. It's good for my old uh, old beat up hands. So Tomb Kings, Beastmen, and Bretonia banning Dowie. Oh man! So Taco going Tomb Kings. He's a really good Tomb Kings player, actually. Or he was in Warhammer 2. I don't know about Warhammer 3. But back in Warhammer 2, um, Taco was a very strong Tomb Kings player. Um, Beastman, he's good at Beastman too. And yeah, I don't know about his Bretonia, though. And he bans Houseplants Dwarves, which is smart. Because Dwarves basically can crump Bretonia and they can crump Tomb Kings. So what would happen is Dwarves would just be picked, banning Beastman. And uh, it would be a bad matchup for Taco. So the Dwarf ban here, I think, is smart. Avatar wins do not reset. You get to keep all your avatars that you unlock on Total Tavern, but you um, your wins and losses and everything reset for that season. You can still go look at your history and stuff, but it will reset on the leaderboard. Yeah. Yeah, Necromancers and Sorcerers are top. I'm not surprised to hear it. The Haggard Barbarians are always like super gear dependent. I remember when I used to play Diablo back in high school and junior high and stuff, it was like... You know, you always have the one friend who makes a sorcerer and they're just like teleporting and murdering everything in like two seconds. And you're just on your shithouse barbarian, like trying to kill one mob and just like <laughs> it, it's it's the cycle of life. It's like in World of Warcraft, it was the same, too. I remember in Burning Crusade, I was leveling my frost mage and like my, my friend was playing a drain eye warrior and I was like a frost mage. And I just was like clearing like 30 mobs at once. And he was just struggling to kill one. I was like, it's just the it's just the gaming experience, you know. But when you get a lot of gear, then the melee characters can, can keep up. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's always a fun time. All right, guys, I'm gonna go grab some water real quick. We'll put on the hype trailer, get this grand finals going. I'll be right back. More Lord of Death, keep our souls, lest they fall prey to him. <laughs>
All right, guys, looks like the matchup is decided. It's going to be uh, Tomb Kings versus Demons of Chaos. Pretty fun. Haven't seen this one. Don't really know what to expect. Um, let me get the map. Make sure I have the right map. Um, map is going to be the Halls of Karag Doom. Hopefully they don't think it's Altar of the Champion. I mean, they have access to the maps as well, so no excuse there. Halls of Karag Doom is the first map that is the Dwarven Undercity. And uh, we're all set. All right. It is time. That's actually what I'm really excited for in, in Diablo um, is to get like a group of friends and do like a hardcore run. So we just play until like, you know, and see how long we can go for. Like I, hardcore mode was my favorite in Diablo 2. There was nothing like getting like, I remember I had like a level 88 Necromancer and I was just like cruising and it was going so smooth. And then just like you have one bad moment and it just all, it's like, it's a, it's kind of like gambling a little bit, right? You're like, oh, everything's gone. But yeah, no, I love hardcore mode with friends. It's it's really fun. It, like the stakes are high. That's the th that's the reason why I don't like single player games as much is because like the, the stakes, like the AI is just you're always going to beat it. Like you know, but like when you add that element in, it becomes pretty fun. Yeah, it was pretty fun. What was that video? Oh, it's just something I threw together. Yeah, something I threw together. All right, Tomb Kings versus the dreaded Beastmen. Wait, what? Beastmen? First Tomb Kings? Hold on a second. Oh. No, it's Beastmen versus Tomb Kings, guys. Oh, this is fun. This is different. Sign me up, dude. Sign me up for this. This is a fun matchup. I, I, it used to be horribly Tomb Kings favored before the nerfs. Um, let's actually go ahead and take a look at Total Tavern and see. All right, so let's go to stats. And uh, here we are. So if we go and look at Beastmen, who are perfectly balanced at 50% almost, well, one, one, one to one. Uh, Beastmen versus Tomb Kings appears to be slightly Tomb Kings favored, but there's not that much data on it. So yeah, that's what I would expect though. Like the Terror and the, the Monster, some of that stuff can be very, very... Nehekar Horsemen are super good here, but although Centigors, if they get the charge off, I think win. So Greenskins are good. Yeah, Greenskins are a solid, you know, 50-50 type faction. They're not like amazing, not bad. Uh, I would I would wager that the Beastmen are probably uh, not favored in this matchup, but it's not that bad either. It's not that bad either. I'm learning Beastmen, so this is going to be super interesting. Yeah, Taco's a good Beastmen player too. I think seven the XMT guys they tend to play the more haggard factions, like Beastmen and Greenskins and things like that. So, hmm. so what's it going to be? We're on the halls of Kadok Doom. What if we saw the Dread Saigor? There is there is a Flying Taco special build that I wonder if he would dare bring it against Houseplant. It's super meme -y, but it can actually be really strong if you're not prepared for it. I won't talk about it right now. It's it's something that I, I faced off against a couple weeks ago. Double Saigor? I don't know if that would be good against Tomb Kings, though, because if the Tomb Kings have one who shot the Great Bow in reserve, they just bring that thing out, and it's just going to nail your Saigors. I think for Beastman, it's probably Gore Herd Spam with Centigors. And Minotaurs. That would be my guess. Is like, uh, if I were playing, I would probably go Gore Herds, um, Centigors, and Minotaurs with great weapons, and maybe like, I don't know, the, the Lord choice is, you know, a Traitorkin Lord is fine, a Bray Shaman, you could go with Torox, like, whatever. There's plenty of choices. Torox is actually good. He can, he can beat down many of the Tomb King's Lords if they decide to bring an ESO. I'm old, played Diablo 1. Yeah, I remember playing that when I was, when I was real young. Yeah, that game was, that game was... Yeah, really grim dark for sure. I personally think Diablo 2 has one of the best OST. Like the the Tristram theme is so good. Like there's few th soundtracks for games that I think like I hear it and it immediately takes me back. I think the Tristram theme, you know, when you when you when you go and you see you get Wurt's leg and they have that like eerie kind of like guitar, that is like that is probably one of my favorite game soundtracks of all time. It gets so good. And there's a lot of covers of it. People on YouTube who like do like guitar covers of it. And it's really good. <laughs> Taco King of the Mexican Cuisine. Yeah. It's time. I, I don't know, man. Trying to get through Houseplants Tomb Kings is going to be tricky. I don't think Houseplants dropped a single game in this tournament. So he's played three best of threes, not a single loss. And now is in his best of five. And in the world championship we recently had that I casted on uh, Creative Assembly's channel, I don't think Houseplant lost a single game. 
which was insane. Absolutely insane. Warcraft 4. What I would I would love Warcraft 4. Holy shit. Yeah, that'd be so good. Yeah, the Halo theme is really a classic too. I'm trying to think uh what other games. And it says Baldur's Gate 2. I don't remember that one terribly well. Oh, actually I think I remember a little bit. Like when you're in the dungeon. Yeah, it's it's coming to me a little bit. Yeah. It's been a long time. So, players building their armies. We got a little bit of time, guys. We're not going to rush them. This is the high stakes. It's one of the downsides of Total War as a competitive game is how, how long it takes from a viewership perspective to get the matches going. Because you have to build a new army every single time. So, it's, uh, it's tough. Yeah, Tyler, I'm in the same boat, man. I'm in the same boat. Warcraft 4 will come in my lifetime? I hope so. Like, I, uh, I hope Warcraft 4 comes before I'm like... To, to, to like, cause at where I'm at now, I can compete at a high level in any RTS game, you know, like, and, and I can get to the, usually the highest rank or close to it. Like I, as of now, but like, I don't know, seven years from now, I hope it, it's, it comes out while I can still compete, you know, that's, that's what I would hope for. Just an old arthritic potato trying to play Warcraft and I'm like, you know, competing with all these high micro players. Beastmen are ready to go. Tomb Kings, about ready as well. I never played God of War. It was too much butt mashing for me. I, it was a, And I developed my hand problems around that time, so. Warcraft 4 would be filled with microtransactions. Yeah, you gotta like, you gotta like, you, so you'll, how it'll work is you'll have your altar of heroes in Warcraft 4 and like, you get your one base hero who sucks and then the other heroes you have to like, when you want to recruit them in an actual game, you have to like swipe your credit card and pay $5 to recruit them for that match. That's how they're going to do it. Yeah, it's going to be great. I shouldn't have put that evil idea out into the universe there. Yeah, that's, that's definitely wrong. I, I'm, I'm really excited to see Chaos Forbes in action. I'm super excited. Flying Taco, maybe switching it up a little bit. Let me check here. Looking good. All right, perfect. Looking fine. All right, perfect. All set. They're cha they both changed their banners at the same time. That was very strange. I don't know if there's some shadowy communication going on between these folks, but yeah, we'll have to see. A good amount of older guys in pro gaming these days. It depends on the game, I guess. It depends on the game. I think the like a lot of those old RTS games like Brood War and those required an insane amount of like micro and technical skill. I, I think newer games are friendlier like in, in that regard. Like it's not as bad. Total War is a game that you can compete at a high level and not have the best APMs. Like I, I, I've watched some very high level players play and it's not like they're flying around the screen like insane. They're very like calculated and things move a little bit slower. And yes, the high micro still is better than not having it, but like you can get away with competing in the top 16 players in the world, you know, without crazy APM. Whereas in like pinnacle of Starcraft. So the equivalent of this in Starcraft, which would be like their world championship is like, uh, you're not gonna, you're not gonna hang in that regard. <laughs> what, what are you talking? What's happening phone? Do I have to watch one punch man now? I don't believe it, dude. Send me a screenshot. You're just teasing me, dude. Phone's just taunting me. Look at him. You need to pay real gold to get your heroes. Yeah. yeah. All right. It is time. The chosen of the gods are the lord of the army. What the hell is this? Normally people will like have something else, but I guess he thinks his, his chosen of the gods aren't going to die against Beastmen. Interesting, guys. Interesting. <laughs> Anna, uh, so somewhat my child, somewhat. Yeah, that was pretty funny. I played 2v2 in Company of Heroes with Gojira last night, and he fed. He just fed the enemy team, just all his units, all of his, all of the veterancy. I tried to take the child under my wings, but he just, he just fed. <laughs> all right, guys, here we are. Grand finals, baby. It's going to be Houseplant on the Tomb Kings facing off against Flying Taco on the Bray Herd. This is going to be quite hyped as well. So, taking a look here at the hordes of the houseplant. It is going to be Tomb Guard with Halberds into the sunset. So, yeah, really, really expecting. Do we get to watch? No, I, I'll watch it on my own accord for sure. <laughs> Tomb Guard with Halberds. 
pretty much expecting a Minotaur Rush. And honestly, they have good enough melee defense that they can absorb, you know, gores and things like that. And then you support them with Ushapti, Tomb Scorpions, Camry and War Sphinxes, whatever, right? There's there's plenty of options here. So so we do have Tomb Guard with Halberds into the Sunset, backed up by Spears. Chosen to the Gods, very, very good choice. They can pound Minotaurs, pound Infantry. What's well, not to love? And it is going to be a lore of Nehekar caster. So going back to the old school, this is very much like how Tomb Kings played. You you basically spam spells, and the Restless Dead is going to be healing your army for uh, for a sizable amount of HP. It, I believe the Realm of Souls got nerfed. Tomb Kings got a leadership nerf across the board, so they're much easier to get through now. But um, still a very, very strong faction, to say the least. So, All right. On the other side, we do have Ye Old Flying Taco. Going to be coming in with the Blackhorns, Ravagers, Goreherds spam into the Sunset. Goreherds will uptrade into Tomb Guard, 100%. They are just better at sustained grinding than a Halberd unit, typically. Morker and a Pit of Shades, or a Pendulum Caster. We do have Butchers of Calcan Guard on the far side, and some Harpies going to be trying to shut down your Shopti Grapos and all the different things like that. So it is on. Let the boy watch. Let the battle begin. Blackhorns, Ravagers, securing Objective 2. The Beastmen are going to get an initial stranglehold on the two points, forcing the much slower army to have to push. And the issue with that is that Tomb Guard are not a good, like, cleaving unit. They're not going to be good at cutting through infantry quickly. However, I'm curious to see what he's going to be summoning in. Okay, we have the dreaded Kepra Guard. That is going to be the pendulum target. So if Flying Taco is really on his game, he's paying attention. He sees the Kepra Guard. He is going to be able to get a fat pendulum on those bad boys. But Kepra Guard, if left unattended, will absolutely tear through these units. So the objectives have been taken. The die is cast. Both armies are lining up to do glorious battle here in the Grand Finals. Pretty nice to open a series with some non-chaos stuff. I mean, technically Beastmen are chaos, but they don't really count. They're like, you know, they're their own thing. I, I feel like chaos doesn't even like the Beastmen. You know, they're kind of like, oh God, the Beastmen are here. <laughs> if you've actually read any of the Gotrek and Felix books or Warhammer Fantasy books, the, the warriors of chaos, like warlords, will often use like Beastmen as like their chaff. They'll just like send them forward and let them get massacred. It's classic. Not all the time, but you know, sometimes the Beastmen do their own thing. But you know, that does happen in a couple of the books I've read. Ushapti Great Bow is pounding into the uh, Gore Herds here. Great splash shots. They have those arrows that kind of like split before impact. So they are able to do some work. And with the lighting on this map, they look like they're kind of green, which is kind of cool. Or maybe, th maybe that's actually just the... Oh, that just might be the faction. Yeah, he's using like a unique uh, banner right here. So Tomb King's just kind of slow pressing, letting the Ushapti Great Bow rain some uh, holy fire into the Gore Herds. Butchers of Kalkengard being kept back in the deep as we just have legions and legions of Gore Herds coming out. Couple elite units mixed in here. Butchers of Calcan Guard. Harpy is going to fly around the back of the army. And uh, I don't know. I think Harpy's beat Carrion pretty pretty handily. So we'll have to see how that goes. So over here, we have the Gore Herds preparing to meet with the Tomb Guard Halberds. As far as the magic goes here for the Lich Priest, he only has the buffing spells. Morko the Shadow Gave is going to be a pain too. Uh, he can move up. If you get a big pendulum on like a high value unit like Kepra Guard, and then you're able to use Morker's uh, auto kill ability when they're low, it's a really, really nice finisher for those type of units if you can get away with it. So we'll have to see. Gore Herds with shields lurking in the shadows. Ungor Spearman Herd. And uh, what do we got here? Yeah, just more Shopty Grapeo Fire. Houseplant being very conservative here. Very, very cautious. But he is letting the Beastmen get a little bit of a, a value lead, not value lead, but points lead. And the Beastmen are really only taking some very topical damage on Gore Herds. It's not that big of a deal for now. But eventually, Houseplant will surge forth. I'm probably going to use all the ammo on his uh, Chosen of the Gods and maybe unsummon them. We'll have to see. Try and uh, protect his Lord. And Tomb Guard now moving up. So basic Tomb Guard will trade much better into Gores. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm pretty sure they beat Gore Herds. Like, I'm, I'm like 80% sure. No, it depends. I think Blackhorn's Ravagers would beat a Tomb Guard unit, but basic Gore Herds... Their stats are just lower. 41-25 against, uh, what, what is this on these guys? This is 32-41 uh, and just much higher weapon strength. They have 40-something uh, weapon strength, though. They have those Kopeshes, those cool swords. So Tomb Kings are going to be angling up for this objective. Goreherds getting a little bit crazy back here. Got to be careful. You could get some Vanguard out here, although Tomb King's Vanguard isn't that scary. Uh, Nehakara Horsemen are not a Vanguard unit. The, the Skeleton Horsemen are, and uh, you have the Carrion and Sepulchral Stalkers. Uh, they can do it, but for the most part, it's not too much to worry about. Old Pimp Claw is going to be getting in there. Some workers jumped into the battle lines, and I wonder what he's going to be doing. Is he just going to be bashing Tomb Guard all day? Looks like he's trying to move through them. So Taco is giving an order. Oh, here comes the first pendulum. It's going to be a nice cast. There's no dodging that. Is it going to MLG bounce off the wall? No. That actually didn't do that much damage. I don't think he overcasted it. Pendulum, of course, was nerfed. It was super OP when the game launched. So, yeah, it looks like Morker's... Look at this. Morker summoned his Haggard Spawn. Oh, look how cool those spawn look. That's actually, like, a really cool scheme. Looks very 40k. And the spawn are going to be chasing down the uh, Chosen of the Gods. Some worker getting his spawn. He's like, I've had enough. 
He's going to be on the hunt. As the Beastman armies collide across all fronts and uh, should be trading pretty effectively. Although we do see the Curse Blades going down. So that is going to be giving a big heal army wide. As the Haggard Spawn are on the hunt, dude. Look at this. In the backfield, you see the Spawn potentially getting some kills here. We'll have to see. They do have Poison, so they are able to mitigate the speed. But uh, obviously, Houseplant has God Tier Micro and uh, is going to be able to get away with those. Harpy's chasing. I would imagine Houseplant summons some Navcar or Horseman to peel for them and should be able to stabilize that since they're just a summon. But the two front lines have clashed. Goreherd's uh, trading pretty good here. These are Blackhorn Ravagers, so these guys are pretty chad. They're definitely going to win their fight over time. As far as the other Goreherds go, they might lose it. And we do see a big pendulum going down at the distance on the other side, which does nail one of these Tomb Guard Halberds pretty hard. And the Goreherds trading well. Very, very even fighting. It looks like a couple of the Gores are going to be trying to sneak into the back lines. His old Pimp Claw here, Morker, tries to uh, cause havoc where he can. And in the backfield, look at this, guys. The Chosen of the Gods are getting hunted by the Haggard Spawn, which have, I believe, I can't remember if that, that was their first cycle. I think they might have another one. No, that's it. Yeah, so they were summoned a while ago. Harpy's going to be battling that car horseman, but it's a win. The Shopty Grapeo haven't been tuning for a while, and uh, they're chased to the back of the map, so not terrible. Butchers of Kalkengard going to be piling in. We do have more of the Shadow Cave continuing to uh, grind away against these units. And now that the Chosen of the Gods are gone, the Butchers of Kalkengard let the cows feast. So the cows have moved in, and they're going to be plowing through all these different units here. Here they come, uh, moving into the backside here of these other uh, elite units. So they're going to be attacking Kepra Guard. We do also have Minotaurs with Great Weapons being summoned in, a countermeasure against Scorpions or any sort of mass. Chosen of the Gods still in the backfield, but now we see the Anti-Large coming out for the Houseplant. Uh, Taco's an Ogre Kingdom's main, but he's also his mains are Beastman Ogre Kingdoms. Um, he's more of an old-school Beastman main, but yeah, he's, he's very good at them for sure. Eyes of the Desert have moved up. That's a nice pick here by Houseplant. I really, really like that. Houseplant, of course, uh, very, very good game knowledge. He's going to be able to summon in the right answers. And the Eyes of the Desert probably going to be trying to reposition where they're safe so then they can blast into all these big boys and uh, see what they can get done. Centigore is somehow in the backfield. Somehow Palpatine has returned and some Centigores are chasing these bad boys down. But nice play. Houseplant turns about face. He gets his Sepulchral Stalkers and gets the Prison Shanks in and is able to stop these Centigores from getting into the backfield and causing big havoc. Raiders just doing what they do in raiding. Big blobs against big blobs. I mean, both players have pretty big armies here. Uh, Pendulum's going down nonstop. Morka the Shadow Gave does get a Chaos Spawn Summon on top of the Kepra Guard. And the Kepra Guard are kind of getting wrecked, but Houseplant now has the Ushapti Grapos back online. So the Ushapti Grapos are going to be shooting at the Butchers of Kalkengard, which really feels bad. I think that Flying Taco should probably try and find a way to get the Butchers of Kalkengard, like, hidden somewhere if he can, and maybe get some Harpies and or Centigors trying to disrupt here. Looks like there's some more Harpies coming in. Centigors in the backfield. More or less shut down. Some Ungor Spearmen. I do not know how they got back here. They must have came around the other flank over here. But two objectives. Beastmen still own the two. And the Tomb Kings are starting to take a little bit of ground. Looking at the value trading, it's pretty darn even. Uh, currently, Houseplant is up by about 800 value, which is really not a good thing for Flying Taco, considering Tomb Kings have a shit ton of healing with their uh, lore passive and the Realm of Souls and whatnot. Harpies once again on top of the Chosen of the Gods as the Gore Herds keep grinding. Some of them are kind of stacked on one another, so not necessarily the best fight for them. But you also see a Gorbel being summoned in. So Big Daddy Gorbel is here. So Gorbel going to be trying to move up and maybe goon the Ushapti Great Bows. And we do have Morker now on top of the Great Bows as well. So that's uh, pretty good. The Poison and the Harpies, of course, causing a little bit of disruption. But now Unsummon's going down for both players as the Beastmen are getting pushed back by the inexorable force of the undead. And Tomb Kings are a really good slow push faction. They, they definitely do some work. But he's going to need some more gore herd soon. Uh, otherwise, the frontline fighting is just going to be a bit of a disaster. So value is within 1,200, but in reality, Houseplant probably pretty far ahead simply because of the um, the Realm of Souls and all the different passives and whatnot. Taco's archers here are going to get hammered by some skeleton horsemen. It looks like there are some minotaurs with great weapons, which will turn about face. So Taco going to get the jump on those bad boys. And there's a little bit of a points lead, but yeah, this objective probably will flip. The one thing the Beastmen might have going for them is that the Tomb Kings are going to have to push away from their comfort zone and their defensive formations to potentially get these objectives. So we'll have to see. Razor Herds on their way up. Skeleton Horsemen getting crumped. Morko the Shadow Gave trying to carry to the best of his abilities. Old Gorbel not doing bad here, crumbling down some Skeleton Horsemen, but the Tomb Kings are pushing on all fronts. Uh, it looks like here we do have the Tomb Guard and the Nakara ne Warriors, as well as the Kepra Guard, I believe, nearby. Eyes of the Desert are also supporting, and the Chosen of the Gods just sitting in the back and cackling. So here's the old, uh, here's the old uh, Eyes of the Desert. Some good DACA from those guys, certainly able to handle Minotaurs with some effectiveness. So Beastmen desperately trying to fight on this objective, but the Tomb Kings have massive capture weight. I don't know if the Bray Herd's going to have enough killing power. They had them pinned for a while at the cost of like overextending deep into enemy territory. And it just it just always seems like Houseplant's so steady, right? 
It's not like super flashy, his playstyle, but it's just like steady. He just, just slowly gets there. And eventually he just pushes his way to all the points and somehow, you know, you close your eyes and he's got a triple cap, man. The Dark Lord certainly knows how to claim his uh, domains as uh, probably an unsummoned on the Kepra Guard going to be coming. But Taco looking to be on the back foot pretty hard here. Certainly the underdog here in this series coming into the tournament as one of the lowest seeds, but making it all the way to the grand finals. Truly the underdog story. Is more gore. These look like Nurgle gore herds, like straight up. They just look like straight Nurglified here, but kind of cool stuff. Minotaur's on the run, trying to get away from the Grapos. Grapos are about to run out of ammunition, probably over 2,000 value easily. Uh, only 1,700, but they will be, they've will they obviously paid for themselves. We get more Nekar horsemen coming out. The Beastmen seem to be overloading on this side. They have a little bit of a points lead, so the Beastmen do have some cushion, but not as much as you would think. Not as much as you can think, so... Continuing to fight here are the gore herds of the Beastmen chewing through the Tomb Guard. Obviously, the Tomb Kings are going to run out of Wind's Magic to spam spells with, so their healing gravy train will run out eventually, and that's where the Beastmen maybe can shine. Here we see the Ungor Raiders peppering into the Tomb Guard Halberd, shooting them in the back, which is going to take advantage of the fact that they are not shielded on their backs, obviously. On the side, we get more Centigors coming in, but there is going to be a wave of Skeleton Horsemen coming in to try and swarm and counter. Orc of the Shadow Gave grinding with Halberds, but it just seems as if... Houseplant has just got a stranglehold on this game. He's literally winning on every objective. Like, the here he's winning. Look at this. It's like he's fighting with, like, a, like half his army here. And he's just got a legion of the undead sitting on that point. He's, like, not even bothering. He could be pulling, like, a couple of these guys to really clinch this fight. But he's so confident that he can handle this here that he's not even bothering with that. He's just hanging on to those two objectives. So, yes, the sad mooing sounds might commence here. The, let the sad moves commence. As we do have the Skeleton Horseman battling the Centigors here. And up on the top side, we see the uh, Centigors moving across to uh, maybe try and ninja the back objective. Not a bad idea. There are some Spears coming from Houseplant. He does see it. So Spears and the uh, Sepulchral Stalkers are summoned in to try and counter this uh, back cap here. The Beastmen have some Ungor Spearmen. Not really going to be able to do a whole lot. Although the Beastmen are starting to kind of work this objective back. But they're just down so much in value, guys. They're down so much. Currently, we see 75 to 10.5. So, yeah, that's a tough one. So while my wife is, uh, while the smoking Hot Wife is in chat, you guys should let her know what what um, custom art pieces you guys would be interested in, as well as what emojis you guys would like for the channel. Because we're going to be redesigning our emojis for channel members. So if you guys if you guys have any suggestions, you know, it can be anything. Memes from the community, characters, whatever. Let us know. The Polish ca uh, cow sad song starts playing. Yeah, that's basically what it's looking like. I like the little like back cap attempts. I thought that was pretty cool. The Lich Priest would eventually die to these uh, Centigors too. The Lich Priests aren't super tanky, but... Um, there's just so many dudes there. There's so many dudes. And I've always felt like this is a hard matchup. The Beastmen, you know what would have been really good here? Would have been um, some Tuscor Chariots. Like, considering they just have such a spam of infantry. I mean, they had Sepulchral Stalkers and Horsemen and Ushafti Great Bows. But, I mean, it, it's pretty much what you would see in Land Battle, too. In Land Battle, you would just see Tomb Kings with Mass Infantry and Ushafti Great Bows and Horsemen and Stalkers, right? Like, whatever. It's the same thing. But you would want maybe, like, a Chariot or two to just give you sustained value against infantry. It's hard to say. So some happy moves going down over here. A big pendulum on the other side does nail several units. As Santagors do try and try and charge in. And the Blackhorn Dravager is piling it as well. Taco kind of bringing the value back a little bit, but I don't know. It's going to be very tough. So Polkrell Stalker is getting that sweet, sweet Dacket. He would have to get a double cap very, very soon. Very, very soon. You want a Demogriff Knight emoji? That could be arranged. Demis, Demis are like my favorite unit, so... Unsummons going down. Raiders being pulled off the battlefield. Blackhorn Dravagers trying to fight their way back. The Beastmen actually flipped this point somehow, guys. But he's he would need a double cap really soon. Like, really, really soon. And I don't know if that's going to happen. There's just so many undead over on the side point. We do see some more Ungors coming in. Raiders peppering into the Halberds. It, it's it's going to become a triple cap situation, which I don't think is going to be possible. Houseplant just still has a lot on the battlefield for sure. So right here, Butchers of Kalkengard, butchering those Tomb Kings, Tomb Guard. Eyes of the Desert going down here. And now it's basically just Houseplant just clamping down and just, just trying to hold on his, on what points he does have. The Beastmen are swarming in for sure, and Gore, gore Herds are pretty killy. But Tomb King's infantry are extremely resilient. Um, it looks like here, yeah, these are Skeleton Spears versus the Bray Shaman here. A couple of Tomb Guard going to be closing in on those Ungor Raiders, kind of shutting down their business. And now the Beastmen are making a push for the back objective. Uh, you can see the Lich Priest and Grand Herald Kotzep being unsummoned there. I just, you know, basically trying to get some refunds so they can spend it on something else. And uh, more Curve the Shadow Gave. Going to maybe try and get to Objective 1. But, I mean, they're barely holding here. That's the thing. And the Beastmen might be able to get this objective back. I mean, they are kind of pulling the value. The Tomb Kings are a faction that can run out of stream. They can run out of steam. Like I said, when their magic runs out and, you know, they uh, they obviously use the ammunition on catapults and grapos, they can start to falter a little bit, especially with some of the recent nerfs to Undead Leadership. Tomb Kings actually only have... 
a 45% win rate now in total tavern this season. So it's not like they're an oppressive faction, but um, I do think they're pretty good against Beastman, in my experience. So Goreherd's moving in, crumping through Skeleton Spears. This objective is the, the capture weight is slowly switching back to the Beastman here, but they're just not going to have enough time, I don't think. And look at this. The Tomb Kings managed to overwhelm the Beastman resistance here. The Tomb Guard Halberds just grinding through the Minotaurs, and the Nurgle Beastmen are going to be on the run. They look like Pestigors. Like, the, this faction's color scheme looks very much like Pestigors. But that's going to be GG. Taco looked like he had a bit of a second wind, but it was not going to be. It was not going to be. Yeah, it looks like you can see this objective starts to flip back. Like, he's fighting well, but he can't just contest all the points. Uh, Tomb Kings, obviously, you know, they're, they're on the end of their gas tank for sure. I mean, they don't have a whole lot, but... Um, so are the Beastmen. The Beastmen are out of steam as well. Morgher is very good in sustained combat. He can definitely grind an objective down and get it for you eventually, but... Festus with a Fedora. Oh, that could be kind of fun. I like that one. Like MTG Festus? Yeah, that'd be great. Goreherd's 24 charge bonus. Got to be trying to get through Tomb Guard, but that's going to take a long time. Homie's got 50 melee defense, 120 models, and they are undead. So we know how long it takes for things to die. Undead recently got nerfed, though, like I said, for anybody who's newer to the game. They crumble faster, they have lower leadership. But that's going to be game one in the grand finals, going to the dreaded Dark Lord houseplant. So it's strange calling a houseplant a Dark Lord, but is he unstoppable? We will see. Will houseplant sweep the series 3 0? Or will the dreaded Flying Taco, the underdog of underdogs, the meme master himself, find a way to come back in the series? Taking a look, Chosen to the Gods, 1800 value, classic Tomb Kings. So usually, it's just pretty much all their good stuff. Sepulchral Stalkers, um, Great Bows, good quality infantry, good quality horsemen. What's well, not to love? I actually like the opening. Um, the the gore herds felt like they did okay. Like, we see 1,200, we see 700. Like, all the gore herds seem to trade pretty well. I wonder what the weak link was. The Razor Gores didn't seem to do too much, but um, maybe Pendulum, maybe Pit of Shades would be better. I think mixing in more anti-infantry, like, you know what would have been actually, maybe a Jabber Slyth or something? I don't know. There's all sorts of Weird stuff that you could potentially do. Anyways, game two in the grand finals is going to be going to... Let's go ahead and take a look here. All right. Let's pull it up here. And uh, where are we at? So the next map for the grand finals is going to be the Border Low Landing. One of my favorite maps. I don't know why I like it so much. I just, I just really enjoy it. Back. All right, perfect. So we're looking good. It's going to be Bordelow landing. Players are doing their picks and bans for the next round. GG's being dropped on both sides, I'm sure. Certainly a great game. My voice is getting a little bit tired. I have some allergies, man. Yeah, uh, Tomb Kings are definitely more fun to watch now. They're strong, but they're not OP. They, they can be beaten. The Beastmen, um, yeah, I think like Chariots, like a Jabber Scythe could have been kind of cool. You know what would have been really nasty would have been Wargors on Chariots. Like if you go with like a Caster, a Great Grey Shaman, and then double Wargore Chariot, those things wreck infantry. I feel like you could go that route too. Wrestler Wolfric with the Steel Chair, that, that could be kind of cool as well. Yeah. Oh. Let's see here. Okay, looking good. Thank you guys for joining today, by the way. Out of curiosity, I mean, it's not no, it's not normal, but how many of you guys have been... Uh, we're at five hours now, just about. How many of you guys have been here since the launch of the stream? Like, the whole time? Normally, people come and go, and, and you know, we'll watch it later and stuff, you know, because it's hard to sit and watch something for five hours. How many of you guys have been here since the, the dark ages of, of today's stream? Uh, looking at the picks and bans here, House Fun's typing, so he's probably going to go Demons of Chaos. Um, you know, Norska would be my guess from him. Taco? Taco can play a lot of factions. He might even pick Nurgle here. He might even give you guys a little bit of Nur Nurgle action. We'll have to see. Damn, a couple of you guys. Yeah, you guys have all been here the whole time? Damn, dude, that's intense. What are you guys up to right now? Are you painting minis? Doing a little bit of hobbying? Just, just chilling on the old couch? Damn, look at that. It's a lot of you guys. All you chads hanging out. <laughs> Trust not way to call you out. No, no, I wasn't calling you out. Me, although it's 3 a.m. at my place. Dude, I, I, no, no shame if you need to get some rest, man. Don't, don't worry. I was just curious. I was just curious. Yeah, I was just curious, my friend. So vampire counts, corn and Norska. Yeah, 
Houseplant doesn't, he doesn't play around. He doesn't play fun, like fun. He just goes for the kill. He's like, I'm going to pick the most efficient way to win. He's going for it. Vampire, vampire counts corn and Norska. Now, dude, what if Taco picks Nurgle? No bans. Uh, don't, Taco, if you're listening, please don't do that. We don't need, we're enjoying the game. So you don't need to set, you don't need to sacrifice yourself for us. Yeah, you don't need to do it. I live for your five-hour cast streams. Not gonna lie. They're very fun. Yeah, I like the long streams are good. You need to do them more often. We need to do them more often. We'll we'll be having pretty frequent Total War tournaments once the patch drops drops. Um, we have all our great Total Tavern hosts who will be hosting. I'll be hosting probably one a week. I'll, I'll try and do it on Saturdays and weekends so more of you guys can join. Yeah. So we got to we got to switch it up. The stream schedules have been pretty awful lately. It's been late night stuff, but you know we've just been kind of waiting for new stuff. So. <laughs> that's what she moaned. What, what is that? I don't know. That's funny. Oh my god. There's nothing. There's nothing quite like dropping a public. That's what she said. It's it's pretty great. It's like one of the. You can ask my wife about it. She loves it. Yeah. <laughs> she, she said, no, I don't. <laughs> oh, the funniest. The funniest is you know, the best place to get public. That's what she says is with cashiers. God, what was the last one? I think it was a guy. It was a guy at a, I think it was like a CVS or a, he said something about sticking it into the machine or something. And I don't know, like, yeah, it was something like that. Like it's with the, with the card. Usually when it comes to like putting the car, your card into like a card reader, that's like, that's like my, that's my highest percentage. That's what she said score. Like it's usually with that. Yeah, those are, those are good ones. Um, where else did we get them? Yeah, there's there's been a few good ones. More frequent five hour streams. Yeah, we'll try. We'll try our best. <laughs> we'll try and do more long streams. They're they're always a good time. I'm really excited for summer. Lots of Warhammer streams and a whole army for me to paint. What are you going to be painting, Jason? You doing 40k? Preparing for Old World? What's the game plan? Yeah, what's the game plan? So corn versus vampire counts. Wait a second. Wait, who's playing vampire? Taco's playing vampire counts. <laughs> Taco going vampire counts against Corn. Oh, does he know how to play vampire counts though? I feel like Taco only knows how to play bad factions. Oh, <laughs> we're gonna find out. Yeah. Oh my god. He's doing it. So yeah, Houseplant picked vampire counts, corn and Norska, banning demons of chaos. And Taco picks vampire counts, banning vampire counts. <laughs> Taco's going for the throat, dude. He's he's not pulling any punches. Yeah, look at that. Pretty exciting stuff. All right. It's 2.30 a.m. in Central Europe right now. We're here. Oh, no, we're having a good time, guys. We're having a great time. Corn has a 0%. It's not. It can't be a 0% win rate. Really? If anybody could find a way to win this, it would be. It would be the dreaded houseplant, though. Okay, so going to Corn. Corn is a 50% faction. Wow. No, they're not. Corn has... One win and 13 losses against Vampire Counts. One and 13, dude. Oh. Now maybe he didn't expect Taco to play a good faction. He's like surprised. One and 13. Jesus, that's brutal. Yeah, that's that's pretty savage. Jason says, got a Lumineth army saving up. Ah, oh, so you have the High Elves. You have the you have the Age of Sigmar High Elves. That's cool. Yeah, the, the 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 spirit of Eltharian is really cool. That's actually one of my favorite Sigmar models. Yeah, cheers, man. Enjoy. Yeah, Kislev and Cathay once they drop. I, they're probably going to do a Bretonia versus Tomb King starter box. They've already teased minis. Although, I would be really shocked if they didn't do like a Kislev army or something for their first one. <laughs> Taco's the most chaotic player of all time. He is. <laughs> Pulse of Brett, Hitman Heart. Yeah, let's see. Like every time I play with Taco, it's like Haggard factions usually, you know? It's like Nurgle, it's like Ogres, Beastmen. It's like, you know, it's weird to see him play meta. It feels wrong. I I, I, I feel as if also Houseplant's gonna have some super secret RTK tech that's been like developed in the layers of the RTK clan. You know, some just like some, some deep, dark secret, thousands of years old to answer this. Like, I feel like it's there, you know? Yeah. Yeah, he's going to come with four black coaches. Oh, my God. I don't know if that's going to happen. Anyone else excited for New Tyranids? The trailer was... I really liked the trailer for um, 
for 10th edition Warhammer. I thought it was pretty cool. I just love the brutality of, the, of those those Warhammer trailers. You thinking about picking up Warmaster? You can, uh, pro probably not. Like I'm already so balls deep into a bunch of tabletop games. I play Warhammer 40K. I have two armies there. So I have Death Guard and Chaos Space Brains. And then in Warhammer Fantasy, I have an Empire army, fully done. Um, and we're going to be adding a Dark Elf army and we're going to be adding a Kissel of army when that comes out. And then I also play Lord of the Rings miniature battle game. So I have a Minas Tirith army that I'm, I'm currently painting up right now. So it's just like, I can't overextend myself. My old, my old, my old gimp hands can only do so much. Yeah. Extreme beach volleyball. I play some beach volleyball, Pwn. I, I used to play that in college all the time. It's a lot of fun. I got, I got pic. I think I legitimately have pictures of myself playing beach volleyball with American flag pants on and not shorts. They're like the full pants. Yeah. Back in like, oh, what year would that have been? 2010? Long time ago. Long time ago. I never played Dark Tide. Never played it. It didn't really call to me. Uh, if I would were to play a game like that, I'd prefer Vermintide. I, I prefer Fantasy. I love 40k, but I do. I really like Fantasy. Yeah. See if you can beat the Smog I ordered. That would be really funny if you actually ordered the Smog. Just the dreaded six hundred dollars Smog. It's so absurd. If you ever want to like, yeah, it's, it's, the smog model is $600. Like why? Why is he so expensive? Is he really that big? Yeah, the the Middle Earth um, strategy battle game. I'll, I'll do battle reports on the channel. It'll be like a side thing. Like once every couple weeks, we'll do one. It's not going to be like, you know, huge, but yeah, the Rex Guando pants. Uh, I got, a, I have a degree in business. Yeah, but I didn't really use it for anything. Like I got a business degree bachelor's my first job out of college was working at a newspaper as a staff writer so i actually wrote press releases and then um i started my own marketing company which i really hated and then i realized i, I didn't want to work in marketing um so then i i became an athletic director i found a job and worked my way in there and uh did that for a handful of years and then eventually youtube yeah yeah the smog model's gigantic is it I have Gollum in tabletop. He, I do have Gollum. He's in my one of my armies. He, he, he. His, his hands get to strangling. They do some work. Subutai. I don't know. You guys probably know Subutai. He's the competitive player. Really nice guy. But he, um, he lives close to me. So he, him, and I started playing together. He, he's come down to where I live, and uh, we've met up at a couple game stores. And he plays. He plays a, a Mordor. So he has like the Witch King and Gothmog and all the, like the Mordor orcs. And I play Minas Tirith. And Rangers of Athelion is the other list I play. Yeah, it's pretty fun. Great times. Great times. Gollum, Gollum's gotten some good kills, though. He's gotten some good kills. Like, Gollum has gotten the big the big strangling fingers in there, for sure. He's actually surprisingly strong in the tabletop game. It's weird. Like, you'd think he'd be terrible, but he can. He has good killing power. Yeah. You're about to start a new job yourself. I'm scared out of your wits. Oh, you'll be great. You'll be great. It's, it, it's good. It feels good to, you know, get into a new gig if you like it and... Yeah, get that get that savings going and all that. Cornbridge Vampire Counts players still building the armies. Ready up here, just so they don't have to wait for me, just in case. Yeah, I worked in marketing. I didn't like it. Yeah, I didn't like it. Didn't it didn't tickle my pickle. No. I did like my job as an as a athletic director, though. It was a great job. It was really fun. I basically ran sports events like, you know, soccer, basketball, football. I ran track and field meets and it was a lot of work. It was like seventy hours a week, eighty hours sometimes and the pay was poor, but it was for a really good cause and it was it was a great company. So I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it, but hanging out with you guys is a lot more fun. Oh, Corn switching the banner up. I, I can't wait any longer. I have to peek and see what his army is. I'm genuinely curious. Hold on. Okay. All right. Interesting. Interesting. Looks pretty cool to me. All right, so switching to the other side here, making sure the armies aren't there, and we are back. We are back, ladies and gentlemen. Does Dole uh, and Roth have any units? Yeah, they do. Yeah, yeah. You can play like the various fiefdoms, and uh, yeah, it's it's pretty cool. I think Helmen Gorsts. What paint scheme would you guys do? Like, what's a paint scheme you've discovered in Total War that if you guys were to start a fantasy army, you would like do that instead of the primary one? Like, I feel like the dwarves have some really cool ones, like Barak Var, like that, like rich purple. And then also the ancestral throng with the white and yellow looks really cool in the dwarves. I thought that was a really like neat scheme. My empire army is like very vanilla. It's like the classic red and white, like with some Altdorf mixed in. 
But for the future armies, I think I'll, we'll do some like off schemes. I heard flying taco taught Chuck Norris to fight. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe so. All right, it is time. Yeah, Buck, that's that's the tough thing. I moved somewhere where I was. I didn't know anybody to play with, but thankfully we're start, I'm starting to meet some people around here who play. So what's really common in the town I live in is, uh, is Magic the Gathering. It's like, there's a ton of people who play Commander here. Um, Talbic land, yeah, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a triple dual weapon chosen build coming in for corn. Whoa, that is wild. Check that out. Triple dual weapon chosen with Minotaurs of corn. Anti-large, armor-piercing, obviously super good against both Graveguard and uh, Cryptors and whatnot. We're going to see how this goes. So for the Coronade Army, it's basically just uh, meet me in the middle and grind. Catch me outside, see how this goes. It's going to be chosen with dual weapons. These guys are absolute lawnmowers. They will massacre any Vampire Count battle line, but Mortis Engines counter them super hard. So that's kind of the, the give and trade. And also Pit of Shades. And, well, Pit of Shades, Winds of Death, all that kind of stuff. Minotaurs with great opens to try and counter the Mortis Engines and Cryptors, and that's pretty much it. This is a this is a hog wild army. He's just going to be unsummoning the uh, the flying units there. One sec. Uh, what am I checking, Pwn? Oh my god, that smog is massive. Yeah, he's like twice the size of an Imperial Knight. Jeez. You weren't kidding, Pwn. Okay. Painting skin makes me scared of the old world. Don't be. It's really easy. You literally just spray prime them like Gray Seer or Wraithbone, and then you just use a contrast paint, and it looks good. And honestly, it's super easy. So, for the Vampire Counts and Flying Taco, he's down. Will he be the first one to draw blood from the Dark Lord Houseplant? Or will Houseplant continue his reign of tyranny? We will see. This is literally a horrific matchup for Corn. Horrific. But you never know. Houseplant figures things out. He's, he's a cunning one. Heinrich Kemmler is here. He's going to be summoning Krell. We got a Mortis Engine, Cryptors. Graveguard Great Weapons are an excellent choice against Corn. Obviously, they'll trade very well into the Cornate Infantry. And the battle is now on. The fate of the old world is upon us. And we will see how this goes. Last question I'll answer before I focus purely on commentary here. What's my favorite color in Magic? I always play Mono Black. Yeah, I like playing Evil Cackling Mono Black decks. Yes. Yes, yes. Mortis Engine is moving and a grooving. And this thing is very quick. It's got 48 movement speed. You can certainly uh, drag some of these around. I'm surprised he didn't go for the ROR. For a little bit more money, you get a slowing aura, which can be very, very impactful. And we will see if he's going to move to the other side. So probably what you do is you just park like your main battle line will be like so. Like controlling this and then like just having a like a Cryptor and a Graveguard right here. Like to make sure you don't get back apps. And then you just grind on objective number two. That's what you think. That's what you do with Vampire Counts. You just want to force a grind. Vampire Counts are very much like Nurgle in that way, but way better. Because Vampire Counts can do everything Nurgle does, but better. They, they, they grind in melee. They have like crazy good mobile Mortis engines. They have excellent cavalry. They have really good flying units. Vampire Counts are just, when Nurgle goes to sleep at night and just kind of looks in the mirror and sees himself, he's just power fantasizing about being the Vampire Counts. That's basically Nurgle in a nutshell. So here comes the Cryptors and the Zombies. On the backside, we see Minotaurs with great weapons looking to get sneaky sneaky. Who would have ever thought we would have Covert, covert 28 movement speed, chosen of corn moving through the brush. So they're going to be hustling and uh, trying to get to that point. Now, Cryptors will hard counter them. Cryptors, zombies, skeletons, and spears all stacked together will typically trade very well there. Although, like, chosen do have crazy enough stats that they can still grind through those type of units. <laughs> the Chad Nurgle Warrior versus the Rudin Zombie. Toko, okay, thank you. I appreciate you being a member that long. And, uh, yeah, that's how I feel too. But, you know. It's just the, it's the sad reality is that the Vampire Counts are very, very strong indeed. So middle objective is going to be uh, getting taken initially probably by Flying Taco. We do see some big Minotaurs. The Bulls are on parade. They have the attack order, but they're like, walking very slowly. It's weird. They're like just, okay, there they go. Just the big dramatic toss at the very end. Cryptors are going to counter charge them with a Vargulf. Oh, we got a Gorilla here. We have the Vampire Gorilla, one of my favorites. We do have a Vargulf. And uh, yeah, the Vampire Gorilla... With like zombies and whatnot should be able to swarm the minotaurs but houseplant's not going to let that happen houseplant's going to be pressuring the back objective flying taco cannot let this happen because what's gonna what, he's just gonna avoid him and wherever the mortis engine goes like he needs to allocate like something over here like some blood knights uh you know some grave guard great weapons stacked with crypt horrors he can't let himself be double capped like this because that's how you get pulled apart that is how you get pulled apart 
So coming in are Skeleton Warriors, Skeleton Warriors, Cryptors. Taco needs to find a way to get this side point. He's got more Cryptors moving in. Which, if they're stacked with Chaff units, they can fight reasonably well against Minotaurs. Middle objective, firmly held by the Vampire Counts. Heinrich Kemmler going to be cackling all the way to the bank and heading to the back objective here. And we're going to see what Houseplant's got in store. Now, he summoned in a Herald of Corn. So this is the actual lord of his army. It's going to be the uh, Herald, which isn't a bad choice. Certainly fire damage, mobile, has some good buffs. I, I think the corn basic characters are very, very strong, actually. So vampires are moving up slowly but surely. They have the double Cryptor, and this is very much like about juggling like allocation of resources. That's what this matchup is going to come down to. Is Taco you know, proficient enough to juggle the right resources here to deal with the, the amount of units that are being sent here? Graveguard Great Opens being harried. I would love to see some Blood Knights from Taco. I don't know if he brought any, but Blood Knights would be a pretty good answer. Although we do get the Devils. Nope, just basic Vargas. They're moving in. And now the Graveguard kind of in the tree line, but going to get hammered by those Minotaurs of Corn. And these are the anti-infantry variants. So look at that, man. Houseplant, which is the sweaty micro. Really good stuff. And yeah, if he win, just manages to win this matchup, that is just going to be insane. Because this has just always been so dominated by the forces of Vampire Counts. Cryptor is moving in, and they got their Chosen of Corn in their clutches. Skeleton Spear is also moving in, and now the Great Weapons are here. So will the Cryptors be able to get it? Look, the Cryptors try and pull back and lure the Minotaurs into the Chaff Spearmen. Heinrich Kemmler is nearby, so he can drop Krell if he wants to. And we do also see Vargas. Vargas are actually not a terrible answer against Corn Minotaurs. Not the Great Weapons. You don't want to be fighting those, but you want to be going after the Anti-Infantry variant. So Vampire Gorilla is making its way in, but Vampire Gorilla better watch out. It's fighting some scary prey. And oh, Krell is here! The mighty Cornate champion of old, he rises to fight his own. And, you know, Corn doesn't care about fighting his own people. So, Krell just gets punched in the face by Minotaur and falls over. Very shameful, but he's still here, and he's going to be able to cleave through some of these guys. Flying Taco is certainly winning this fight. Oh, my God. And the rear charge coming in. Brutal surround on the Minotaurs of Corn. You see those guys get hammered into the Shadow Realm. Yeah, Vampire Counts are just so nasty, dude. Over here, we see some Chaff units going down. So, Skeletons getting absolutely butchered, to no surprise. But this surround play was really, really good. Um, the Herald of Corn is surrounded. The Minotaurs with Great Opens here are kind of getting crumped a little bit. As far as this objective goes, Vampire Counts are just like, yeah, look at this. Flying Taco's playing land battle, guys. Look at that. All of you land battle enjoyers. Here we go. We got, we got Vampire Counts and land battles right there. They're sitting in the old box. Corn over here, moving around to the side. Vampire Counts still trying to hold back the tide of Chosen. Without the Mortis Engine here, the Chosen might be able to actually get some really good sustained value. But we do see the Minotaurs here getting absolutely blasted as the uh, Herald of Corn and the Minotaurs are going to be forced to retreat. And the Vampire Counts are going to secure the side objective here. Heinrich Kemmler with his Chaos Tomb Blade doing work. Black Knights with Lances, not a bad choice. Minotaurs will kind of dominate them, but even still, they can rear charge, you know, the Corn Infantry and potentially uh, hammer them. And it looks like there's going to be a zombie summon going down. And these Chosen are going to get sandwiched now, which is going to be pretty brutal. Vargas get Invocation. Chosen, though, man, they're linebackers. Without a Mortis Engine, I'm telling you, they could actually maybe trade well here. We'll have to see. Now, Houseplant looking for opportunities. He's, he's scavenging, he's using his Minotaurs to clean up these Skeleton Spears on the outside, and is just looking for ways to take fights. Um, here, we do see the Chosen moving and the Minotaurs with great weapons. I think you could send the Mortis Engine. It needs to, it should be active, I think. But it looks like they're actually gonna move in, which is crazy. Is Taco paying attention or is he super microing on the other side? Uh, these two Cryptors should be killing these Chosen and the Mortis Engine should also be you know, getting on these guys. You definitely want to take that value. Vampire Counts will probably still be favored in this blob fight, even without the Mortis Engine, simply because of the, just the healing, the sustainability, the zombie summons, all that sort of stuff, right? And you can see the Chosen are getting worn down. They're starting to run a little bit light on numbers. Uh, 66, the Mark of the Beast there, as the uh, Minotaurs of Corn just, yeah, getting rear charged by these Vargas with their fat, erect, armor-piercing values is brutal. Vargas are a really good unit. Yeah, they, they hit very, very hard as they attack these Minotaurs. Minotaurs take a big chunk of damage from that landing there. Uh, retreating off the map. Here we do see the Vampire Counts holding on to the objective. Corn desperately trying to fight away from the Mortis Engine. And now the Mortis Engine is on top of the Chosen of Corn. Over here we do see Cryptors and Minotaurs fighting against, uh, or excuse me, uh, Chosen and Minotaurs versus Cryptors and Skeletons. But I, I still think that the Undead are probably going to be able to hold this down. We'll have to see what kind of troops they call in. We do get a Corpse Cart, and that's one thing that I think was missing here. Uh, if there was a Corpse Cart, that would be a much better fight for the Undead. So if they had a couple Corpse Carts in their starting army, that could have been the turning of the tide. Now, Heinrich Kemmler and company, the objective actually kind of flipping back to the forces of corn here. We do see some flesh hounds getting a little bit beat up, but the uh, the Minotaur is trading like absolute chads. And look at this. The undead army here, guys, is actually looking a little bit bare bones. I actually didn't mean that for that to be a pun, but it just happened. Heinrich Kemmler here. He's trying to provide that chaos tomb blade, but the chad chosen of corn, man. 
Houseplant showing. He's he's got the chops. No matter what the matchup is, no matter the odds, he's going to be a contender. And he's going to give you trouble. Another zombie summon going down. Cryptor is trying to fight here. We do see the Black Knights getting wrecked by the Minotaurs, and the Var guys trying to fight back in the middle. The Mortis engine draining down Chosen, which is very cost effective. But overall, it look kind of looks like the vampire counts have been pulled apart a little bit, just a little bit. And the Chosen are though they're getting Mortis engine here. I just don't think the right units were maybe sent over here. Maybe you needed the Mortis Engine or a Corpse Card or something. I'm not sure. The value is close, and there is a lot of healing on the table. So this is a really, really close game, guys. This is actually really close. Heinrich Kemmler fighting with his Cryptors here. These Minotaurs are being worn down. Far guys being worn down as well. We got Sternsman coming out, Skeleton Spears, and the Dire Pack, a very, very good choice. This Mortis Engine trying to carry to the best of its abilities. It's, it's doing great damage. I would imagine probably about 700 value based on how long it's been fighting. About 500 here, so we we're pretty close. But yeah, it's draining these Chosen down. We finally get a Corpse Cart here, which will be buffing up these Undead. But more Minotaurs are on the way in, and also Marauders of Corn with Throwing Axes. These guys are awesome. Fire damage with their ranged attacks will mitigate the healing of some of these bigger targets, right? So Corn might be able to get this. This objective is flipping. And it looks like corn has got the triple cap, ladies and gentlemen. Even though the value is close, Corn still has the better quality units. Obviously, if you're mostly Zombies and Skeletons, your capture weight should suck. That should be the penalty for that. Herald of Corn fighting. Are these chosen over here? Those are Minotaurs, and it looks like the Horsemen get to move in as well. Dire Pack being used here by Flying Taco to hunt down the Minotaurs here. So they are on the hunt. They're going after the Minos, which are going to be retreating into the trees, which is good. Chase them down and, uh, you know, get the wipe so they don't come in and get another charge. I think the Undead might be able to flip this objective back. It's so it's so hard to tell. Horsemen moving in. Looks like Flesh Doggo is maybe going to go after the Skeleton Spears. The Mortis Engine might break the back of Corn in the middle too, though. Oh, it's close, man. Marauders of Corn. Chose these Chosen are tanking this Mortis Engine like absolute chads. They're just tanking it so well. And the Mortis, of course, still draining. Uh, I don't see the effect on the Chosen, but it looks like they're taking perpetual damage. And maybe maybe it doesn't have a contact effect, so it doesn't like show it in the uh, buffs. Look at this. The Chosen aren't even attacking the Corpse Guard. Yet it's getting killed by their attacks. They have, I believe, 60, 69 weapon strength in total. They have a shit ton of weapon strength. The Mortis Engine has to be attacking as well. So the Mortis Engine is there. It looks like all three objectives are currently owned by the Corn Dogs. On the back, this is just a knockdown drag out fight as the Corn Dogs do pile in. Blood for the Blood God, indeed, as Chosen of Corn continue their butchering of the undead. And this is huge. The fact that Houseplant was able to win this big blob fight, and Heinrich Kemmler did get away. He's laughing somewhere. He's being an evil necromancer somewhere else. But the fact that the undead might be losing this fight in the back is massive because that's going to be hard for them to retake. Now we get another zombie summon coming down. The Mortis Engine still draining down the Chosen. The value is close. Houseplant is up by about four or 500 value, but with healing being taken into account, the Vampire Counts definitely have the better army, but they're falling rapidly behind on points. And Taco is going to have to, you know, go for some sort of a desperation cap. Maybe even summon a couple zombies on the far side and send them towards objective three or something. Like, because it's going to get very, very dicey very quickly here. Now Vampire Gorilla is, is holding it down, getting punched in the face a little bit, but, you know, he gets knocked down, he gets back up again. You know, never going to... Keep him down. Continuing to fight. Backed up by these Skeleton Spearmen. And it looks like the Corn is going to be abandoning the back objective. Realizing they're happy with the 2-cap. Maybe coming here for a Space Jam Slam. We'll have to see. Mortis Engine, though. You know, wherever the Mortis Engine is, is the big problem. It's, it's slowly draining down these Chosen. Mortis Engine probably sitting at 1,500 value plus. Yeah, so 1,561 here as it is able to drain down most of these forces. More Zombies are on the way in. And this objective is going to be flipping back. But it's going to get to Triple Cap territory. And Corn with its mobility might be able to like defend one objective and keep the undead who are much slower from getting there but in the back finally the vampire gorilla and company um able to claim victory over the minotaurs taco needs to get an objective back like really quick to stem the bleeding here because it is getting very very rough but mortis engines are the hard carry in this matchup and you can see the marauders and all these uh, coronate elite chosen are being drained down and the value has equalized now so flying taco has gotten that value equal but his opponent has currently a thousand plus points back objective is a uh, being harried by the Minotaurs. Looks like they're going to be trying to surround the Vargulf. As do we get Blood Knights? No, Black Knights being used again. Interesting. I feel like Black Knights, well, I guess against, like, Flesh Hounds, they're really good um, with the magic damage and, uh, you know, obviously being armored and also aren't bad at clearing out Marauder Infantry, so I understand that. But, yeah, Vampire's going to get this back objective back, and now it's going to be more of Houseplant using his 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 caginess to hold on to the objectives and uh, just try and win on points because like out grinding vampire counts is so hard with corn and he's done so well keeping the value close he's done so well with his uh split push and whatnot so here we do see the chosen of corn being beaten down minotaurs here uh yeah they're eventually gonna lose it but they're holding on minotaurs of corn have 70 armor the, the beast men ones 
much like Nurgle looking at uh, vampire counts. The Beastman ones are, you know, out at night wishing they were corn, vamp uh, corn minotaurs, that's for sure. Mortis Engine, doing great. Still draining these units down. Heinrich Kemmler laughing all the way to the bank as zombies and cryptors continue to move in. We got Minotaurs with great opens going to be coming in with a big punch, and they don't really care about Mortises, so they might be able to get this. Yeah, the Cryptors just getting bullied on impact. You see Cryptors just falling in droves to the giant cleaving axes of the Blood God, the Chad Minotaur, as they just do some serious work, and you can see all the Cryptors getting melted there. Now, the Corn Forces, though, kind of broken off the objective. They don't have much, just Minotaurs, but zombies have absolutely trash capture weight, and the back objective goes to the Vampire Counts, Houseplant can win on one objective, and I think that's what's going to happen here. He's going to send some reinforcements over here to the back. Maybe, oh, look at this, Flying Taco. He's not out of tricks yet. He sends the Dire Pack over. Oh, I love it. And he's going to start capturing the back objective and trying to take some of the focus away. But man, this is going to be close. He's going to need more than just the Dire Pack. He's going to need another Doggo or something. Does Corn? oh man, Corn doesn't have enough for a Flesh Hound right now, so they can't respond to this. The Dire Pack's going to get some good capture weight, actually. Middle objective slowly flipping. Slowly flipping, very, very close. What needs to happen for Flying Taco, he needs to get this. The Black Knights need to go up and around and go support the back objective. Houseplant immediately sees this and summons out his Flesh Hounds of Corn. So the Flesh Hounds gonna be on top of the Dire Pack. I don't know who wins that. I think Dire Pack just can barely get it. Oh, I don't know though, Flesh Hounds are really strong. Well, I suppose we're gonna find out in just a second. Anyways, middle objective is gonna be flipping, but Houseplant does not need that much more time. He really doesn't. The back one owned by the Vampire Counts, Black Knights gonna be coming trying to make sure that the Minotaurs and the uh, Marauders here don't get the cap on it, and they get a big, big charge right there. Hammering into those Minos, and the Minos probably going to be uh, breaking there. We'll have to see. Hmm. It's some water, man. This game is getting so intense. Middle objective, flipped with the Vampire Counts, and the Dire Pack battling the Flesh Hounds here. It's an anti-large specialist doggo, but again, they're still just Dire Wolves. Flesh Hounds taking a lot of damage here, but I don't think he's going to have enough time, ladies and gentlemen. This is, it's crazy. It's crazy. He won with a triple chosen build. Dual weapon chosen. It's pretty fun. It's really fun to see high level players who usually only play the meta, play like into bad meta matchups and make it work. That is probably one of the coolest things about this matchup we just saw. Because Taco is just not going to have enough time to get this. He's got Cryptors heading down there, but he simply doesn't have enough time. And yeah, the Vampire Counts, if they had another three minutes, could probably win this, but... Obviously, Houseplant played super well. He took good engagements away from Mortis Engines. He forced the Vampires into tough grinds, and uh, he's going to be getting the W, I think. Mortis Engines just zooming back there, but you only have, you know, 25 seconds left. 25 seconds is not enough to even capture the objective. I mean, if you had a ton of units, but Zombies and Skeletons are all hustling here. We have Crypt Horrors. He needed, like, Black Knights or something else to help stop the Flesh Hounds back there. Um, I don't know where the Black Knights got tied up, but clearly it was in the middle of the map. GG well played, and Houseplant... Wins the matchup as Corn into Vampire Counts. That is crazy. That is crazy. That literally has only happened once in the whole Total Tavern season. So, GG, well played. Chosen, probably doing work. The Blood God smiles this day for skulls have been uh, claimed. He cares not. Zombies got skulls. Skeletons got skulls. Who would have thought that weird build would work? That was so strange. Knowing maybe his lords wouldn't be super effective, he just opted to just buy more elite shit. Yeah, so 2,000 value on these guys. 1,900 on the other Chosen, 1,200 here. Uh, minotaurs, 3,600 value on these Minotaurs, dude. Oh, that's so good. These ones got 1,700 as well. Dude, crazy, crazy stuff. Yeah, and all the other Minos did really good. Very micro-intensive. So that is game two. Taco is really on the ropes now. Will the underdog come back? Find out in the next episode. As we get the next map set up. GG, well played. That was a great match. Great match indeed. All right, so let's get this going. Get in here. The next map is going to be, in the Grand Finals, the Black Ark. Going back to an old classic, which both players will be uh, very familiar with, one of the good maps EA made. Quite nice. I thought Corn, yeah, Corn is looking in trouble. Was that a bounty? Uh, I don't think so. No, I don't, I don't think there's a bounty for any of that. Yeah, the Minos were definitely countered the Cryptors pretty well. Yeah, it was wild, man. The plant can't be stopped. It, stopped. it keeps growing. He's like one of those plants that grows under a sidewalk and like breaks through the concrete. You know, it's like just just uh, crazy stuff. Ogre Kingdoms are banned in the series, so um, they both had their mains banned, basically. So there's no Slanesh, no Warriors of Chaos, and there's no Ogres, and uh, I don't know what the other one was. There's plenty of Haggard Factions Taco could play if he really wants to, you know, Wants to make it suffering. Yeah. 
One sec, guys. Okay. Perfect. So the map is set. Players are going to do their picks and bans. And waiting to see what it's going to be. I see someone typing in chat. So if Flying Taco loses this game, this will be a victory for um, the houseplant. Granted, Flying Taco's already won a prize. Even if he gets second, you know, he still gets a nice little prize. 300 for um, first, 150 for second, and th uh, $50 for third. And then for fourth place, they get an Applebee's gift card. So that is the tale of the tape for today's tournament. Yes, yes. Very fun stuff. And if you guys are enjoying the stream, please do drop a like. It helps out quite a bit. I always hate asking for it, but it is my job, so... I should do it. I should do it. But thank you guys. You know, that Applebee's gift card. We'll 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 make it make it quite special. Yeah, the fire damage isn't bad, right? Like the fact that corn has so much fire damage really does mitigate some of the healing effectiveness, right? You guys like the really haggard Applebee's gift card drawing there? I think it's great. Think we missed a big sword dropping in the middle point? Didn't see one. Yeah, we probably did. Although to be fair, he could have been using the buffs and spamming the cheap spells instead, like using the Horn of Corn. Yeah, he could be. All right, so let's see here. So they're still doing their picks and bans. And outstanding. All right, all right. Looking good, looking good. So for the picks here, let's see if they've typed them yet. No, they're keeping track of their picks and bans right now. And uh, that'll make the picks easier. Okay, perfect. I, I, I suspect the Demons of Chaos pick from, from Houseplant. He's probably going to go back to Old Faithful here. Dude, what if Houseplant just came out with a Chad Nurgle pick? Or Kislev. Kislev is even more, more I would say, of a power play. Because they're like Nurgle has some strong mechanics, but Kislev is just has so many bad matchups now. I don't even know if Kislev has any good matchups. Yeah, I, I don't know if they do. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Orange Julius, it's part of the charm. It's part of the charm. So Black Arc is good for shooting factions. If you want to get a little bit of Daka going, you certainly can. Um, and we'll see what he does. Maybe some, some Empire, some Sigmar. All right. Looking good. Maybe maybe Houseplant will play vampire counts now. Maybe maybe the maybe the vampire uh, vampires will get their W there. Kislev just needs more stuff. They're like their lost the roster is very limited, much like Cathay, but they just don't have the same like synergies and good magic that Cathay has. Like Lore of Ice and Tempest are both pretty mediocre lores of magic, whereas like Cathay has um, the harmony mechanics really strong, and they also have amazing lores of magic. Like Lore of Yang is really good. Lore of Yin is really good. Yeah, so that's that's really one of the big issues. I would love to see a Kislev game. Holy shit. I don't think that's going to happen until they get some new stuff. Like, at least in high stakes. Yeah, at least in, like, a high stakes match. We'll see. Kislev is good in a Beastman and possibly Empire. Oh, is it? I, I don't... I feel like... And to Beastman, yes. I think... I think uh, so Dog Person in chat was typing them. I think... I do think Kislev has an okay matchup against Beastmen. Against Empire, I feel it's Empire favored. The War Wagons are really good, and the Sunmaker is pretty devastating. Although you can Little Gromit, but yeah, it's tough. Tough. So is it going to be Grand Cathay? So we got Corn, Tomb Kings, and High Elves banning Grand Cathay. Tomb Kings and High Elves. Interesting from Flying Taco. Seeing a High Elf pick would be super wild. It would be very, very wild indeed. People are... I was actually talking to... Um, who was I talking to you? Somebody, I was talking to Dov, Dov plays recently about um, about land battles, and he was saying that high elves are doing pretty well in land battles, actually. Kind of just spamming Lothar and Sea Guards. Apparently, it's pretty good. Yeah, I, I do feel like uh, I do feel like Empire is pretty favored against Kislev. I, I'm very comfortable with that matchup. Um, Kislev though against Beastman, I yeah, I've had good success with that. I feel like they can do some work, like Bear Riders, like their characters, their their Zargard aren't bad there. It's my favorite rarely brought unit. Mm, it's a tough choice. Man, I got a crazy replay the other day with mortar wagons that we'll be uh, putting up in the channel this week. It's it's pretty wild. 
You know, I was just realizing I, what I missed. The Haggard FFA land battle. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, no. FFAs are so janky. Vampire counts banning high elves. Okay, so Houseplant, Houseplant is going to go with vampire counts banning high elves. So Taco has to pick Tomb Kings or Corn, neither of which are great. Now, is he going to try and replicate Houseplant's success with Corn? I don't know if that would work on this map. Because it's more of a straight line fight. Oh, maybe it could. Taco kind of in a bit of a tough corner as it pertains to the factions he can play here. I, w I wish he had just gone full meme and just picked like Kislev or something. But he's going to go Vampire Count. Tomb Kings. Okay, so we got Tomb Kings versus Vampire Counts. I actually don't know how this matchup goes. I, I feel like it's Vampire Count favored, like heavily. Because Graveguard outtrade Tomb Guard like pretty hard. And uh, Blood Knights are, yeah, I don't know if we'll see Blood Knights. But like Vargas, Felbats, like, yeah, a lot of, lot of good disruption. James says, enjoying the stream while recovering from the Rona. Hail Sigmar. Take care, sir. Sigmar, protect you too, brother. Glad you're enjoying the stream. Hope you feel better. Certainly no fun going through that. Certainly no fun. So, uh, Vampire Counts versus Tomb Kings. We have the Undead Duel of Fates. Houseplant wants to end it. He does. I don't blame him. He's been playing since eight hours. These players have been playing for eight hours today. Granted, they had, they had a long break. Several of them had a long break while the other matches were going, but, you know, have been basically mentally focused on Warhammer for eight hours. So, understandably, I would be in that boat, too. Yeah, Vampire Counts seem pretty favored here. As a matter of fact, what's cool is we don't need to say stuff like I think anymore because we actually have the data. So, let's go look. All right, so go to this. Um, Vampire Counts have a... Well, it's only been played three times this season, so there's not much... There's not too much... Reference there, but it seems to be 50-50. Let's look at last season. So, is this last season? No, it was. Is it this one or no? Those are the old. Those are the old ways. Yeah. So this was when Tomb Kings were oppressive, and even then, it looks like they were favored against Vampire Counts then. Actually, oh, so maybe it won't be as bad. Actually, maybe it won't be as bad. But I, it's not been a common matchup since the nerfs. If you could get one DLC unit not character added to the Empire, what would it be? Ooh, ah, you know what? I think the Empire just needs like a Celestial Huracanum. Because that's like a super iconic unit. You need that. I think the Knightly Orders should be added. Like Knights of Moor, like, and all those guys should be playable in multiplayer. I think that'd be super badass to have them as like ROR sort of. Um, I would love to see a Master Engineer for the Empire that could like buff the Sunmaker and give it extra ammo. That would just be such a full chub. Because the Empire has Master Engineers in Tabletop. They have um, Grand Masters, which are like these Duelist characters. That would be awesome too. Yeah, Kislev is definitely a bit of a meme faction. Yeah. 100%. Yeah, Season 4 is coming up. It's a great great chance because obviously it's hard to get onto the leaderboards now after a 7-month season or 6 months. But we'll have a fresh start, uh, which is going to be launching the day that the Chaos Dwarves launch. So there's going to be some downtime for the next, you know, however long. What day did they come out? Sometime March, April. Yeah. Null and Ironsides. Oh, yeah, dude. That'd be sweet. That'd be pretty awesome. Hmm. Yeah, Master Engineer with the Sniper Rifle. Yeah, that'd be pretty cool, dude. That'd be pretty radical. Tomb King versus Vampire Counts. I, I, feel, I feel as if Taco is going to try and go out on a shield and bring a Titan. Like, there's going to be something like that. Like a Cetra... Or an Iro Titan. Like, there's going to be some weirdness. I don't know what it is. I don't know where it's coming from, but there's going to be a little something, something coming. So, the dreaded Taco Titan. Yeah, Ulrich, I think if we they add Ulrich to the game, it should be its own faction. Like, I think Ulrich should be, um, yeah, they should just give them their own sub faction that's like kind of like a fully, like, they, they share some units, like state troopers, but then they have a ton of special units, like the Knights of Ulrich, you know, there's some sort of a, a mace wielding warrior, like, great weapon. I don't really know, but it would be really cool. Yeah, the Reichsguard on foot. Yeah, that'd be cool too. No, I mean, great swords. Yeah, what would be the difference? Reichsguard on foot would just be like tankier. They would be more defensively focused, like Marauder Champion type units, like heavily armored, good melee defense. No armor piercing, though. I think that would be a really nice addition. Giving the Empire a frontline holding unit would be insane. So you don't have to, like, throw Haggard State Troopers into the into the grinder. Yeah. Yeah, you could try a Titan. The problem is Titans can't cover a ton of ground. But, I mean, Giants have historically been okay against Vampire Count. So 
it's not like there's no precedent there. God, there are so many characters in the game that just need like little buffs, like Eltharian. Like his his items are such shit. Oh my god. I wish Eltharian was better. He's literally like the coolest high elf character. Like, but he's just he's just so bad. He's only good for Tempest. His other items are useless. His Mistwalker barrage useless. Oh my god! Look at the sweat. Just the where's the no Lord in event? Oh, he's gonna summon one in obviously, but yeah, it's like a zombie who's just gonna send into the shadows. Jim Jam, I have the desert for the win. Come on, Taka, we'll see. Oh, a boner giant, dude. A fat shaft giant. Not gonna be very good here, but you know, at least he's going out on a shield. And a casket of souls, a bunch of tomb guard. Oh man, that is so nice. It's the it's the bone giant, guys. Did you think you would be seeing a bone giant when you woke up this morning? When you rolled out of bed and looked out the window, just forlorn and you know, feeling the hardships of life. Did you think you would see a bone giant? We will have to see. So here, for the forces of the Tomb Kings, it's going to be fairly standard in many ways. A Lich Priest... No, wait, what? He's using a Lich Priest of Banishment and Light? So he does not actually have any Lore of Nehekara passive to heal his army. Wow. All right, this is going to be very interesting. So Lich Priest of Light, probably going to try and net for the Boner Giant. We have a Casket of Souls in the back, Bone Giant, Tomb Guard Halberds, and that... What's going to happen is he's probably going to just kind of like try and put some Elite Infantry in there. Casket of Souls bombard them with Banishment and then defend the top objective with his Bone Giant. Dude, I can't believe we have the Haggard Bone Giant. Oh my god. Of course. Well, this is this is great. This is great. This, made, this is making for a fun series here. Vampire Count's very meta. Tomb Guard Spam. I'm going to be summoning in a, uh, a un, uh, some sort of a Lord. So we will see. You see a Bone Giant every time you wake up. Oh, nice, dude. I didn't see that one coming. You got me, dude. You got me so good. Oh, man. Graveguard Great Opens will out-trade pretty hard. Kepper Guard are the one exception. They can go Fisticuffs because they heal, so they can they can do their thing. I, I have no idea how this is going to go. This is going to be very, very weird. Yeah, Kepper Guard on the bottom is a good choice. Casket of Souls, you can park it like right here, and then it can shoot here, here, or it can also go this way. So plenty of options. The Bone Giant might be... Oh, the Bone Giant might be a bounty, actually. I think it might be. I'm not sure. Taco already has his favorite bounty, though, so he probably wouldn't even switch his avatar, to be fair. He already has a unique Greasis avatar, which is pretty hard to beat. You know, it's pretty hard to beat. So the Bone Giant's on its way up. Houseplant's probably like, are you serious? You know, is this all you can conjure, Flying Taco? Is this all you can conjure, Saruman? All right, so Tomb Guard Halberd's moving up to the high ground point. I'm going to be swarmed most likely by a bunch of haggard units. And uh, I'm curious to see if the Bone Giant can actually do anything. Like, I feel like they're so bad. I've tried to make them work before, but it's usually always the reason I lose. It's just like, you look at everything and you're like, this thing just didn't get the job done. Granted, it can't shoot at corpse cards, which is probably what I would do with it in this situation. I move it up here. Just start blasting at corpse cards. You can also shoot at the Sternsman. It can do some okay damage against those type of units. What is the first summon in going to be? Taco is probably saving for like a Tomb Scorpion or a Cameroon War Sphinx. Those would actually both be very good ideas, I think. Um, but where's the Bone Giant going? We'll have to see. We will have to see. So Casket of Souls, not quite in range yet, but going to start raining some hot fire here on the zombies. Want to make sure to maximize the efficiency of your ammo and not shoot at crappy units. So be shooting at Graveguard or, you know, those type of pieces if you can. Over here for Houseplant, summoning in White Kings, which is a very smart choice. The Tomb Kings clearly don't have much that's going to be good against those type of units. And we get Eyes of the Desert coming out. Oh, somebody in chat donated and wanted Eyes of the Desert. And here you are. So Eyes of the Desert are on the way in. They're going to be doing some glorious battle as the Casket of Souls blast from downtown. And is it making contact? It is with zombies, which is, doesn't feel great. Now, where is the giant bone shaft going to be going? We'll see. Looks like the fighting is very consolidated to down here. I think it's going to be a classic stare down up top. Although, no, Houseplant, he sounds the sounds the horn of Gondor. Yeah, the Grave Guard moving in, and also the Corpse Cart with the Unholy Lodestone. So, yeah, the, the Undead, okay, the great, the Vampire Counts would 100% win this fight on the high ground. Because yeah, the Grave Guard Great Opens are, will just destroy these Tomb Guard Halberds. Casket Shots, pretty nice, hits the Grave Guard. So, the Casket's doing some work. The Giant Bone Shaft, what is it going to shoot? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, the Giant Bone. Here it comes. Oh, from downtown. Is it going to hit any? Oh, my God, the Jukes! Houseplant dodging with the corpse cart. I think it would have missed anyways, but still pretty hilarious. You guys ready to see the bone giant literally hit like one thing this entire game? Classic stuff. Classic stuff. All right. So casket still shooting into the graveguard. Great. Opens the tomb king stand at the ready. 
They need like some sort of a, uh, a Tomb Scorpion or a War Sphinx or something that can clear out infantry. You know, otherwise they're going to be, you know, running into problems because they're just not going to have the killing power. Bone Giant Shaft. Oh, the Boner hits the Corpse Cart. Hits it right in the face. That bad boy down to 4,200 HP, but you can see it doesn't even do that much damage. You feel like it should do way more, right? You're just like, why is that just not that good? I do like the Ushapti pick. Ushapti will be good against White Kings, and they'll also be good against Grave Guards. So, hey, Bone Giant Shaft, not bad. Did a little bit against the White King right there. Not not terrible. <laughs> the Dragon off Night uh, Drift, yeah. That's pretty hilarious. So, Grave Guard versus uh, Tomb Guard. A classic one. Oh, Stern's been getting nailed by that shot right there. That was a really, really cost-effective one. And now we get a Screaming Beam Catapult in the back. That's actually a good pick. Depending if Felbats and or Direwolves want to dive that thing, it should be pretty easy to defend back there. Especially since there's aggression coming on your objective here. In the meantime, Big Bone Daddy ripping another shot, and he misses that one. Ushapti stacked on top of Tomb Guard Halberds. Seems like a pretty strong combo, if you ask me. You have anti-infantry, you have anti-large, you have armor piercing. A lot of good tools. As Ushapti prepare to engage against the Great Weapons. We'll have to see. Eyes of the Desert don't really have too many good targets. Definitely could be shooting, putting a little bit of firepower into the Grave Guard. They can also engage in melee using their armor piercing halberds. Kepra Guard seem to be going forward to uh, deal with the Grave Guard great weapons. Whereas up in the high ground, the Undead or the Vampire Counts have taken that objective. Caskets and bombardments coming in. Nice shot. Stern's been getting pounded a little bit. As we do see some additional reinforcements of skeleton warriors coming up to try and capture this objective. So, Houseman getting extra sneaky. I'm not sure what he's doing here. He's got some Grave Guard maybe setting up to deny this. But they're, so, they're going to have to maneuver around if they want to get anything. Giant Bone Shafts, how are they doing? We see the Sepulchral Stalkers sent into melee combat with um, Grave Guard, which isn't the best for them. Bone Giant still trying to kill a Corpse Guard, but literally this giant anti-large entity just straight up cannot even kill a Corpse Guard, which is which is pretty haggard. And it looks like another Ushapti has been summoned in or maybe pulled back. Yeah, I think it was the same one. So he's going to want to get that in there because otherwise his Tomb Guard Halberds are just basically going to be losing this fight. Bone Giant still, you know, getting those fat shafts in. And now the Ushapti are going to be piling back into fight, trying to go after the Grave Guard Great Weapons. What do we have up in the high ground? Casket of Souls, still doing some good firepower. Yeah, those zombies and Grave Guard Great Weapons are getting wrecked a little bit. As in the backfield, we see some Skeleton Horsemen doing a little bit of harrying, but the Dire Pack will easily kill them, so... They might as well turn and fight, though, and do a sandwich. That would probably be the best play. Yeah, just like turn here and here and get that sandwich, because you're, you're probably not going to get away. Now in the backfield, we see more Skeleton Warriors summoned out. The Tomb King's Artillery trading pretty well. Flying Taco actually up in value. But the vampires probably have a little bit more healing, granted. I don't know if the vampires are even losing, using any magic at this point. We'll have to see. Winds of Death. Yep, looks like the caster is out. So it is Heinrich, and he gets a fat erect Winds of Death on the Kepper Guard. And it also nails his Skeleton Warriors. In the back, we do see the Sepulchral Stalkers trying to finish off the Corpse Cart, but uh, it's really, really not super effective. As the... Uh, oh, we got Big Daddy Krell moving into the backfield. Dude. Grell's having some problems. He might be able to close the distance, and if he does get into contact, he is an anti-large fighter. So each of his attacks, you know, a couple, maybe two attacks will kill a model against the eyes of the desert, which is pretty cost-effective. So having Krell just kind of occupy those guys for a minute is uh, is very, very good. It's incredibly strong. Lich Priest of Light with a fat banishment right there. Does go through the Sternsman. Casket of Souls still shooting. And over here, we did get that 2v1 isolation. So this is actually a super cost-effective pick here from the Flying Taco. As the Dire Pack's going to be getting crumbled pretty horribly. Looking at the value, Taco is up, but will the Boner Giant be his uh, downfall? As it doesn't seem to be too useful here. Low ground objective, Krell is going to be lasting. Wow, Krell lasts a long time. Is that normal that he la lasts that long? Wow. I mean, I, I always thought he should, but that's, that's I did not remember him lasting that long. Jeez. So Kepra Guard crumbling, but Ushapti, uh, just a standard dual wielding variant, helping to wear through these guys. A couple Skeleton Spheres pulling back, but the Undead have a really, really nasty... God, they're, they're, they're both undead. Vampire Counts. They have a really nasty pocket of units here. They have the White Kings and the Corpse Cart. A lot of layering buffs. High Ground currently owned by the Vampire Counts as well. And they seem to be just kind of, you know, strangling in on the map and really, really keeping the old uh, Tomb Kings from getting the objectives. Although the score is kind of close. This objective... Oh, the Tomb Kings with the Back Ninja! So the Tomb Kings got their Skeleton Horseman and actually stole the Back Objective. That is really, really cheeky. That's a great little play right there. And then he just leaves. He's like, whatever, you can leave your expendable units to get that back. I'm going elsewhere. Tomb Kings sending out a legion of infantry as well. So we got Skeleton Warriors. We got Tomb Guard. Catapult still raining some uh, hot fire down and helping to crumble the Sternsmen. Although it looks like they're still kind of stable at 30 leadership here. Lich Priest going to be dropping another Fat Banishment on top of the double Grave Guard unit. So here it comes. And it kind of goes the wrong way. Doesn't do that much damage, unfortunately. So the Lich Priest caster probably not doing too much. Although he's got about 900 value. So low ground is pretty much a lost cause. It looks like the Tomb Kings are going to be abandoning this. Uh, Krell is still going deep, dude. He's he's going. Look at that. He's got 23 seconds left, and Krell's going to decide to go back and chill out in the realm of the undead, wherever they hang out. 
And Tomb Guard here, no basic skeletons on Grave Guard. Both sides trading pretty well. We do see a little bit of a value lead here for the Tomb Kings. Obviously, when you have a Bone Giant Stalkers and those type of units, you're going to trade okay. Really good usage of the Ushapti. Ushapti are countered by Cryptors, though. It's kind of the rock, paper, scissors of this matchup. But then Cryptors get countered by Eyes of the Desert, right? So might as well move those guys into melee and just pile in with their halberds. It'd be more cost effective anyways. Bone Giant, what is he shooting with his giant shaft? Um, it looks like he's going to go after Heinrich. Oh my god, that's so haggard. Is he actually going to try and shoot Heinrich Kemmler? God, this thing is so terrible, dude. I remember the days Bone Giants were good and then they got nerfed. Yeah, sad. Look at that. What the hell happened there? Oh, he probably switched targets. Yeah, he switched targets onto the Cryptors. He was about to rip that shot, but at the end he uh, ends up moving. So Casket of Souls getting hunted by uh, Krell here. Krell's going to be disappearing in like two seconds though, so that should allow the Casket to be freed up. Tomb King's finally able to get this uh, cat back. It looks like the perpetual bombardment from the Screaming Skull Catapult and the Casket of Souls has been enough to maybe swing this objective back. We'll have to see. Skeleton Spearmen and Nakar Warriors all up on the point. And the Tomb Kings do get the objective back, ladies and gentlemen, but the Vampire Counts. Obviously the House Plant, the Boa Constrictor. He's like a Venus Flytrap. I suppose that's an apt analogy. He does uh, clamp down on his back objective and gets that back. Now we do see some Nakar Warriors being sent over there with some Spearmen. Bottom objective, it's going to be tough. Those Vampire Count characters, like the White Kings, it doesn't seem like the Tomb Kings have a good answer. Did that Bone Giant seriously just miss? Oh no, who's shooting over here? I was about to say. I was about to say. That would have been really embarrassing if he did miss that. Sepulchral Stalkers doing a great job. They are able to shank down the Cryptors here. Flying Taco probably going to be bouncing those Sepulchral Stalkers on over to the uh, other Cryptor unit. We'll have to see. We shop these. Still battling Graveguard. Great opens. Incredibly cost effective. And I think the Eyes of the Desert should probably turn and take this fight. Maybe even pull the Bone Giant into melee. Back here we do see the Double White Kings. Very, very problematic. There's really not that much that can deal with them. So, I mean, Tomb Kings might just have to play the high ground objectives. What do they have in their army that can deal with those infantry? Those infantry characters, like Acetra, you know, an Ark in the Black, like any of those type of characters could be very, very good there, but it just seems like they're not here. Now, we do have a Necrotech. Necrotechs aren't the worst fighters in the world, but they do have anti-infantry, so maybe they can help against the White King. Looks like he's trying to take down Heinrich Kemmler, but Heinrich Kemmler is no slouch. He has 50 melee defense, so he's, he's pretty beasty. He can definitely hang in there. So more of the uh, undead moving forward. Connor, thank you for becoming a member. Greatly appreciate it. Welcome to the Dukes of Haggard. Hopefully you've been enjoying this full day of competition. So skeleton Warriors on the point. King Mikesh's Scorpion Legion. Eyes of the Desert cruising. Cryptors still very functional. They're getting to beat down some of these uh, these poor uh, Ushanti back here. I really do think the Eyes of the Desert should have turned and helped win this fight. Maybe the Tomb Kings are going to go for a back cap here, using a bunch of horsemen. We'll have to see. A lot of nasty infantry on the way in. So we do have the White Kings. Yeah, two of them coming from Houseplant. Oof. And they're going after that Lich Priest. They both You, you can see the attack order was given. They have 33 speed. Lich Priest is unsummoned. So he's sent back to the Shadows. And Sepulchral Stalkers are going to be on their way in now. So, yeah, they're getting some nice shots, wearing down Cryptors. Looking at the value lead, Flying Taco is up in value. But the Vampire Counts are often behind in value, but they simply wanted objectives. is very, very standard. Um, he would have to get a double cap here really soon. Uh, and the thing is, Skeleton Warriors have really, really bad capture weight. Um, they're expendable, so their capture weight is only two. These horsemen have four, so it's basically six capture weight against two right here. So the objective could start to flip, but he's going to have to get it very soon. It's, it's getting to the point where... Um, yeah, it would have to be a triple cap, which is not going to be easy with those characters running around. So on the bottom, we do see Tomb Guard Halberds moving. They might be able to start grinding, and they will have good capture weight, but they are Grave Guard. Grave Guard are a really good counter against them. This objective looking pretty stable for the Tomb Kings. Sepulchral Stalkers here. A good answer against Cryptors. They have the anti-large Halberds in melee, and uh, they're able to fight. Cryptors will still put some hurt into them, but overall, overall, they will win that fight. So this back objective not quite flipped. It looks like the Dire Pack was called in, so the Dire Pack going to be hunting down the Skeletons and uh, many of the Horsemen trying to get away. I like that cheeky cap attempt there. I thought it was a good play, but obviously Houseplant was prepared. He had his uh, his, his uh, pistol loaded and he had the Dire Pack waiting to be launched out of the uh, old revolver there. So this objective could be flipping now a little bit. It looks like the two White King characters are bringing in the necessary capture weight to get it there. Flying Taco going to be going for the low ground cap as he does have the Tomb Guard Halberds moving here. And uh, it's not going to be enough capture weight though. The... Uh, and this fight's going to be a loss. A Corpse Cart supporting Grave Guard and Zombies, their stats are going to be jacked, and they will win that 100%. But when the reinforcements get there, Skeleton Warriors, uh, they have good capture weight. Tomb King Skeleton Warriors, for some reason, don't have expendable capture weight like other factions. Maybe it's kind of a reflection of the fact that uh, Tomb King Skeletons are more sentient, and they're not like mindless automatons, but I don't really know. Something, something funky to look at here. Spulkrill Stalkers getting that nice prison shank on, but once again, dude, there's games where it looks like Houseplant's in, like, a little bit of danger like he was down in value but he just like always finds a way to come back just like a true a true beast so we do see the uh, tomb guard halberds trying to fight but the response is going to be cryptors moving down to the bottom side 
up in the top, we got Graveguard Great Weapons on their way in. Those Graveguard Great Weapons will uh, be certainly giving the business to these Tomb Kings Chaff units. And ladies and gentlemen, I think we have our Season 3 Grand Champion claiming the prestigious title on, uh, on ye old uh, competitive leaderboard. So I don't think there's any comeback for the dreaded Taka, but Taka played some great games today. You know, he's playing, you know, our, the strongest player in the world, really, in Houseplant. And he put up a good, really, really good fight. He also brought unorthodox picks and still was able to put on a really, really good show for us. So shout out there. And he's going to be winning the second place prize as well. So I don't think there's any comeback here, guys. Sepulchral Soccer is just, you know, trading well, mind you. Probably, yeah, about 1,000 value. That's not bad. More Shopti on the way in. But the Vampire Counts with the old Stranglehold, Corpse Carts, and Grave... This is the paradigm of this matchup. Graveguard carry it. They're so good. The Graveguard are so incredibly good. I don't, I don't think Houseplant lost any games today. I don't think he did. I don't think he did. So looking here at Objective 2... It is flipping back to the Tomb Kings, but there's not enough time. Maybe if he saved up a bit and like can get a couple horsemen to go ninja this, but yeah, no, there's no way. I mean, he'd have to get all three. He'd have to get all three at this point. Could could we have called Taco's Doom too early? I, I, I don't think so. I think it was correct. I think it was correct. Crypt Core is on the way. Graveguard are going to simply outgrind here. Uh, Vampire Counts could just spam things on their back objective now, and they could just win on one point. There's, there's no way. I think we got it. I think we got it. So looking right here, we do see objective number two is going to be taken. And in the back, Cryptors and Sepulchral Stalkers putting up an old Royal Rumble. But there will be no salvation. And the Tomb Kings will fall. Vampire Count's going to get their first W of today, actually. They lost against Korn in the last round, which is pretty crazy. And yeah, you can't say it's bad matchups. I mean, man, he, Houseplant won with Korn against Vampire Counts, which is super, super difficult to do. Incredibly difficult. Capture Weight's about to arrive. Graveguard going to get on the point. It's going to be crushing the Capture Weight dreams here of the Tomb Kings. And yeah, the Bone Giant was pretty useless. I think if Taco had just had a more tuned build, he might have been able to win this. It was a close enough game. But, you know, bringing a Bone Giant is so bad. Bone Giants are just absolutely awful. Absolutely awful. So, GG, well played. We have our Season 3 Grand Champion, the House Plan of Clan RTK. Doing his people proud, carrying the torch. GG, what a great series. We had some really fun matches today, back and forth, upsets, weird picks, really fun times. So in summary, ladies and gentlemen, let's make it official. Head over to the bracket. Houseplant is going to be our grand champion. He is blessed by Wookiee Sigmarite Paw. And the prize is going to go to him. So he'll be winning a $300 cash prize, 150 for second, 50 for third. And of course, the Applebee's gift card for fourth place, which you guys decided on today. So congratulations to Houseplant. I'm tired. I'm hungry. I'm going to go get some food. I appreciate all of you guys. Thank you so much for the donations today. Absolutely insane generosity from all of you guys and all of our new channel members. You guys make a world of difference. You keep this old man going, all of you guys. Thank you. And uh, again, I can't, I can't even explain how generous you guys are with donations. It's just insane. Thank you so much. It means so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congrats to Houseplant. He is our champion. We'll see you guys on the other side. Uh, what day of the week is it? Saturday? No, today's Sunday. Yeah, we'll be streaming this week. I don't know what. We're probably not going to stream like another Total War tournament until, you know, we can get some new new action. Maybe we will. I don't know. It just kind of feels like, you know, we, we're, we, we've, ended, we've ended this like saga. This time, this season, this meta is over. It had its run. And now we're just going to be kind of chilling until I think we can get... Well, we'll still be putting up battle replays and stuff. But um, yeah. All right, guys. Take care of yourselves. See you on the other side. I'm going to go fly those tacos into my mouth. Yes. As a matter of fact, Mexican food sounds really good right now. But that's it for tonight, guys. See you next time. And uh, Sigmar bless this ravaged body.